Uh, I've got, got no idea, but when I finish with it, I'm going to give it to Mick Murray so he's got some hair. <laughs> Members, the Legislative Assembly is honoured to be situated on the ancestral lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people. We acknowledge the First Australians as the traditional owners of the land we represent and pay respect to the elders, both past and present. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon the Parliament now assembled, and thou would be pleased to direct and prosper all our consultations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of people of Western Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Uh, members, I'd like to welcome the owner of Coast Port Beach and the owner of Coast Port Beach and the president of the Port Beach Polar Bears on behalf of the member for Bicton in the Speaker's Gallery today. Oh. Get myself comfortable. <laughs> it's like wearing a big frock. <laughs> oh, members, you know, the, the love that's coming towards me today is beautiful. Uh, any petitions? Oh, lead, uh, lead of the opposition, the petitions are coming in at a great rate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a petition that has been certified as conforming with the standing orders of the Assembly. It has 10,667 signatures. And the petition says, to the Honourable Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled, we the undersigned say that the State Government should recognise the City of Armidale as an important and strategic regional centre and proactively invest in its revitalisation by inter alia. One, Member. the State Government declaring a new local full-time equivalent jobs target for the City of Armidale to be achieved in three years. Two, pledging to move a flagship State Government department to the City of Armidale within three years, so no less than 1,000 State Government employees permanently work in Armidale. Three, offering a five-year payroll holiday for businesses, payroll tax holiday for businesses, which employ staff who work in the City of Armidale as from the 1st of January 2021. Four, committing to Westport and the construction of a new harbour in 2020. Five, build and secure funding for the operation of a fully fledged TAFE college in Armidale. Six, funding the construction of the Wangong Regional Recreational Reserve, which was due to commence financial year 2018. Ex expedite the project definition and precinct master plan for the Metronet Byford extension and make the investment commitment during financial year 21 for all works within the City of Armidale. Eight, encouraging the City of Armidale to proactively stimulate private investment in its municipality and so substantively address and arrest its escalating high unemployment rate, 10.1 per cent pre-COVID-19, and its poor relative socioeconomic disadvantage index score of 862, which naturally adversely impact on a host of troublesome social and other community issues. Now we ask the Legislative Assembly to call upon the State Government to expediently undertake all the initiatives listed above. Yeah. Any other petitions? <laughs> I have a petition that has been certified as conforming with the standing orders of the Assembly. It has 2,907 signatures. The petition says, to the Honourable Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled, Port Beach is a West Australian icon, a beach beloved by locals and international visitors for decades. This beautiful natural asset is under threat from coastal erosion and we are calling on the State Government to help us to save Port Beach. We, the undersigned, ask the Legislative Assembly place the protection and preservation of Port Beach as a priority for the continuous use of current and future generations. Thank you, Member. 
I think the member who is up by a fifteenth of an inch. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a petition which has been certified by the clerks from 837 petitioners in the following terms. To the Honourable the Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled, we, the undersigned, say that the current laws for dangerous driving causing death in Western Australia have failed to properly hold dangerous drivers to account for the destruction they have caused and continue to fail in protecting the public of Western Australia from these dangerous drivers. Only tough mandatory minimum jail sentences will send a clear message to dangerous drivers and help improve road safety to our community. Now we ask the Legislative Assembly to amend existing laws to provide tough minimum sentences of 20 years for dangerous driving causing death to reflect the gravity and seriousness of this offence. And in tabling this petition, I pay credit to uh, Mr Edward Jandra, Edwin Jandra, who is in the public gallery today, the Speaker's gallery today, who has tirely fought for reform for our dangerous driving laws since the tragic death of his son Leonardus, and who has collected this petition in memory of his loving son. Thank you, Member. Member for Southern River. I have a petition that has been certified as conforming with the standing orders of the Assembly, and the petition says, a petition supporting Terry Healy's campaign to widen Ramford Road Bridge to eight lanes. To the honourable and now well-dressed Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia assembled, we, the undersigned, support Terry Healy's campaign to widen Ranford Road Bridge from four lanes to eight lanes as part of Metro Networks for the new Ranford Road train station. And we now ask the Legislative Assembly to show its support for Terry Healy, Rita Safiotti and Ma McGowan to widen the Ramford Road Bridge. And, Speaker, I have hundreds of non-conforming petitions couched in similar terms, and I thank my community. I have a uh, speaker. Uh, I have a petition, Mr. Speaker, which has been certified by the clerk as conforming with the standing order, uh, standing orders, and it has six signatures. But uh, I also have a, a similar petition that did not conform with the standing orders, with 296 signatures in the same terms. We, the undersigned, being residents, residents, businesses, and shoppers who use the Hilton Town Centre, say that action is needed to improve the pedestrian crossing on South Street between Ethelburn and Paget Streets. A study has shown that 2.4 vehicles per hour run these lights, putting the lives of pedestrians at significant risk and restricting the developments of Hilton Town Centre as a vibrant town centre. And despite requests for action to the Road Safety Commission and Main Roads, the crossing is still dangerous. Now we ask the Legislative Assembly to call on the State Government to improve the safety of the South Street pedestrian crossing by taking all required measures to ensure vehicles are stopping for pedestrians. Thank you, Member. Uh, papers for tabling. Clark. The following papers are presented for tabling. Annual reports for 2019 to 2020 from the Conservation and Parks Commission and also the Criminal Investigation COVID Powers Act 2012, Western Australia Police Force Assumed Identities Annual Report 2019 to 2020, pursuant to subsection 76.1 of the Act, and statements of corporate intent for 2020-2021 for the Fremantle Ports Authority, Kimberley Ports Authority, Midwest Ports Authority, Pilbara Ports Authority, Racing and Wagering Western Australia and Southern Ports Authority. Thank you. Uh, any notices of motion? No notices of motion. Brief ministerial statements. Minister for Health. The development of the Western Australian Men's Health and Wellbeing Policy was an election commitment delivered by the McGowan Labor Government to support the health and wellbeing of men and boys in WA. The Clinical Excellence Division, Department of Health, was responsible for the development and promotion of the policy with guidance from the Western Australian Men's Health and Wellbeing Policy Reference Group a group with representation from across the men's health sector, chaired by Dr Andrew Robertson, Chief Health Officer. Men's Health and Wellbeing WA, an independent not-for-profit charity organisation dedicated to representing and promoting the health and wellbeing of boys and men in WA, provided representation to the policy reference group. Men's Health and Wellbeing WA develop and promote the Blokes Book, a resource used by agencies for many years. 
The bloke's book is for men and men's health and wellbeing service providers. It, has created to, it was created to provide easy to access, accurate, comprehensive and relevant information on the health and wellbeing services that males can access when they may need to. The book provides details and contact information about crisis services, financial, legal, mental health and physical health services, relationships, fathering, self-help and support group contact details, accommodation, alcohol and other drug use, domestic violence and other helpful service information for all males in WA. Due to a variety of reasons related to the COVID-19 pandemic, the decision was made to develop an online version of the bloke's book called The Men's Directory. The Men's Directory is an online searchable listing of services available to the men of WA and is available at www.menshealthwa.org.au. It will be continually updated as new services for men and boys are established or identified. Information and resources in the men's directory broadly align with the five domain of WA men's health and wellbeing policy. These are, one, build healthy public policy, two, create supportive environments, three, strengthen community actions, four, develop personal skills, and five, reorient health service, services. Mr Speaker, I'm very pleased to promote the online men's directory on this, the International Men's Day, an annual international event celebrated on the 19th of November 2020 to celebrate the positive value men bring to the world, their families and communities. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker. Minister for Culture and the Arts. Mr Speaker, there is no one more cultural than you this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Mr Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to rise Excuse and talk about me, our magnificent world-class museum, Bulabadip, which I'm proud to be opening with the Premier, Mark McGowan, this Saturday, the 21st of November, which by remarkable coincidence also happens to be my birthday. The Western Australian Museum, Bulabadip, is a $400 million state government project, and the design and construction of the new building integrates beautifully with existing heritage buildings and includes heritage restoration works to the old jail, Jubilee, Beaufort and Hackett Hall buildings. The museum is free for visitors for at least the first 18 months and it will be always free for children under 15 years. The Bulabadip is situated in the very heart of the Perth Cultural Centre and is a landmark building with extraordinary exhibitions and visitor experiences. It is three times the size of the previous museum and around 54,000 people were engaged and had their say about the new museum. It includes eight new permanent galleries, a 1,000 square metre temporary exhibition gallery, retail and cafe spaces. There are thousands of items from the museum's collection displayed in new and innovative ways, exhibitions and experiences featuring stories from all around Western Australia. These are fascinating facts, members. The overall structure includes 1,600 tonnes of structural steel, more than 12,000 cubic metres of concrete, 1,000 glass facade panels. The roof of the museum is around 38 metres above ground level. The cantilever over the Hackett Hall building is 17 metres wide and is made up of a high-strength steel trusses which span 20 to 40 metres, some even up to 50 metres. In total, the new museum project employed around 3,300 people including some 2,700 construction workers and subcontractors and 600 creative industry workers. The diamond shape in the museum facade, or the veil, is a modern interpretation of the shape of the tread of the iron staircases in Hackett Hall. The gold throughout the museum is inspired by WA's gold rush history, and one of the first objects in the museum collection is a piece of quartz with a gold vein running through it. The city room is inspired by nature's window in Kalbarri, while the lines and forms of the building reflect the land strata in Western Australia. The colours in the museum are inspired by the colours of Western Australia. The main terrazzo includes colours from Woodjuk Budja, the greens of the Banksia, limestone and granite. The red terrazzo is reflective of the red earth of the Pilbara. The very first exhibition in the temporary exhibition gallery is the groundbreaking internationally renowned special exhibition, Song Lines, Tracking the Seven Sisters. Through paintings, photograph photographs and multimedia, Song Lions shares the story of the Seven Sisters as they traverse our ancient continent, from Robin to the APY lands in South Australia. I urge all of you to take your friends, your family, your neighbours, anyone, to see the world-class Western Australian Museum, Bulla Fadib. And happy 60th birthday for Saturday, Minister.
or 65th, as it was. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Minister. I hate. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Minister for Racing and Gaming. Mr. Mr Speaker, it is my pleasure to rise to inform the House that the West Australian racing industry will hold celebrations across all three racing codes from the 19th to 21st of November in support of Pride Month. Northern Race Club, Gloucester Park, Bunbury Trotting Club and Greyhounds WA Cannington will be hosting several on-course activities <coughs> to showcase the Western Australian racing industry's support of the LGBTQI plus community. Each harness and thoroughbred race held over the three-day period will feature a jockey and driver wearing pride colours. There will also be races named in support of Pride Month with the winning horses and greyhounds to receive pride-themed drugs. A number of TAB agencies will similarly be showing their support for Pride Month by putting up posters and other supporting material in their agencies. Particularly in the COVID-19 environment, which has impacted the normal Pride Parade celebrations, it is important that WA celebrate Pride Month in any way we can. With many West Australians attending race courses to enjoying, uh, enjoy spring racing, it is a great opportunity for the racing industry to help spread the Pride message. It's great to see the WA racing industry embrace Pride Month and encourage all participants and spectators to celebrate diversity and inclusivity. I would encourage all members to get to a race meeting at Northam, Gloucester Park, Bunbury or Cannington over the weekend to participate in the celebration. Minister for Housing. <coughs> House of the Department of Communities has established a panel of experienced builders to provide integrated project management, design and construction expertise to deliver a selection of single and group residential dwelling projects on behalf of communities. Additionally, as part of the procurement process, communities also developed a panel of contractors to undertake refurbishment work on social and public housing. The design and construct and or housing refurbishment builders panel will support uh, with the delivery of the current stimulus package. The housing and homeless investment package, the social housing economics recovery package or SHRF. The panel will support communities to deliver at least 300 social dwellings throughout the Perth metro area and see 70 homes refurbished over the next two years. Uh, proponents are required to demonstrate the commitment to meet a minimum Aboriginal employment target of 3 per cent and their intentions to work towards a 5 per cent target, along with a criterion covering inclusive employment outcomes. This is very much an inclusory project. The panel has been established for a period of two years with an option to extend if required. Sites and works allocated through the panel will serve to stimulate the local economy and influence positive change in the industry by encouraging the uptake of sustainable initiatives. Thank you. Minister for the Prevention of Domestic and Family Violence. Thank you. Uh, I rise today to inform the House about 16 days in WA to stop violence against women in 2020. Some might have heard me speak about 16 days earlier this week in this place. November the 25th being International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women marks the beginning of the government's annual 16 Days in WA campaign. Many in this place have supported this campaign since the McGowan government started, in started it in 2017. As I have told this chamber before, Acting Speaker, the campaign is about drawing attention to the many impacts of violence and abuse on women. 16 Days is important because it is about encouraging leaders to be part of the conversation about what we can do individually and collectively to end violence against women. It is about encouraging community awareness and understanding to change views that allow victim blaming to occur and that can stop survivors seeking help and support. There are many ways to be involved. There is the Landmarks All, All Light program, with buildings and structures around Perth and regional WA being lit up in the campaign colour of orange. There is information that can be shared on social media about the impacts of violence on women and their children to educate, inform and, importantly, show your support for the campaign. There are agents of change who will be sending their message for why they think it is important to end violence against women. Acting Speaker, this year's theme is Respect Starts With You. 
I encourage all in this place and across the West Australian community to show their support for 16 days in WA this year. Grievances. Member for Thank you. Acting Speaker. Uh, my grievance today is to the Minister for Sport and concerns the provision of sports change rooms and facilities. There are two quite separate centres that are the subject of this grievance. One of them is in my electorate of Moore at Mewshay, the other is in the Minister's own electorate of Colleague Preston, and I know from discussions with him that he is very well aware of it. The issue has come to my attention thanks to the efforts of National's Upper House MP, Honourable Colin Holt, and Mr Wayne Sanford, the National's candidate for the seat of Colleague Preston, that were vacated by the Minister at his retirement. Minister, the Dardanup Sporting and Community Clubs using the Wells Recreation Centre report that the current change room is a single demountable donger which has no running water, no players can shower after games or training, which is particularly damaging for the local junior soccer club. The kitchen facilities are also so substandard that fresh food cannot be prepared or sold on site, meaning clubs are unable to run self-sustainably through drinks and uh, food and drink sales. The Eaton Darden Up Football Soccer Club had 300 members when they moved over from Eaton five years ago to accommodate Eaton Boomers Football Club. They are now down to less than 100 because they lost their women's team and three of their men's teams, principally because of the poor change room facility and inability to run their own fresh food canteen. The low standard of facilities reduces the socialising aspect of club sport and the ability of clubs to raise money. Clubs at the Wells Recreation Centre include the Eaton Darden Up Soccer Club, the Darden Up Cricket Club, the South West Veteran Car Club, the Darden Up Junior Basketball Club, the Darden Up Tennis Club, the Darden Up Bull and Barrel Festival and the South West Row Society. There are approximately 500 users across all clubs, including 250 children. The Darden Up Shire recognises the need for improving the facility in its Community Facilities Plan 2018 and is currently completing improvement planning in consultation with user groups. There are plans to have a shared larger building, including uh, catering facilities, a separate change room, shower and toilet facility, which will also double as public toilets. Veranda and spectator seating would be incorporated and new tennis and basketball courts to replace the current ageing ones. There is a funding application with the State Government. The total cost of the project is $2.45 million. A previous funding application for $2.3 million was made as part of the Shire's economic stimulus package of 2020 and was submitted to Cabinet Ministers at the Regional Cabinet in Collie. Wayne Sanford, Mia Davies and Colin Holt visited the club on the 26th of August and met with Secretary of Dardanup Sporting and Community Clubs, Jill Cross, and also met with the Shire of Dardanup to discuss uh, these issues on the same day. Turning now to Chittering in the electorate of Moore, the town of Mewshay has a real and urgent need for an upgrade to its facilities. The area has a growing population, accelerated now due to the recent completion of the Tonkin Highway extension, linking Mewshay to the Perth Airport. In my view, Mewshay sports facility upgrades should have been supported much more strongly by the Chittering Shire in the past, but they've been distracted through their planning for a major sporting facility 12 kilometres to the east in Lower Chittering. That near $9.71 million project was based on a large federal grant of $4.71 million, provided a, short, a shared facility with a local independent school. The Shire of Chittering uh, was to fund the balance, with $2 million being paid back by the school. This massive project was poorly researched and always lacked community support, as evidenced by the change of council at the 2019 elections, which saw a new direction. The new council sought to divert part of the federal funding to provide upgraded facilities at Mewshay and deliver a much more uh, modest facility in Lower Chittering. The new application had my support and it included a $2.2 million upgrade for Mewshay. On the 14th of August 2020, the Shire was informed by the federal government that the application to vary the grant was unsuccessful. The Shire has now discontinued that project and has informed the federal government of this. The urgent need still exists at Mewshay and as recently as Monday, I met with the Chittering Shire President, Councillor Kylie Hughes, and members of the Mewshay Hall Users Group at the Oval. The number of users at the Mewshay Hall are close to 500 per week. The Chittering Junior Football Club has now grown to include three girls' sides, and the WACA has stated that the Chittering Junior Cricket Club in 2019 had 10 times the level of girls playing cricket compared to the state average. But having no facilities of a proper standard for the female members will affect those women's teams. Mewshay Oval is the central place for all junior football and cricket in the Shire of Chittering and beyond, 
with members coming from Bindoon, Chittering, Jinjin, Lower Chittering, Mushay, Fallsbrook and other areas. It is classified as lying in the Wheatbelt region, but the positioning of Mushay Oval is critical due to its proximity to Perth for sporting competition, as all the teams based at Mushay Oval compete with metropolitan teams. Club membership numbers are growing rapidly. Latest figures are netball 95, senior cricket 50, junior cricket 85, junior football 266, including 53 girls. All the clubs are growing. There is a current funding request to the State Government. Uh, Mushay Hall Users Group has accumulated contributions of approximately $500,000, including GST, towards a ch change room, club room uh, development, costing $1.65 million GST exclusive. Uh, there's an application for a CSRFF of $550,000 with the Shire making up the balance. The Mushay Group has written, with the most used for oval in the district, we hope that our third attempt at funding that CSRFF will allow the sporting clubs to have facilities at the legal standards for playing sport. For too long, we've had 24 junior football players per team lining up to use one toilet, or having no closed-in showers, or the club's sporting memorabilia history sitting on the floor due to a lack of club room space, or the girls' teams needing to wedge cushions into holes so that no one could look into the change rooms as they get ready. Minister, I seek your support to rectify the urgent need for change rooms and facility upgrades at both Wells Recreation Centre at Dardner and the Mushay Oval Sports Ground. Both are well used facilities with substandard change rooms and club rooms, and both are very much in need of improvement, especially with the growth of female participation in sports such as football, soccer, and cricket. Minister for Sport. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the grievance, and uh, also thank you for giving some forewarning <coughs> or some notes to, to, so we could chase it up. But I do um, uh, find it quite amazing to think I've had two grievances from the National Party in my four years, and they're both about my electorate. What I can say to you, don't try to put your foot in something that you don't know nothing about. Because along with the, um, the, the small part that you pulled out, for there, and I agree that those uh, facilities are very poor. But I also have a list from the Darden Upshire that adds up a, a wish list of $52 million worth, but they haven't prioritised it. But I do know they pushed very hard for the cricket facilities at Pratt Road. So it's up to the community to go back to the Shire and say prioritise what you want, then put in a grant application, which hasn't been done. You, you, you've got a wish list. And like any of us all, we've all got a wish list, and it's good to see it's being brought out. But there's a process, and if you don't go through the process, I don't have a bag of money that I can go and drop over there. The National Party might have done that under royalties to the regions, but we have a process. We have a process that you'll go through. So I'm, I'm saying to you, you know, yes, I've been down there. I have that document in my office, and I've read it time and time again as we come towards election time, trying to look at what, what can be done you know, under the election process, no different to what you're doing now. So I do respect that, that it's been brought up. But to pick out one out of $52 million worth is a very difficult issue. But again, can I just say, it's got to go through process. And the process will be the Shire then allocates which ones they think. But in saying that, it also gives me an opportunity to uh, say what I've already done down there. And one is the Eaton Bowling Club which is a $4 million facility now and turning it into a hub. So I thank you for the opportunity to be able to espouse what I've already done in my electorate that you didn't say anything about. And that is the, uh, the bowling club, the, the um, uh, boat ramps. Sure I, I've got a list there. Do you want to hear the, do you want to hear the whole list? I, I, because thank you very much for, for that. But, you know, roads um, up, up at Gnomesville, which is on this list as well, uh, Gnomesville, the uh, uh, parking area, we've funded some of that. We put a, a, a um, funding for the Ferguson Valley in the Darden Up area. All those things that have been asked for through the Shire. So, you know, you just can't come in and say, I want. But highlighting the problems I agree with. I've been down, I've stood in those change rooms where they have the Bull and Barrel Festival. They've got a new plan, a complete new plan for that area that's going to cost a lot more than $2 million because they're going to, to revitalise that whole facility down there. I'm aware of that. 
But to come in and play cheap politics and pulling one out, I, I just think does a disservice. A disservice. A di it is. Because it's one of many Member, that's on that page that hasn't been identified which priority by the Shire. So, yeah, we're all out to lobby. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to say that I am doing those work, that work. I have done previous work. As I say, the Eaton Bowling Club is one. And, uh, you know, we'll get on with that when it comes through the system. But until then, you know, you just can't uh, peel, pull one out there. The other one is a bit more concerning to me, and, and that's the um, uh, Mushay uh, Sporting Ground. That is a community problem as we, you know, has been there. Different Shire councillors have a different, different opinion. The community, I believe, wasn't consulted strongly enough about where facilities should go. But I've got to be very careful about this because there's a grant in there uh, through the independent process. And again, I, I think this is more of a grievance that, that should be down the line that you should be. The community is saying this is what should have happened the previous um, local government didn't quite go down the right lines, then lost funding from the federal government, which disappoints me immensely. But uh, as I've said, there's a um, uh, process there that's now being worked through and it's not far away. Uh, and I don't know the answers. I, it's the independent body that's working through to make sure that uh, you know everyone gets their share and spread across there. I think in your electorate over the um, last couple of years, about two and a half million dollars in sporting facility funding has already gone out there. I think it might even be a little bit higher than that. Uh, so you know it's not as if you've been starved to death in that area. But can I just stress and stress? It must work through the system, and that means the local member. And it's great that you're doing this getting back and getting on side in the same bucket as the Shire. Then work with the community to make that come forward. There's time and time again we have interest groups and that's the name of the game that comes through and then they might even put a couple of people on the council and try and influence that. You know, we all the games that are played about what goes where. But again, I'm hearing you loud and clear that there was a mistake made or a decision that was made that didn't quite fit with the community uh, in that area. And to hear that, those numbers you, you've put out about the, the uh, kids that want to play there and don't have facility is disappointing. And it's certainly disappointing. But firstly, remember CSR WF is a third, a third, a third. My understanding is the community has a, a little pot of money there that, uh, that would be very, very um, helpful to the, the Shire and to the government to be able to assist in, in uh, bringing that money forward. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, it, it, you know, it's to, to help stimulate places like yourself. The, the grant system itself is very welcomed into country areas, as we know. Otherwise, you won't get a lot of those facilities being out there without government help. And uh, here we are, a chance. You brought it up. The uh, process is well down the road. So, I, there's, you know, you can't even lobby anyone or, or doing that because it's in there and I can't speak about it to say the such. Otherwise, someone will be talking about me like uh, the National Party sports rots that uh, has happened on a federal basis, and, and I'm not going down that road. And I can tell you, you can, you can check anywhere along your line and you'll see that it's fair and equitable. And I think 68% of the funding that's been put out in my time has gone to non-Labor health seats. So don't think that I'm, I'm pointing fingers here and playing p political games. It's about the community. You've raised your point, and I think get back get the Shire on side, get the community on side and make sure they push that forward. Uh, further grievances, Member for Kingsley. Thank you. Speaker. <coughs> My grievance today is to the Minister for Health and it's about the lack of regulation around the sale and supply of nitrous oxide or NANGs, particularly to youth in our community. Nitrous oxide, commonly known as laughing gas, NANGs, bulbs or whippets, is colourless and tasteless. It is used in medical and dental settings for anaesthesia in combination with oxygen and is also used as a high performance vehicle fuel, generally, generally with added sulphur dioxide. However, it is most commonly sold in the community in small bulbs used for making whipped cream. When taken, nitrous oxide acts to depress the central nervous system by slowing down brain activity, resulting in the temporary loss of motor control and a disassociated psychological effect, where sensations and perceptions become disconnected. 
People who use nitrous oxide in this manner report a dreamy mental state and many experience mild auditory or occasionally visual hallucinations. Recently, Kingsley locals, Karen and Andy, reached out to share their story with me about a family member who had become addicted to this substance. Having seen the side effect of Nang's addiction firsthand, they are keen to make sure this can't happen to another family. I was shocked to find out that there is little to no regulation around the sale and supply of nitrous oxide bulbs or Nang's in our community. They can be purchased by anyone, even children, and they can be delivered to any residence, no matter the time of day or night. Whilst I acknowledge that nitrous oxide has legitimate uses, children and young people in our community are sometimes using them to achieve a high, often at the expense of their own health. It is well known that nitrous oxide is associated with a range of potential harmful effects, including reduced blood pressure, fainting, heart attack, hypoxia, memory loss, significant reduction in vitamin B12 stores, damage to the spine, anemia, incontinence, numbness to the extremities, limb spasms and a weakened immune system. It can also cause birth defects if taken while during pregnancy. In addition to the health impacts, nitrous oxide has a negative impact on our environment, with users discarding the empty bulbs anywhere that they see fit which I know from the many posts on our local Facebook groups that other people have seen in my community and in other communities. This has an adverse effect on our waterways, our local parks and our playgrounds, not to mention young children in our community finding great piles of the discarded bulbs. This is not an issue that is unique to Western Australia. In February this year, the news program A Current Affair ran a story highlighting the problem in the eastern states, particularly in Melbourne. And I note that the South Australian Government passed legislation that brought in regulations from the 1st of April this year to regulate the sale of nitrous oxide and impose new penalties for bricks and mortar and online businesses. Under the new South Australian Controlled Substances Poison Nitrous Oxide Variation Regulations 2019, it is now an offence to sell or supply people under the age of 18, sell between the hours of 10pm and 5am, make nitrous oxide visible or accessible to the public in retail stores, and fail to display a notice on the premises that details the offence of selling to under 18s. From the 1st of April 2020, sellers of nitrous oxide in South Australia face harsh, harsher penalties if they fail to follow the new regulations. If nitrous oxide is sold between 10pm and 5am, the seller can be fined up to $5,000. If the retailer fails to store nitrous oxide out of sight and inaccessible to the public, they can be fined up to $5,000. If the retailer fails to display a notice on the premises dealing, uh, detailing the offence to sell or supply to under 18s, they can receive an on-the-spot fine of 315 or be fined up to $2,500. My understanding is the current legislative framework does prevent the sale of nitrous oxide for non-legitimate uses such as cake decorating. However, this is problematic as it has to be proven that the seller knew the buyer intended to use the Nangs for non-legitimate use. By highlighting this important issue in our community and sharing Karen and Andy's experience, I hope to prevent any further harm to any other families in my electorate of Kingsley and across the broader community of Western Australia. Western Australia. Having spoken about this issue with members of parliament, including the member for Belmont, the member for Southern River and the member for Joondalup, I know that this issue is evident across our communities. I ask the minister to consider what options we can explore to limit the sale and supply of nitrous oxide or NANGs to our community for non-legitimate uses. What is the best response for a West Australian context and how we can best protect children and young people and the vulnerable people in our community. Minister for Health.
much. Thank you very much to the member for Kingsley for bringing this grievance uh, to this place today. And um, I want to acknowledge her and the member for Belmont and the member for Southern River who have been talking about these issues uh, with me. I think it's a, an absolutely appropriate issue to bring before the, the chamber. And as the member observes, um, you know, the nitrous oxide is a colourless, non-flammable non gas inhaled by some largely young people for the purpose of intoxication. Um, I'm advised the effects, which include distortion perceptions, occur quickly and dissipate within minutes. And the gas inhaled typically by discharging nitrous oxide gas cartridges or bulbs into another object or directly into the mouth. Nitrous oxide is, as you observe, member, referred to by a number of colloquial names, including Nangs, which I was familiar with, Whippets, which is a learning experience for me, and, and of course, laughing gas. But if, um, these not only have a, um, a, a it's not only the substance themselves, but it's the, the containers they're in. And um, I acknowledge the member for Thornley in the chamber, who will attest um, to the experiences of confronting these on the road, and they're actually quite dangerous for cyclists. But, um, but uh, member, you're, you're absolutely uh, right that there is an increased concern and, um, and level of use in relation to, um, to nitrous oxide. And these uh, concerns about the, the use have been supported in the most recent findings of the ecstasy and related drugs reporting system published in September of this year. The reports um, have suggested that this increase may be related to growing availability via both retail outlets as well as online based businesses that will deliver bulk units of nitrous oxide to residential dwellings 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this sale and supply is often made under the guise of selling catering supplies. There's an increase in number of people presenting to hospital emergency departments as a result of use of, of nitrous oxide. Uh, one major Perth hospital has advised that there have been um, seven nitrous oxide related ED presentations observed over the past six months compared to just two in the previous 12 months. So I think your, you and your constituents are right there has certainly been an increase in the, the level of, of, of use. Some patients have um, presented, the ED, presented to the ED following the prolonged heavy use of nitrous oxide. For example, uh, Acting Speaker, one patient reported consuming 200 to 300 bulbs per day over three months, while another reported consuming 1,000 over a 72-hour period. Uh, this is obviously extreme levels of use, but really, really uh, provides a, a, a picture in terms of just how bad that is in some cases. There's a range of potential harms, member, that you mentioned, um, including deliberate inhalation of nitrous oxide and including reduced blood pressure, fainting, heart attack and hypoxia. And, um, and prolonged use can lead to other extreme um, uh, responses subacute spinal degeneration, the loss of ability to walk, numbness in the ex exterior extremities. And some people may require prolonged rehabilitation to walk again. While the number of emergency department presentations are relatively small, the associated harms are serious and require deliberate and targeted and proportionate response. Um, in WA, um, nitrous oxide is not currently considered a prohibited drug. Um, it is legitimately used, as you observed, in a number of contexts. Um, and it is important that regulations introduced to restrict the sale of recreation use do not have unintended consequences. However, measures must be considered to reduce the ease of access to people for the purpose of intoxication. I absolutely support your, your sen sentiments as far as that's concerned. The Mental Health Commission is continuing to work to reduce the harms of the WA community, to the WA community caused by the use of volatile substances such as nitrous oxide. Uh, providing, uh, and these include providing support to regional stakeholders where addressing the volatile substances has been identified as a priority, maintaining a website to provide information to frontline workers and service providers, and producing a retailer's information kit and code of conduct regarding the supply of volatile substances to inform retailers' legal responsibilities and guide them in the responsible sale and display of volatile substances. In light of the reported instances, member, um, and you raising it with me, with the member of Belmont, um, I've asked the Mental Health Commission to provide advice on the ways that the government can respond. To develop that advice, the Commission is working with representatives of the Department of Health, the West Australian Police Force and Hospital Medical Officer and academic experts. 
The group is considering a range of potential responses, including reviewing regulatory options, industry codes and introducing targeted education for retailers and consumers. And the group is mindful of a proportionate response to the level of harm, as well as the need to avoid unintended consequences and unnecessary impacts on the sale and supply of nitrous oxide for its legi legitimate use. So thank you very much, Member, for bringing this uh, issue to the, to, the, um, to the government's attention. Um, I think you and your constituents are, are working well to uh, you're working well with your constituents to um, to bring this to our attention, to understand the, the concerns, and to bring about an appropriate response. Uh, I might just use the rest of my time, Member, to, to observe that in opposition, I once brought a bill to this place to ban the sale of butane gas sale um, in, to, to miners, uh, butane gas used in uh, uh, various solvents and, and, um, and spray paints. But that was, and that was the government of, of the day, um, uh, you know, uh, resisted the temptation to support my bill. But in those days, we had people essentially just accessing these products through retail, high street retail outlets, and it was easy for the industry to respond. My concern in this case is that the capacity for the industry to respond is limited by the fact that so much of the sales are online. So I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, regulation will, will be necessary and um, uh, the Mental Health Commission will dig into these issues over the coming weeks and months um, to provide the government with advice on how we should proceed. Acting further Speaker. Further grievances, Member for Thornley. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Parliamentary Secretary also. My grievance is to the Minister for Child Protection, and I begin by acknowledging the Minister's strong leadership in her portfolio areas. Minister, I'm concerned that there seem to be some in the teaching profession and others with responsibility for children who are unsure of their reporting obligations when it comes to sexual assault offences. I was relieved to hear that two former Trinity College teachers were found guilty of failing to report sexual offences that occurred on a school rugby trip to Japan in 2017. My heart goes out to the victim of these offences and I offer him and his family my deepest sympathies. As a former student of Trinity College, I left there 40 years ago in 1980, I'm appalled that some aspects of the school's culture seem to have changed little in 40 years. The cultural pattern that seems to have endured for more than 40 years can be characterised as a turning a blind eye to an unacceptable and demeaning behaviour. As the 2016 Australian of the Year, David Morrison said, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. With sexual assault, it should never be accepted. While the 2017 case at Trinity did eventually come before the public eye and receive public scrutiny, I fear that the governance arrangements at private schools could mean that similar cases don't benefit from transparency or receive exposure. The Minister might like to comment on this risk. In relation to teachers and others in positions of responsibility for children, how can we ensure that they don't become desensitised to any form of abusive behaviour amongst students and, and don't come to accept abusive behaviour as a normal part of growing up and that they have the training to recognise abusive behaviour and have the skills and knowledge to deal with it. While sexual assault must be one of the worst forms of abusive behaviour, I'm concerned about the need for all schools, especially private schools, to be held accountable for other forms of abusive behaviour, including racial slurs, bullying, and bullying leading to sexual assault. It's very sad to learn that the victim of the Trinity Japan trip sexual assault subsequently suffered from online bullying for months afterwards. For the record, I should say that my nine years at Trinity were happy and that the school's focus on sport actually suited me. I was very fond of being part of the school's sporting tradition. Academically, I was an average student, so my greatest achievements came from modest success in athletics, cricket and hockey. But I must also say I, I enjoyed the mostly positive way the school encouraged discussion of ideas and gave students a sense of the right to question all manner of moral and ethical issues. It was a mostly positive experience experience. But I was always uneasy with a clickiness that actually enabled groups of bullies to exist without reproach. You'd like to think standards have changed in the last 40 years, but evidence suggests otherwise. I'm concerned that there's a connection with a school's excessive focus, excessive focus on sporting success and a culture of what happens on the sports field stays on the sports field. 
This is a culture that is readily expanded to what happens on a school trip stays on a school trip, which is the mindset that caused the Trinity Japan 2017 events. Minister, there are many people who hold positions of power over children. What actions is the government taking to ensure there's no abuse of this power or turning a blind eye to such offences? Minister. Acting Speaker, uh, I thank the member very much for raising this important issue. And of course, as he's highlighted, sexual abuse is simply never accept excusable, is never acceptable. As the Minister for Child Protection, I have seen firsthand the devastating impact and tragic consequences that this can have on children involved, their families, as well as the broader community. And as you alluded to in your remarks, member, turning a blind eye is not a standard to accept. It is incredibly important, and, and I'd like to make clear our government's commitment to work to ensure that we have the right legislation, the policies and the implementation of practices in place to protect children from child abuse, child sexual abuse. Because the community has a right to expect that our children are safe, especially within the institutions that uh, we all trust to protect those children. We want our children to be safe and we want them to grow up confident and strong. And I want to ensure the member and all members of this House that the McGowan government is committed to creating a safer state for children and young people. And we will not ignore instances of child sex sexual abuse. I share his concerns for ensuring that where abuse is uncovered, we have the right responses in place to respond appropriately and quickly. Mandatory reporting, and the specific case the member refers to, is a good example of one of the levers we have to do that. The successful prosecution of the two former teachers from Trinity College has sent a very clear message about the expectation on mandatory reporters. We've already seen a healthy public commentary surrounding the prosecution, which I think has helped to raise awareness amongst the public, as well as mandatory reporters. Those two teachers were found to have been aware of the serious nature of the incident, but failed to report the abuse, as is required to them under law, under the provisions of the Children and Community Services Act 2004. It is a legal requirement in this state for doctors, nurses, midwives, teachers, police officers and boarding house supervisors to report all reasonable beliefs of child sexual abuse to the Department of Communities. Now, the member might be also interested to know that not only are we enforcing and continuing to monitor the successful operation of current legislation, <coughs> but we are also looking to expand it. In its 409 recommendations, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse outlined, the cha outlined changes to ensure that history does not repeat itself. The recommendations of the Royal Commission were developed over five years, with the input of nearly 17,000 people coming forward and telling their story, over 8,000 private sessions. 57 individual case studies and scores of independently commissioned research reports. One of the changes the Royal Commission recommended was the expansion of mandatory reporting to child, of child sexual abuse to include additional professions, namely uh, people in religious ministry, out-of-home care workers, youth justice workers, early childhood workers and registered psychologists and, ch and school counsellors. The Children and Community Services Amendment Bill 2019 seeks to expand the reporter professions. It passed this House unanimously and is currently before the Legislative Council, who I hope will pass the important legislation before the House rises. The McGowan Government is committed to implementing all of the categories of mandatory reporters recommended in the Royal Commission in a phased approach to ensure effectiveness of the implementation of the recommendations. And I think that's one of the, the points that you raised well in your grievance, Member, that it, having the legislation is one thing, making sure that those uh, people who are required to mandatory report um, uh, understand their obligations and uh, uh, the institutions that they operate within understand their obligations as well as an important part of its successful implementation. 
Uh, further to these changes to mandatory reporting, the government is also progressing significant reforms, as recommended by the Royal Commission, to ensure that institutions that are trusted with supporting our children have independent oversight. This means ensuring that they are complying with the legislation policies and practices, such as mandatory reporting, that government sets. The work to progress independent oversight of child safe principles out of home care services and youth justice services will help to ensure that all institutions working with children are aware of the risks, have protective measures in place to mitigate those risks and are accountable to, the, to an independent authority. In addition to this reform, I recently tabled the Parliamentary Commissioner Amendment Reportable Conduct Bill 2020 as a Green Bill in this place for public consultation. The draft bill seeks to establish a reportable conduct scheme to provide independent oversight of how organisations hand handle allegations and convictions of child abuse. The bill will compel heads of organisations to notify the Ombudsman of misconduct within their organisations so that the Ombudsman can then review investigation findings or undertake investigations on their own motion. An estimated 4,000 organisations in this state will be covered by the Reportable Conduct Scheme, including education services such as schools, as well as a wide range of others. There have been some important research findings, recommendations and lessons which have emerged from our landmark Royal Commission in this country. Frankly, they are, all, they are relevant to all of us, as this sort of work requires not only vigilance, but buy-in from the whole community. As the member can, but as the member can rest assured that we are doing all we can to respond to historical abuse in the distant and not so distant past, um, to prevent further abuse from happening again, and to assure a swift response to abuse should it happen again. Further grievances, Member for Cottesloe. Much acting Speaker, my grievance is to the Minister for Transport, and I thank the Minister for taking my grievance. My grievance relates to the considerable concern in North Fremantle about changes to the planned location for the old Fremantle traffic bridge crossing Queen Victoria Street. The concerns of residents fall into three parts. The pending demise of the old wooden bridge, the increasing difficulty people are experiencing crossing Queen Victoria Street due to increased traffic volumes, and the relocation of the new bridge from the west side of the current bridge to the east side of the current bridge. As I've said before in this place, I empathise with the concerns that residents have expressed about the loss of the old wooden bridge. As I understand it, this is the largest and one of the oldest wooden bridges uh, in Western Australia. Many residents and people in Fremantle would like to see the bridge retained and used for another purpose, such as a pedestrian crossing or a market precinct. However, I understand the government's position that maintenance of the existing wooden bridge is unaffordable and that a replacement bridge is required. I believe that the proposal to maintain the ends of the bridge on both sides of the river to maintain part of the historic structure is a good initiative that will help to maintain some of the history of the original structure. Whatever the final outcome, I hope that this plan is part of the final project. Up until quite recently, all plans around a replacement bridge at Queen Victoria Street showed the new bridge located to the west of the current bridge. When the announcement was made in April 2019 about the commencement of the replacement bridge, the Minister for Planning and the Federal Member for Fremantle, Mr Josh Wilson, were holding up a schematic showing the replacement bridge located to the west of the existing bridge. I think that it is fair to say that there are mixed views about the need for a new bridge versus maintaining the old bridge. I'm not sure of the split, but there are a fair number in each camp. However, there is universal support in the local North Fremantle community for locating any replacement bridge to the west of the existing bridge. Members of the Fremantle Historical Society and residents are concerned that any replacement bridge located to the east of the existing bridge will interfere with the remaining foundations of the previous convict-built bridge across the river. These foundations are observable on, observable on the northern bank of the river where there will be greatest impact from the new bridge. The growing traffic volumes along Queen Victoria Street are making it much more difficult for residents to cross the street in the main shopping area. Like many community shopping areas, the shops are seeing quite a dramatic resurgence in, in patronage as people choose to support their local businesses. Fremantle Council have placed some traffic calming measures in the area. 
However, residents, especially parents with younger children and people with mobility difficulties, are very concerned that crossing the busy street is becoming too dangerous. The road is becoming a barrier separating the local community. I strongly encourage the minister to ask her department to work with the local community to understand how improved connection for cyclists and pedestrians across Queen Victoria Street can be incorporated into the new bridge project. Local residents in the area adjacent to the currently proposed bridge route are extremely concerned that this choice will bring a major highway within a few metres of the residents living in apartments along Quang Alley in North Fremantle. I believe that these residents are fully justified in their concerns about the proximity of the relocated highway alignment to their homes and the impact that it will have on their lives. These are people who in good faith purchased quite expensive apartments knowing that they were near Queen Victoria Street but now find that the road will be brought to within a few metres of their houses. They will be unfairly impacted by noise and vibration from heavy traffic crossing the bridge. This is going to have a significantly negative impact on their quality of life, especially given the increased level of traffic movements through this area. The relocation of the bridge to the east of the existing bridge was apparently required because the government has decided to duplicate the existing rail crossing to cope with an anticipated uh, increases in container freight to the North Mole. They're duplicating that rail crossing to the east of the existing bridge, which will then prevent the replacement traffic bridge being located to the west of the existing traffic bridge. As I've mentioned before, I was surprised by why, that would need, uh, why we would need to spend something like $100 million on a new rail bridge when the government's stated intention is to transition container freight to the Outer Harbour in a few years. The Minister was kind enough to provide a briefing on the bridge project in her office with her department, and that, at that meeting I was informed by the Department of Transport representatives that it was planning for the continuation of container freight at Fremantle Harbour until at least 2037. I understand, Minister, that relocating the rail bridge to the west of the existing bridge is not trivial, but believe that the government should re-examine this option to determine if innovative solutions can make this achievable. I strongly encourage the Minister to work with her department to see if it is possible to stick with the original plans to locate the replacement Queen Victoria Street bridge to the west of the existing bridge. Bringing a busy freight and commuter road so close to existing residences is an unfair outcome. Thank you. Uh, Minister for Transport. Uh, thank you, and I thank the member for Cottesloe for that grievance. Now, of course, the debate and the discussion on the Fremantle Traffic Bridge does have a bit of a chequered history in relation to differing views of the, of the project over many, many times. I remember, I think, under the previous government, there was some substantial funds committed uh, for... Pardon? I think that's correct, Member for Fremantle. Um, there were substantial funds committed uh, for a replacement bridge at one point in time, and then it was ripped away, um, I think about a year later, as I recall. Um, and at that time, it was recognised by the previous government that there were some um, ongoing safety concerns and the ability to maintain that Fremantle traffic bridge into the future was a primary concern for its replacement. Um, as you noted, um, it is an old bridge uh, built in 1937, as I recall, uh, 1938. It was built as a temporary structure and um, since uh, probably about over the past 10 years, a significant maintenance expenditure has been required and works to keep it safe um, for motorists and and pedestrians and the whole community. So continuing works have been needed. So there has been a need um, for a new Fremantle traffic bridge for I think probably over 10 years there's been an absolute need to replace it. And that's why we partnered with the Commonwealth to secure, um, both from the state and federal budget, over $200 million for the replacement of that bridge. And this is not about more traffic, it's actually about creating a safer bridge for motor, motorists, pedestrian and cyclists too. And I think it actually is an absolute necessity. Um, and it's not a like to have. To me, this is a much needed project to make sure we continue have, to have a safe crossing at that point. I just want to talk about the pedestrian and cycling access too, because there's been a bit of discussion about this in the community. And um, as Minister for Transport, um, I think you can't question our commitment to uh, 
cycling infrastructure in Western Australia. I think over $220 million allocated over the next four years. So this will be a big part of uh, the improvements, will be improved access for cyclists and pedestrians. And there's been a number of claims made about this which actually quite bother me because a government that's actually getting on with it to improve access is you know, being criticised for this type of bridge which will actually improve access for pedestrian and cyclists. And when you look at it, and remember I know you've been a big supporter of the improved um, cycling connectivity along Curtin Ave up to um, Victoria Street. Um, and then of course we're about to embark on stage two and the improved connections on the new Fremantle traffic bridge will be stage three. And we'll have a dedicated PSP from Fremantle to Perth. Um, which I think is just going to be incredible, an absolute incredible um, achievement. And as part of that too, I know there's been some discussions about how the PSP connects, in a sense, on the southern side, and we continue to engage to make sure we get good connectivity. Again, this is all about improving connectivity, and I, I would like people to recognise that is this government that's actually building the PSP from Fremantle to Perth and dedicated the funds. So I want to just put that to rest, first of all. I think you made some, so, so, so member, three key issues. Um, one was about, the, was about the demise of the old wooden bridge. It's clear we're not going to be able to maintain and keep the entire wooden bridge, not only because of the maintenance costs, but the navigational impact on the water. Now, the, as in complexity of projects, this is one that has it all. It has uh, making sure we have great connectivity for cyclists and pedestrians. It's working with an, ex an operating freight line, um, passenger rail line, uh, major uh, traffic bridge, and of course the, the river. And so you basically have got every potential constraint um, there in one area. So working around that is very difficult. But one of the reasons why we can't keep the entire bridge is because not only the maintenance costs, but also the impact it has on the boating community as they navigate their way through a number of different piers. Um, but we are in, um, and this is going to be a continued discussion with the community about how much we can retain and how that um, then provides a community um, asset, whether it's be for fishing or whether it can be facilitated to even have some uh, bars, restaurants, cafes, that type of thing, and we're very keen to do that. The difficulty people are experiencing crossing Victoria Street, I agree, Member, and the North Fremantle Precinct is an excellent precinct. I, um, when I'm in that area, I do stop by to some of the coffee shops. It is a vibrant high street feeling, and, um, and, um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, uh, like I said, exciting little, little precinct. Um, and of course, the other key point is the relocation of, of the new bridge. But on the, on the issue of pedestrian connectivity, I do want to say that we'll continue to work and see how we can get that connectivity in that area. Because as we said, it's a, it's a well frequented um, area and continues to grow. And of course, then there's the issue of the relocation of the new bridge from the west side of the current bridge to the east side of the current bridge. Look, I understand there's some concerns. and. Of all the concerns, I think the ones from North Fremantle, in particular that apartment building, um, they're concerns that we're listening to in relation to the proximity of the new bridge. The only point I would say is that we are operating within an existing MRS uh, main roads reserve and we'll do whatever we can to mitigate any impact. And I just want to also outline that we'll be going into an alliance contract on this, which means that it is not a design and construct. We will not sit there and say this is how you'll be building the bridge. This is where we in, in basically engage with a company, a contractor, and look how we can div, you know, provide the best bridge we can um, in that area. Can I thank yourself? Can I thank the member for Fremantle and the member uh, for Bicton too for their positive engagement um, on this because they have constantly feeding back community views and making sure that we take into account the views of the community and in particular some of the views about pedestrian and, and cycling um, access. So can I thank the member for Fremantle and the member for Bicton. This is not an easy project. I'd say it's one of the hardest. It's up there, but we'll do what we can to, to deliver an excellent project. Thank you. Committee reports. The member for Joondalup. Thank you, Mr. Acting.
Mr Speaker, I present for tabling the 18th report of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation titled Curtin University Statute No. 5, Election of Council Members and Curtin University Statute No. 12, Admission and Enrolment. Mr Acting Speaker, the report I have just tabled serves two purposes. Firstly, it advises the House of the Committee's recommendation that Curtin University Statute No. 5, Election of Council Members, be disallowed. Secondly, it provides information to the House about the Committee's concerns in relation to Curtin University's interpretation of the Curtin University Act of 1966. In relation to the disallowance, the Curtin Act creates a hierarchy of regulation. Firstly, the University Council may make statutes about certain matters set out in the Act. Statutes must be approved by the Governor, published in the Gazette and laid before Parliament. Statutes are subject to disallowance. Secondly, the University Council may make rules under statutes. Rules do not require the approval of the Governor and are not subject to disallowance. In the committee's view, rules are subsidiary to statutes and are intended to contain administrative or auxiliary matters to statutes. The Act requires the manner of election of council members to be prescribed by statute. Curtin Statute No. 5 fails to prescribe the manner of electing members of council and instead provides that the manner of election will be set out in the rules. In the committee's view, by electing to prescribe such matters in rules rather than statutes, Curtin is, in effect, avoiding the scrutiny of Parliament. The, Curt the committee recommends that Statute No. 5 be disallowed. Turning to the, uh, the Curtin Act in general, the information report sets out the committee's and Curtin's competing, competing interpretations of the Curtin Act. The committee is very concerned about Curtin's interpretation of the Curtin Act, which results in Curtin, rather than Parliament, deciding which material will be scrutinised by Parliament. The issue for further consideration is whether the Act intends to provide Curtin with a discretion to determine whether subject matters set out in section 34 of the Act should be subject to disallowance or not. I commend the report to the House. The member for Joondalup. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. I present for tabling the 19th report of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation titled Annual Report of 2020. The report that I've just tabled advises the House of the key activities of the committee for the 2020 calendar year. The committee scrutinises instruments made under statutory delegation and determines whether the instruments are <coughs> beyond the scope of the delegated power or otherwise in breach of the committee's terms of reference. The committee continues to scrutinise large volumes of delegated legislation. This year, the committee scrutinised 330 instruments, including 181 regulations and 18 local laws. Motions for the disallowance of delegated legislation usually do not proceed if, sta if satisfactory undertakings, undertakings are given to the committee. The committee only recommends disallowance as, on the, last, as the last resort. During 2020, the committee received two ministerial and 17 local government undertakings. The committee requested undertakings from two local governments to repeal their local laws in its entirety due to the large volume of issues contained within them. These undertakings were provided to the committee. The committee tabled three reports this year. In one of those reports, the committee recommended that an instrument be disallowed, the instrument being the Curtin University Statute No. 5, Election of Council Members, is set to be debated in the other place on its last day of sitting. The committee also drew Parliament's intentions to its concerns surrounding Curtin University's interpretation of the Curtin University Act of 1966, which results in Curtin University, rather than the Parliament, deciding which of its regulatory material will be scrutinised by Parliament. The committee trusts that the matters noted in this report will assist persons and bodies making delegated legislation to understand the committee's processes. I commend the report to the House. Oh, oh. Further, further to this report, Member for Cottesloe. Thank you very much. Uh, Acting Speaker, uh, look, I just want to make uh, a brief. Sorry, I might just. Are you a member of the committee? I am. Oh, you're delegated a, I apologise. Member yes. for Cottesloe. Uh, I am. Uh, look, I just want to make a brief contribution. Um, first of all, I want to recognise the uh, effort of the chair uh, of this um, committee, uh, the member for Joondala, um, for the excellent work that she does. One of the, I've said one of the pleasures in this place, and I think it's true for all members is the participation in committees and that you get to know members outside of the political sphere, if you like, 
and you get to know the uh, you get to know the members as as people and for the work they do. And um, the member for Joondalup, can I say, does an excellent job uh, chairing this committee. My other committee members, um, uh, the Honourable Martin Pritchard, the Honourable Kyle McGinn, who's um, now been uh, replaced, but um, the Honourable uh, 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 Robin, Cl uh, sorry, the member for Murray Wellington, the member for Kalgoorlie. I did want to especially recognise um, the Honourable Robin Chapel, um, who's been a member of Parliament for almost 20 years um, in in the other place, and, and and can I say what an outstanding parliamentarian. Um, and he's had to leave in, in I guess, um, for personal health reasons, which is which is very tragic and sad, but he, in his normal way, is very stoic and upbeat about all that. Um, but he really is an outstanding parliamentarian. And, and can I say in particular, you know, the importance of corporate memory. Um, the Honourable uh, Robin Chapel and the Honourable Martin Pritchard I, Pritchard, I think it's probably fair to say, are the heart and soul of the Delegated Legislation Committee. Um, and, and that's just because they've been on there for a time and they remember those things. Now, look, Delegated Legislation is not a sexy committee. It's not one of those sort of committees that everyone's champing at the bit necessarily to get on. But it really plays a, a critical role and that was exemplified uh, in the original motion that the member for Joondalup gave in relation to the Curtin Council. It's very, very important that we do not let our processes degrade. And I don't wish to conflate this in any way, um, uh, but I think, you know, today we heard an announcement in relation to matters overseas with the military. And, and at the root core of that was the breakdown of proper process and procedure. And, and I think in this place it's really important that we always make sure that proper processes and procedures are followed. Um, and uh, look, so uh, I do also want to recognise the, uh, the uh, staff, as always in this place. We, we are just superbly served by the staff we have. And I'm on two committees, and it's true for both of those committees. Um, but Denise Wong, um, uh, our legal advisory officer, uh, Laura Hutchinson, um, another legal advisory officer, um, uh, Shoshuna McNerney, uh, who's also a, a legal advisory officer, and also Claire Siever, the committee clerk. And as everyone knows, um, it's those administrative roles that make the rest of us look slightly or look organised. And, and so, very grateful for that, and, um, and uh, certainly commend the report to the House. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Swan Hills. Report of the Economics and Industry Standing Committee, entitled "Turning to India: Investing in Our Future," and the associated submissions. Tabled. This report, "Turning to India: Investing in Our Future," has been tabled at a particularly challenging time. Nations continue to grapple with the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, an event that has interrupted trade flows, supply chains and the free movement of people and continues to adversely affect population health and economic development around the globe. China has announced a range of restrictions on Australian exports, many of which are significant to the Western Australian economy. At a time when it's essential to keep our trading relationships strong, our state, the most trade-oriented in the nation, finds itself affected by the strained relationship between Beijing and Canberra. There's never been a more important time to consider the steps Western Australia can take to fortify its existing trade relationships and develop pathways to new markets. This inquiry was initiated at a time when WA's disproportionate reliance on a single partner and in a handful of commodities was acknowledged but considered relatively uncontentious and obviously prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Given the increased global awareness of the transformation and growth of India's economy over recent years, the committee considered it worthwhile to examine whether our state was effectively pursuing economic opportunities in that market. Western Australia was an early mover in recognising the export potential of the Indian market. In 1996, we were the first Australian state to open an office in India, establishing the Government of Western Australia's India office in Mumbai. Other states soon followed suit, dedicating significant resources and opening their own trade offices. Over time, other Australian states, particularly Victoria and New South Wales, have achieved far greater trade and investment engagement with India. While the Australia-India economic relationship has seen significant growth, with India now Australia's fifth largest partner, WA has not seen a commensurate increase in our bilateral trade flows. 
India is widely recognised as one of the fastest growing economies in the world. By 2035, it's predicted to be the third largest national economy behind China and the United States. A rapidly developing India will need many goods and services that WA can provide, including those from the education, mining, energy, agriculture and tourism sectors. This inquiry, originally intended to examine how we might regain momentum in our trading relationship with India, and broadly coincided with the release of two key state government policies, Western Australia's Asian Engagement Strategy 2019 to 2030, Our Future with Asia, and Diversify WA, Strong Economy, Creating Jobs, Diverse Industries. At the outbreak of the pandemic, the committee questioned whether we should proceed with this inquiry. After all, with such uncertainty, lack of information and a limited ability to predict our neighbours' responses to such an unprecedented global shock, what useful observations or recommendations could be made? Over the past eight months, however, it's become apparent that there's never been a more important time to consider where WA's economic future could lie and the steps we can take to leverage the unique position we now find ourselves in. On account of the McGowan government's decisive action in response to the outbreak of COVID-19, WA is currently one of the safest and strongest jurisdictions in the world. We have thus far avoided the worst health and economic impacts that have so devastated other nations. Western Australia is extremely well positioned for recovery, and trade has never assumed a more important role in our statewide recovery conversation. It is now vital that WA seeks to diversify its trade base with new partners in new markets and across new goods and services. While significant efforts are focused on internal recovery, WA needs to also build new industries and markets, industries that will harness our innovation and existing capacities and chart new courses to new markets. India is one such destination for our joint endeavours and amongst all of our potential trading partners should receive our prime focus. There are a range of factors complicating the pathway to increase trade with India. India's system of government is remarkably complex. The national government has a limited capacity to direct the economy and the policies of its 36 sub-national governments, all of which are significant economic actors in their own right. Indian markets are complex, have difficult tariff regimes, particularly in agriculture, and contain other regulatory and non-tariff barriers. Australians also generally lack an awareness of Indian business opportunities and do not understand India's business culture well. India is also able to meet much of its own demand for Western Australia's traditional major exports. Where we trade, Western Australia often supplements an internal supply, rather than being the main source for key commodities such as iron ore and LNG. A far wider variety of products and services are likely to underpin our future relationship, with demand for international education and tourism in particular likely to be significant. To be successful, Western Australia must apply a different, more nuanced, layered and proactive engagement strategy than we've traditionally adopted for other commodities, products, services and markets. Evidence to this inquiry has demonstrated that state-level trade policy requires long-term planning and commitment and should ideally enjoy broad-based political support. A non-partisan approach to trade policy would enable successive administrations to take strategic and ambitious approaches to policy and program development and deliver stronger long-term trading ties and relationships. This will be vital to success in India. The evidence also shows that collaboration with Australian national, state and territory governments is imperative. Both the Australian and Indian national governments have signalled their intent to enhance the bilateral relationship through the Varghese and Wadwa reports respectively. We have recommended that our own initiatives complement nationwide efforts. No Australian state has the capacity to penetrate the Indian market alone. A combined effort is likely to yield better outcomes for all. The state government's economic framework, Diversify WA, and Western Australia's Asian Engagement Strategy adopt a sectoral approach to economic development. The Western Australian Investment and Trade Plan 2019-20 identifies pri priority subsectors in India that fall within Western Australia's six priority sectors. Our report considers the consistency and intersections between these documents and the opportunities and challenges in international education tourism, mining and minerals, energy and agribusiness. 
We observe that the state government's commitment to India should be based on a well-resourced and long-term approach. Sustained deep relationships between people, businesses and institutions matter in India. They need time and support to develop. We note the importance of adequately resourcing an in-country presence and support a review of Gawa India's location and the viability of establishing a second office. People-to-people -people links matter. This report finds that regular and sustained ministerial visits between our jurisdictions build high-level connections and facilitate trade and investment. Trade missions also provide opportunities to build international connections, foster business relationships and identify partnering and investment opportunities. It's also important to identify local champions to promote WA and to increase cultural ties and media literacy in government and the business community. The large and growing Indian, West Indian Indian diaspora is an underutilised resource and could greatly assist to strengthen our trading relationship, particularly when the capacity to travel is constrained in the COVID-19 environment. The diaspora's established ties are a vital link to India, providing a bridge when other methods to deepen relationships and obtain market intelligence are limited. There's never been a more important time to engage the Indian diaspora to reinforce relationships between our nations, maintain informal and formal pathways to market, gain an understanding of opportunities for re-engagement and gather market intelligence. Research and development relationships can and will also continue. It will, be a vital, it will be vital to tap into and develop the networks and partnerships between universities, research institutions and academic communities. Research teams are used to collaborating across borders and can reinforce international links. Despite the large volume of suggestions made to the committee, evidence gathered and the range of findings and recommendations contained in this report, one finding is inescapable. The COVID-19 pandemic has wrought significant damage to the global economy and creates unprecedented uncertainty. The pandemic struck at the very early stages of this inquiry, infecting our capacity to gather and interrogate much of the evidence presented. Hearings were delayed or cancelled, and programs of work associated with specific terms of reference were not undertaken. The committee was unable to travel and meet with many of the organisations and individuals who could have provided significant insight and expertise. Moreover, there were understandable and entirely legitimate constraints on the capacity of state and Commonwealth government agencies to engage, given their immediate and intense focus on COVID response. This again has affected the capacity of the committee to test a range of potential of, of, uh, findings and recommendations we might otherwise have made. The COVID-19 pandemic is also ever evolving. Whilst the committees gathered information on trade dynamics prior to the pandemic, the limited resources available to us rendered it impossible to reach firm conclusions on the impacts of COVID-19 on the bilateral relationship or make detailed recommendations on appropriate policy responses. The pandemic and associated restrictions have, however, undoubtedly had significant effects on the bilateral relationship. These effects have not, however, been uniform, and even within individual sectors, demand and supply dynamics vary between services and commodities. The committee received evidence underscoring the need for the state to remain export-focused and trade-oriented. Throughout this report, the committee notes the importance of long-term, consistent and sustained engagement to foster opportunities and enhance the WA-India economic relationship. This is ever more important in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Asian Engagement Strategy committed the state government to developing a 10-year economic outlook to assess priority Asian markets and identify trade and investment opportunities, key infrastructure developments, supply and value chain creation and trade and investment barriers. It will be virtually impossible at the current time to develop a 10-year outlook on regional trade dynamics given the extraordinary impacts of COVID-19 and the general level of global uncertainty. Nonetheless, it remains important to adopt a long-term approach to building relationships and markets. India is not the type of market where sporadic government-to-government, business-to-business and people-to-people -people contact will deliver high rates of growth. Instead, broadening and deepening the relationship will rely on sustained and consistent engagement. It may also be necessary for the state government to adopt a more focused program of activity. The Asian Engagement Strategy lists a number of nations for which market plans will be developed. 
Given the extraordinary strain that the COVID-19 response will place on the state's resources, it may be appropriate for the government to prioritise markets. The content and complexion of the market plans will no doubt also evolve as the dynamics of the pandemic unfold. The committee believes the India market plan should clearly indicate India's importance to WA, signal the state government's long-term commitment to promoting trade, set out the state government's vision for the relationship and strategic objectives, outline actions to achieve the vision, ensure a nuanced and tailored approach to the Indian market, reflecting WA's competitive strengths and the unique trade dynamic of the WA-India relationship, and include measures of success and targets. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need for WA to alter its traditional approach to trade, essentially requiring that it now undertake an international charm offensive. We cannot rely on the approach that we adopted with Japan, India, uh, sorry, Japan, Korea and China. Success in those markets was underpinned by their demand for and our supply of mineral and energy resources. Going forward, we cannot expect international trade partners to come to us with the same requirements. The growing interest in self-reliance and recognition of international supply chain weaknesses will likely cause other nations to look and invest far closer to home. To succeed, Western Australia needs to adjust its model. We need to elevate trade as a portfolio and proactively sell our goods and services to our trade partners, including India. We should position ourselves so that we're viewed internationally as a dependable partner in an increasingly challenging economic and geopolitical environment. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Diversify WA and the engage Asian Engagement Strategy signalled the state government's intent to broaden the state's economic base, markets and trading partners. In response to the pandemic, the government has acknowledged the centrality of change to COVID-19 uh, trade, sorry, to COVID-19 recovery. The path forward is uncertain. Many factors affecting recovery will be beyond the state government's control. However, recovery will require a sustained and elevated focus on trade. It's crucial that the state government continues to emphasise WA's role in global supply lines and status as a dependable partner. Broad-based political consensus as COVID-19's impact on global and regional trade dynamics becomes clearer, Western Australia's trade-related initiatives are more likely to meet with success if they enjoy broad-based political support. A long-term view, the WA-India economic relationship in particular will require consistent and sustained engagement. The formation of strategic partnerships. Evidence to the inquiry suggested that the future prosperity of WA's manufacturing sector in particular may hinge on our ability to integrate into international manufacturing supply lines and processes with trusted partners. At a charm offensive, WA cannot rely on its historical approach to trade relationships based on meeting our neighbours' demand for minerals and energy. Our relationships with new partners will be conducted on different terms. We will need to work harder and smarter to attract new markets and opportunities. This report makes 124 findings and 37 recommendations that we hope will contribute towards a public discussion on how to strengthen our trading relationship with India, despite the challenges presented by COVID-19. Given our safe, strong economy, we're presented with a fantastic opportunity to chart an ambitious course in trade policy. Success with India will be essential to achieving our broader economic goals. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to extend our sincere thanks to the many organisations and individuals who engage so uh, productively with us on this inquiry. We received 49 submissions, held 18 hearings with more than 35 witnesses and 15 depos uh, deposition sessions. We appreciated the effort so many people went to to provide us with the best possible information and assistance in very challenging circumstances. I'd also like to acknowledge the amazing support provided by the committee office staff, our principal research officer, Suzanne Valletta, and research officer, Francesca Walker. The inquiry presented a wide range of logistical challenges throughout COVID-19, all of which were met with absolute professionalism. Suffice to say, this is not the report the committee intended to table when we commenced this inquiry, but the fact that we managed to produce a report containing such a wealth of information is testament to the extraordinary length Suzanne and Francesca went to. Their assistance in actually getting us to the finishing line before the 40th Parliament rises has truly been remarkable. 
Finally, and on a personal note, I'd like to thank my colleagues on the committee. This will be the last uh, report we produce together in the 40th Parliament, and it's been an absolute pleasure to work with each of you. Whilst the recent addition of David Honey to our committee has been very welcome and valuable, I want to express my sincere and particular gratitude to Deputy Chair Terry Redman and members Stephen Price and Yasma Barakai, all of whom who have served on the committee with me through the duration of the 40th Parliament. We've been uh, remarkably collegiate and collaborative, and I think we have produced a body of work that we can genuinely be proud of. We've approached significant and complex public policy issues with open minds and have managed to avoid the pitfalls of partisanship that so often unnecessarily afflict many aspects of political life. I've gained so much through the experience and am very grateful to have had the opportunity to learn from you all. Thank you for your friendship, your camaraderie and support. It's been a genuine privilege to serve with you. Member for Warren Blackwood. Acting Speaker, um, I, I'd also like to make some quick comments uh, in follow-on uh, from the Chair uh, for what is the, uh, the final report of the Economics and Industry Standing Committee for the 40th Parliament um, and, uh, and a report um, that I, I loosely said to our Chair in a text this morning that it's a, it's a nice doorstop. She's a, she's a hell of a piece of work uh, considering that, uh, that we weren't able to, uh, uh, to travel, uh, but nevertheless I uh, believe what we've delivered is something that will massively value add uh, to the discussion in Western Australia and our engagement with India. Um, there's, uh, there's 124 findings in the report, uh, 37 recommendations, uh, and, and I'm sure for those that uh, want to engage uh, in a, a, a very valuable discussion uh, of where India fits uh, in Western Australia's future, it, it, it should be good reading uh, for, uh, for those that have that interest. Um, I think at a, at a very high level it's, uh, it's important to get a bit of an understanding of just what India represents for Western Australia. Um, there's a really good couple of pages early in the report which gives you a quick snapshot of the, of the Indian economy and population, etc., and of course a snapshot of the current engagement as far as trade goes with WA. So, it has a population of 1.37 billion, that's the 2019 report. Uh, it'll be the world's largest by 2027, uh, so it's not insignificant. It's got a $3 billion economy, uh, presently the fifth largest and moving up the ranks. Uh, and as is highlighted on, uh, on, on one of the pages uh, early in the report that I just referenced, uh, it has an aspirational middle class 12 times larger than the Australian population. And so, as a market, uh, it is substantial, and, and I think uh, if we don't uh, get an understanding of how we can better engage with India, we are doing uh, our state a disservice. And uh, this report uh, is one of the pieces of the jigsaw uh, that, that helps uh, put that strategy together. Um, to give you an appreciation for where the current uh, trade relationship of Western Australia sits, it's currently less than two billion dollars now. Less, just less than $2 billion, $1.7, something like that, billion dollar trade we, we have existing with India. So what does that mean in the scheme of our other trade relationships? Well, China's just on $100 billion, just under a $100 billion trade relationship. Of course, it's mainly minerals and petroleum. Japan at $23 billion and South Korea at $10 billion. And you have to go a fair way down the ranks before India gets in the mix. So uh, just on those very raw numbers, the scale of the Indian economy, the scale of the population growth, the scale of their needs over the next couple of decades, our existing relationship coming from a very, very low point, you can understand why India needs to be in the mix. Uh, we have, and I say we uh, because it's a genuine position that we had in government and the current government has, we have a, a mantra of, of trying to diversify our economy. As has been mentioned by the chair uh, in her response, um, uh, strong engagement with China uh, underpins uh, one of the challenges that we have with Western Australia, uh, being so reliant on that market. So trying to diversify our economy is smart, and, uh, and, and the very high-level numbers as we approach India make a bit of sense as an opportunity for us. So this report is about how we can sharp point those opportunities, how we can engage with the very unique aspects that India presents and where those opportunities sit. Um, and I, I've, I've mentioned here before, and I think it's really important to mention here again, uh, I had, uh, up until recently, a view that India was just simply a second China and you go in and engage and that's what you do. It's not. 
It's massively different. It's massively different. Therefore, it needs a very bespoke, stra bespoke strategy uh, in response uh, and, uh, and, and something that's uh, very strategic in terms of how we engage, where we engage and how we get the connections in order to uh, develop the opportunities uh, with that or, or the competitive opportunities that West Australia has in, in engaging with India. As the, uh, the report has highlighted, a lot of the opportunities uh, sit in things like education, uh, tourism, uh, and a whole range of uh, export service opportunities, particularly in the, in the, uh, uh, the mining equipment technology and services, what is uh, described as METS, uh, and petroleum equipment technology and services, PETS, a couple of acronyms there, as, as well as renewable energy, uh, agricultural services, and of course uh, the broader uh, uh, research and development world. So there are a number of opportunities that are very, very different to China. Uh, and, uh, and this report gives us uh, a sharp point of how we might better engage to achieve that outcome. There's a really good um, quote on page 285 of the report uh, from Ambassador, Ambassador Anil Wadwa. Uh, he says that in India, you cannot really make headway until you are actually talking to the right people. And, and I think that's significant because uh, unless you get that to happen, whether it be through uh, uh, business circles, whether it be through government circles, whether it be through the Indian diaspora that we have here in Western Australia, uh, the report gives an insight into uh, enhancing those networks in order to be able to talk to the right people to make sure uh, that those opportunities can be developed. Um, and I think that point was made by the Chair uh, in her presentation. Uh, central to this is the relationship between the people, the businesses and the institutions. Uh, government can help facilitate those links uh, and, uh, and, and uh, sharpen the point of that engagement. So a big proportion of the recommendations go to the steps about enhancing the opportunities to get that engagement in the first instance in such a way as you can get business opportunities that come from it. Um, I, uh, one of the big learnings for me in the report, and it's good having the member for Jandicott, he was here a second ago, around there getting a glass of water. Member for Janicott here, um, um, who, who is obviously engaged in the Indian diaspora here in Western Australia. Um, uh, I didn't realise how strong that was. Um, I didn't realise how, how strong that was and how much of an opportunity and perhaps an underutilised opportunity, which the report finds uh, in terms of the connections we already have here in Western Australia to uh, use that, leverage that relationship already in order to get better outcomes than we currently do. And, uh, and the member for Jandicott has been valuable uh, in giving us those connections uh, in the committee's deliberations in order to be able to come up with relevant, uh, relevant recommendations as we move forward. Um, so I'm not going to go into any detail past that other than uh, the fact uh, I've enjoyed this as our, as our final report. I, I think the Economics Industry Standing Committee has done a, a wealth of work over the last uh, uh, four years, and certainly the public's got its value for money, uh, and, uh, and this, of course, is, uh, is the last one that, uh, that we're going to produce in this parliament. And uh, uh, like the, uh, the chair, I, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, my parliamentary colleagues, and the chair, uh, the honourable Jessica Shaw, I shouldn't say that, member for Swan Hills, uh, also to the, uh, the most recent uh, uh, member, uh, Dr David Honey, member for Cottesoe, uh, and also the member for Jandicott, and, and of course member for Forestfield, and uh, even the member for Church then still gets a mention in this report, uh, because he was there at the start. He's, he's got his tail in there, hasn't he, on all those, uh, all those last couple of reports, despite, uh, despite uh, uh, bailing early. Uh, but of course, as has been highlighted, as has been... As has, <laughs> as has been highlighted by the, uh, as has been highlighted by the uh, by the chair, uh, the fantastic work done by uh, Suzanne Valletta and also uh, um, uh, Francesca Walker uh, in particular, uh, and the efforts that they've gone into uh, to deliver this uh, under very challenging circumstances uh, in a, a COVID world, which uh, which makes it all the more difficult, uh, but but has have, have contributed massively to support us in delivering something that will actually value add uh, to, the, uh, to the people of Western Australia. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, uh, for those that want to engage in this space, uh, this is a good read and, uh, and, 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 and something that, uh, that, that I think has a lot of value. Um, uh, I'm, I've really enjoyed the Economics and Industry Standing Committee over this term of Parliament. Um, uh, it kind of works with my head, that the economic space, so, so that's an easy fit for me. I don't know what will happen post the election. You've got to get elected 
in the first instance, uh, and then hopefully, if, if the people of Warren Blackwood support me, I'll be back here and, uh, and uh, maybe as a minister, maybe as a minister, you never know, maybe as a minister, and, uh, and, and uh, I might not even have the opportunity to get on a committee. <laughs> might not even have the opportunity to get on a committee. Central Premier. But, um, but uh, I'm, members, uh, I'm, members, I'm certainly looking members. forward to uh, obviously going to the election now, asking our communities to, uh, to vote for us once again and give us their support uh, to come back here and, uh, and try and be, productive, uh, uh, be a, a, a productive component uh, for the people of this great state. Thank you. Member for Forestfield. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, gives me pleasure to um, contribute to the tabling of this report. Uh, turning to India, investing in our future. Uh, as we've already heard, this, this inquiry uh, has been quite challenging through the, um, the impact of COVID-19 uh, on us, and uh, the pandemic was declared very early on um, once we'd uh, started to undertake the hearing. But India is, um, is a very, very interesting and challenging uh, country, and as we've heard, it's, it's difficult at times to appreciate just the size of such a small place and the opportunities that are contained within it. With a, a current population of about nearly 1.4 billion, um, predicted in 2035 to be 1.6 billion and 1.7 billion by 2050, uh, it, it creates a, a lot of opportunity and a lot of opportunity for countries around the world, but also a lot of challenges for the government um, within India to provide for their people. Yeah. And to, to appreciate those numbers is, is quite hard. It's, it's just a number that's extraordinarily, extraordinarily large. And when you say there's 300 million people that actually don't have access to power, um, it's, it's um, phenomenal what, how big um, an area we're talking about in regards to opportunity. And as a, an opportunity to, to diversify our investment around different parts of the world. India is an obvious one that everyone says, you know, you've got to go and get into India, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Well, it's actually not that easy to do that. And what we heard through the evidence that was provided um, at, during the inquiry is there's a number of key elements to it of which um, we can certainly do better with into the future. It is, it's a challenging um, um, and complex government system over there where you do have a uh, Prime Minister, but then you have, um, was it 36 individual states essentially, which run their own race over there as well, sort of a, a federation type approach, similar to us, um, of which the, the, the federal government over there doesn't have a, a huge amount of influence in, on the state uh, governments and their economic policies. So we, you have to work specifically with the right people in the right areas, as, as we've heard. So. Providing for those one and a half billion people is a significant challenge for any government. And that's what opens up the opportunities uh, for other countries around the world, and in particular, uh, Australia and Western Australia. But it was very clear throughout the inquiry that a key element to that is relationships. And we have an Indian diaspora within WA of close to 100,000 people, which we just do not leverage the relationships enough off. And uh, it's certainly a wasted opportunity. And there's, it was quite evident throughout the inquiry that there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of willingness from the diaspora to engage with us to help um, make those connections and develop those relationships back in India. And the flip side, of that is that we have to have make, make sure we have the right resources over in India to take advantage of the relationships. And it became quite evident, and if you've had a, anything to do with the Indian diaspora uh, locally, that it, it is a personal relationship that they um, appreciate and rate very highly. And that takes time to develop. So the opportunity is there, yes, but you do have to put the right um, processes in place and develop the right relationships and develop them over time to actually be able to achieve the benefit that you're looking for and get the outcomes. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, as has been stated, some obvious choice for the diversification of our, um, our economy, but it does come with its challenges. And another one of those challenges, of course, is 
historically, iron ore, LNG have been our major exports, you know, and it's, it's resources that other countries want and they sort of come to us. Whereas India doesn't need those two things. You know, they, they have their own and access to it already. So for Western Australia as a, as a trading partner, then we have to go and look at what other services we can provide and what other services are, are required. And uh, that's a slightly different approach that we need to take because historically big trading partners has been quite easy because they just want what we've got. India is a bit of a different challenge in that regard. So there's opportunities to um, export different services and goods uh, to India, but once again, you need to develop the relationships and the opportunities through a commitment of, of time and resources, which has been identified um, through uh, the report and throughout. It's a, it's a constant theme that you'll see within the report. And um, it, it creates opportunity for uh, different services to be exported to uh, a major cust um, customer and uh, trading partner in other parts of the world. And as we've heard, international education and tourism are certainly one of those services that, uh, that can be exported. And then the Mets and the Pets, uh, as a member for Warren Blackwood spoke about, uh, other opportunities, agricultural opportunities. There's, there's a lot of opportunity there, but you do need to develop that opportunity and develop the relationships to actually be able to benefit from those opportunities. Um, I just actually conclude by a quote from the, the chair that she's contained in a forward, and, and she did mention it earlier, and I think it really sums up uh, the, the outcome of the inquiry, and it goes like this. It may be necessary for the state government to adopt a more focused program of activity. The Asian engagement strategy lists a number of nations for which market plans will be developed. The India market plan should clearly indicate India's importance to WA, signal the state government's long-term commitment to promoting trade, set out the state government's vision for the relationship and strategic objectives, outline actions to achieve the vision, ensure a nuanced and tailored approach to the Indian market, reflecting WA's competitive strengths and unique, unique trade dynamic of the WA-India economic relationship, and include measures of success and targets. To me, that really sums up the report. That outlines uh, a very clear path forward of, of what we need to do to enhance our relationship and, and trading relationship with India. I would just finish by uh, also thanking the support provided by Su uh, Suzanne Valletta and Research Officer Francesca Walker. Uh, you guys have done a power of work and it's, it's been very challenging and it was an a, a extremely big effort to get this finished and ta published and tabled prior to the conclusion of the 40th Parliament. Also, thank you to the committee members, um, Chair, Member for Swan Hills, Jess, uh, you've done a, an outstanding job and all of the work that we've done over the last uh, 40th Parliament has been in, incredibly interesting and, and uh, have certainly be, a lot of it will be reference um, documents for people into the future uh, because it, it has been uh, extremely productive and um, work that has been very thorough and very well done. Also, thank you to Deputy Chair, um, Member for Warren Blackwood, Terry, cheers mate, done a great job as well. Uh, Yaz Mubarakai, the member for Jandicott and uh, member for Cottesloe, David Honey, and of course the earlier member, the member for Churchlands, uh, Sean Lestrange, was also a very important part of the group before he uh, decided to leave us. <laughs> uh, it, it's been an absolute privilege to be part of the uh, Economics Industry Standing Committee during the 40th Parliament. and. Uh, I look forward to most of us being returned, hopefully, uh, in the uh, 41st Parliament. But uh, if I don't happen to get there, well, thank you, everyone. It's certainly been a privilege, and I've enjoyed it very much. <laughs> Member for Cottesloe. Thank you very much, everyone. I rise just to make a brief contribution. My uh, colleagues have done a very good job covering this to date. Look, first of all, I do want to start with the people, the chair. Um, can I say I understand uh, the chair, the uh, member for Swan Hill's passion for top politics, but I do think that um, uh, my involvement on this committee has indicated to me that, that the chair has a, a great future running a think tank somewhere. I think <laughs> <laughs> a big one with people with lots of energy. But look, 
um, you know, <laughs> impressive energy level. And uh, look, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and also, um, yes, Mavarakai, the, the engagement with the local diaspora was critically important here. And uh, uh, the, uh, the member for Jandicott um, certainly, uh, you know, contributed that, uh, I think, significantly to the committee in that engagement with the uh, with the, uh, the Indian diaspora, and, and that's been really important for this report. Um, I do want to recognise the other members, the Honourable, uh, or uh, the member for Warren Blackwood, um, also the member for Forestfield, um, uh, all great contributors, and uh, the Honourable um, Sean Lestrange, who, uh, the Honourable member for Churchlands, I should say, uh, who was uh, uh, on the committee before I came onto it and was, was actually uh, there when this report was. Um, initiated. Um, look, our research officers, I said this in relation to a previous report um, that was admitted, but uh, we simply couldn't do our job. The, the calibre of our staff is outstanding. And uh, to Suzanne um, Valletta, um, an outstanding focus and effort, um, and uh, Francesca Walker as well. Um, they, the, 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 the focus and, and uh, passion that they put into this is, is uh, a key. Uh, to being able to deliver the report. I did want to dwell a little bit on some functional things. The impact of COVID-19 clearly was profound on this committee. We talk in this report a lot about face-to-face -face communication, um, but unfortunately, outside of communicating with the immediate uh, community and, and government agencies locally, we couldn't go to India. And I, I think that that really takes something away from our collective ability um, to understand the issues more deeply. I think the job that was done was superb uh, despite that, but I think that is, uh, you know, something that, that 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 mitigated perhaps getting into some of the nuances of of uh, the opportunities. Um, I will say, for me, it highlighted that we need a better investment in equipment in our offices uh, to cope with uh, teleconferencing. Um, there was barely a time when that process went smoothly, and I'm not critical of any of the people involved. There was a good effort on every part, but we spent a lot of time off and, you know, trying to get through connections, get reconnections, uh, poor connections, um, where it was very hard to hear people. We need to invest. This is a reality for us, uh, I think, uh, having to have this remote connection. There needs to be an investment by this parliament. In, in better facilities, better communication facilities, so that we can hold more seamless um, uh, teleconferences and the like um, with people outside the state. Um, and uh, you know, related to that, a bit was an IT support again. I'm, I've no, uh, in fact, I only have praise for the staff we have, but clearly they are under pressure trying to provide those uh, those services. Look, along with that, I'll recognise Hansard. Um, especially with those remote communications, extremely difficult sometimes for Hansard to hear. And again, Hansard, as they always do, um, did an outstanding job and I'm extremely grateful for what they uh, put into uh, making this uh, a successful exercise and recording faithfully um, what was said. Look, um, there were two messages I got out of this and, and, and going over a little bit of old ground, but you know, the, the first message um, and I, I think, and it's the, you know, one of the themes in the report, the, 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 the critical message for this, um, we recognise the opportunity in India. It can't be realised unless we maintain a really strong long-term relationship. This is a, an investment this state is going to have to make um, because the opportunities in the future are immense, but it will not happen. It will not happen unless we invest and invest and invest. And, and it's one of these areas where you're not going to get the quick reward. It's not going to be someone standing there with the fluoro vest and the hard hat you know, within 12 months' time. Uh, but if we don't make that investment, there are plenty of other people in the world. We're not unique in recognising this opportunity. There are plenty of other people in the world that want to avail themselves of this opportunity. Plenty of other countries that have the resources and services that we have that could do this. So, um, you know, strongly, uh, you know, get that, that message. And, and as, as was indicated, uh, we, in terms of international trade, typically it's bipartisan, certainly very strong bipartisan support for that. We, we need to make sure that we make this investment, that, that ministers are going, our old champion, you'll never ever hear me in this place criticise ministers for travelling uh, overseas per se, but in particular travelling to India to establish those relationships. Us making an investment in offices there 
Um, as part of that, recognising that as one state it's perhaps hard for us to do it, so working not competitively but cooperatively with the other states in that, it's a big pie and we're not going to realise it if we simply try and go it alone. And again, that was one of the themes that came out in the report, and that is cooperating um, uh, with our, with our uh, sister states uh, and the Commonwealth Government very strongly to make sure we maximise our net benefit. Um, the other message which has already been delivered is that India is not China. And if you look at the history of our, our large-scale trading relationship around iron ore and natural gas, um, it was Japan. Uh, Western Australia was pivotal to the reconstruction of the Japanese economy after the Second World War. The iron ore exports from, uh, from Western Australia and the coking coal exports from Queensland and New South Wales reconstructed the Jap were, were critical to the reconstruction of the Japanese economy. Uh, that was also South Korea, and then you had the relationship with Taiwan. And China then came to us because they had exactly the same needs, what is patently clear in this report. Uh, and, and in the, uh, the presentations that we received, um, is that they don't need those large-scale commodities, and certainly not yet. You know, one of the really stark examples that came out of uh, came out of the uh, evidence we received for me was in India, there they won't buy natural gas delivered for more than two dollars a gigajoule, delivered, and they're getting that out of Qatar. And can I tell you, Qatar dwarfs Australia's natural gas. Um, potential. Uh, and uh, if you look at the North West Shelf um, uh, and the operations there, typically they're probably around $4 or more per gigajoule on FOB for the ships before it sails. Um, so it's going to be some time before we're competitive in that space. Now we're told that that market will grow and there will be a need for it, um, but that was certainly a wake up call for me in terms of the potential competitiveness of our LNG versus their potential elsewhere, and because they've got their own iron ore, they've got their own bauxite, uh, and they'll, they'll use those. So, you know, it, it's going to be in other opportunities. Potentially, potentially those opportunities will grow uh, into the future. But look, I, I, I'm, I'm again, uh, like all members, this is a great committee to be on. Uh, it's really interesting. It's obviously a, an area I'm passionate about. It's one of the reasons I came into parliament, was to see what we could do to create new industries, new businesses, new jobs. Um, and this committee, um, I think, has done some excellent work um, uh, leading up to this, and certainly in this report, I think they, it's really laid out an excellent map for government in how that we can maximise our potential opportunities, uh, both now and in the future, for uh, improving trade with India. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the member for Janicott. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Acting Speaker, I rise today to give a brief uh, uh, statement as a part of the Economic and Industry Standing Committee is inquiry into Western Australia's economic relationship with the Republic of India. And, we've, and it's a very fitting title, uh, and we've called uh, it Turning to India and we're investing in our future. And I, and I want to um, share the chairs, uh, member for Swan Hills, uh, in her remarks, she's perfectly, again, I would use another quote, though, um, that she's quoted as, as the title of this report suggests it is only by investing time, effort and appropriate resources into Western Australia's economic and cultural relationships with India that Western Australia will be in a position to realise the great potential of India for the future benefit for all West Australians. And I must say, um, Chair, you have been an absolute inspiration with your wisdom, your knowledge, your expertise as a chair for this committee uh, over the last four years, and along with the deputy chair, uh, the honourable uh, Terry Redman, um, member for Warren Blackwood, um, my good friend Stephen Price, member for Forest Field, uh, Dr. David Honey, member for Cottesloe, and uh, a fellow member who was with us for most of our inquiries, uh, the honourable Sean Strange, member for Churchlands. Along with the research officers in Suzanne Valletta, uh, David Worth, and obviously um, Francesco, who have been sensational in keeping up with us during these difficult times, uh, especially as the inquiry progressed and we were hit with uh, COVID. I would also like to thank the various participants and stakeholders who have basically provided um, a keen interest uh, in this inquiry, making submissions, taking time to address this committee and the questions which has been critical in providing information on the background 
allowing the committee to put together substantial integrated uh, intel and information on not just our current uh, relationship with India, but the prospects on what it potentially could be uh, a game changer in an emerging market uh, in uh, building future economic relationships uh, between Western Australia and India. And I'm proud, I'm proud to say that, you know, most members in this house know that I have I've been born and brought up in India and I have, uh, you know, I have the heritage and cultural ex expertise and I understand the values and, you know, the culture of that country. I understand the diversity and complexities of that, of that nature with other members have, you know, made in their contributions. But yet, collectively, they are very aspirational and they look forward to the new India as the new growth. And uh, in this time, I have been um, very privileged and honoured to actually uh, share my experience as how I came to this country as a 21-year-old international student from India to further my education experience. And I went to one of the West Australians' most prestigious universities in ECU. And I'm a byproduct as a migrant who came here as an international student to this beautiful state of Western Australia. And I'm blessed, um, I truly am blessed with me and my family here now, uh, you know, living our lives. Um, an extremely lucky life. And I have to say that that quality education that I got here, you know, was my attraction as a migrant to the state. And I'm, I'm proudly here making contributions, not just to better my community and my people, but my state as well. So I've taken a keen interest in this inquiry regarding Western Australia's economic future, and especially looking at India as an emerging market to basically value add to our state's future. And it's the background um, as a migrant living here, understanding uh, the roles and responsibilities as a parliamentarian and what it means for our economy now leading post-COVID-19. And I have to say that um, this inquiry has given us some very important, clear market signals uh, for any successive government of this state uh, to investigate and fully understand future uh, how the geographic importance uh, of this state's um, trade with countries like India, Indonesia, Vietnam and many other countries that are in close proximity to us. So what this inquiry basically has given us is given us a series of 12 chapters, I won't go into it, there's about 124 findings, 37 recommendations, very important recommendations, and I'll leave that to everyone's interest for later reference. And I'd like to share my views on what I feel was my undertakings during this inquiry, and I, again, have to say the collaborative collective approach, the bipartisan approach by my fellow uh, committee members was, was truly a supportive role for me in my journey uh, through this uh, inquiry. And um, looking at the background for Western Australia, I mean, since, and, and comparing to India, since the early 90s, I mean, to this current point where we are and what we intend to look for into the future post 2020, um, it was evidentially very clear to us in the inquiry that India is a a prom promising future. And it wasn't just random suggestion. These are economic pundits uh, that were providing evidence to the committee about this, you know, this intel of information coming through them that indicated quite clearly, uh, you know, Western Australia's past relationships with India, uh, currently the challenges where we stand with them. But um, it also talked about how rapidly India was changing in its international policies uh, around bilateral international trade. And that brings me to a point that for Western Australia, it's very important uh, to understand that, that in economic bilateral relationships, it's almost like the first one gets to choose the chair you sit on, and the one coming in last is left standing. So for Western Australia, I think it's going to be very important to sort of look at the signals, the market signals, and look at how we diversify our economy in uh, regards to those, you know, those growth countries that surround us and then close proximity to us. So the other similarities, which for me, I had to put this in, is between India and Western Australia, they're both young and tremendously potentially, you know, growth countries, and as a state, I mean, as well. Uh, in the bilateral relationship, there's, there's, a, there's a distinct love for cricket as a passion, and everybody knows I'm a tragic cricketer, but not very good at playing it. Uh, I love for beer, and there is, and the, the member for Mount Lawley pointed this out to me, I was writing the speech, and he said to me, he said, do you realize that uh, both the West Australian swan draft and the Indian kingfisher also have their native birds as, as symbols of beer? And I thought, that's phenomenal, I'm going to put that in my speech. So I thank the member for Mount Lawley for his contributions. 
I know it is. And, and culturally, we're both very engaged um, in terms of our understanding of each other. Food, um, you know, in terms of in enhancing these relationships, it's important for us to look at how um, we can collaboratively work um, using the most important aspect of this inquiry is basically the people-to-people. Uh, the people, -to -people. The people, -to people is the most critical stage of building new relationships, and it's recommendation 33 in this report that sums it up perfectly. And I won't go into it, but it sort of covers it, and I, and I truly recommend that that recommendation will be the perfect start to building those strong conduits and relationships um, of how Western Australia could look at this massive, huge market of 1.4 billion people and growing as an economy of uh, you know, consumption and trade and opportunities. So there's a lot of collaborative work to be done. Uh, and you know what? The, the departments that we have here in the state have done a great job in working on recovery plans and opportunities post-COVID. But they need to collaborate between themselves. And I believe JETC plays a very important role in, in how this is going to be orchestrated into the next 10 years. And I believe, and quite optimistically believe, that that is a very high possibility, provided government uh, puts in the resources in understanding that as a state of you know, two and a half million people that literally has been supplying the globe uh, needs for the last two and a half decades in Japan, for Korea, US, for the last two and a half decades. And if you look at the next two and a half decades, things are going to be very different. China is also a very important trading partner. It's showed us how when you engage and understand those importance and have those relationships, not just between government and government, but universities and universities in, in different sectors. You've got industry participation, people to people. These are all important aspects uh, to the future of this state's economic growth and diversity. And value adding emerging markets is a smart way to go. It's a great way to go. Because what we're doing is we're future proofing Western Australia's economy for the next generations to come through. And we know and we've seen it how technology keeps on evolving so quickly and so rapidly. And um, just to sum it up again, I just want to say that in 20 years, um, you know, Western Australian governments have made 18 visits to India, uh, out of which 12 to Mumbai, 17 to India. But interestingly, in the last three years, uh, this government has actually made um, you know, seven visits. And that's astronomical to where we are and where we want to go. So in conclusion, if it's not them, then who? If it's not now, then when? Thank you. Thank you. Member Thornley. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I rise as Chair of the Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care in Western Australia to table our report, Palliative Care in Western Australia Progress Report. And I table the report. Uh, report tabled. It Thank you, Chair, Acting Chair. It has been a privilege to chair this committee into the progress of palliative care in Western Australia. Indeed, a compassionate, caring society must ensure it allows citizens to die with dignity and with minimal pain. In a great many cases, good quality palliative care can provide this. Western Australians should be confident that even in the latter stages of our lives, we can access the highest quality of service and care. The committee spent useful time understanding what palliative care is and what its scope is. We heard evidence of a misconception amongst the general public and health professionals that palliative care is solely for the elderly and imminently dying. Associate Professor Alison Parr, Clinical Lead, Palliative Care, WA Cancer and Palliative Care Network, Department of Health, advised the committee. Palliative care is about supporting people with progressive incurable illness. It's about a multidisciplinary approach. It focuses on quality of life. The prognosis for some of these people that receive palliative care may actually be years. And that is a common misconception. It is not all about end of life. They may still be receiving disease modifying treatments alongside palliative care interventions. For example, chemotherapy or radiotherapy for those with cancer. It is about keeping people as well as possible for as long as possible, despite incurable illness, and it is about keeping them functioning and also supporting psychological well-being and practical support for those people as their illness progresses. That explanation of palliative care by Associate Professor Parr is extremely valuable and needs to be properly understood 
by the whole of our West Australian community. It's only a year ago that we were in this place debating the voluntary assisted dying legislation. A feature of the passage of the legislation through this place was the broader community discussion around end of life. At times it was apparent that many mistakenly felt some form of voluntary assisted dying would be their only end of life option. It is important to note that a guiding principle of the Voluntary Assisted Dying Act 2019 is that a person approaching the end of life should be provided with high quality care and treatment, including palliative care and treatment, to minimise the person's suffering and maximise the person's quality of life. Through this inquiry, I hope we've contributed to advancing community appreciation that palliative care is about maximising a person's quality of life when they have a life-limiting or terminal condition. The professionalism and commitment of those who work in palliative care in a paid and sometimes an unpaid capacity does our society great credit. For many of the witnesses to the inquiry, their professional lives involve helping people going through the final stages of their lives. No doubt this can be emotionally draining, but I was struck by the impressive blend of professionalism and compassion evident in all our witnesses. And now to some of the findings and recommendations that we made in the, through the, uh, uh, the report process. One of the findings is that we need a system of navigators. Navigators would be a welcome and valuable addition to WA's palliative care services. The president of Palliative Care WA, Dr Eliza Campbell, told the inquiry that within WA Health cancer streams, there is a specialist nurse who helps patients navigate between their different appointments with different specialities and the different services they can access. But she went on, having that one-stop shop for palliative care would be very helpful. I know that I, as a health professional with a high level of health literacy, find it very difficult to navigate all these things. I can only imagine how difficult it is for someone who is very unwell or is caring for a loved one who is very unwell. I think a care navigator service would be really useful in helping to access palliative care services. To the issue of telehealth, and in the era of COVID-19, uh, this was very much to the fore. And uh, I did hear uh, members of the previous committee express some uh, concerns about the use of, um, uh, not telehealth, but um, various um, video linkages and, and uh, what have you. We used Zoom, I think, exclusively and found it excellent and found that most of our witnesses as well were very at ease with this uh, medium. But telehealth as a means of communicating with people who are receiving palliative care is, is something that we looked at. Uh, and found actually, and the witnesses told us, was a useful means of uh, enhancing the service provision that the health sector already is able to provide. And, and there were some words of caution, and especially from Silver Chain, they said that overall we see telehealth or other technologies as an adjunct, but not a replacement of face-to-face -face visits in the provision of community-based palliative care service. One of the big issues that we dealt with was the need to meet need, not just demand for palliative care. And in fact, we've uh, come up with the recommendation that WA Health further refines the methodology for determining the unmet need for palliative care and ensure the measure of unmet need includes a, the number of those accessing palliative care for the first time very late in the trajectory of their illness and therefore not receiving timely referrals. B, general practitioner and primary care data. And C, patients who receive palliative care in the community and did not have any hospital admissions in the year prior to death. This is a very important issue, this need to ensure we understand how big the need is and not just satisfy ourselves with, with meeting demand. In terms of regional, uh, the, the regional communities and how uh, they, uh, their needs are being met, 
the Department of Health, we, we came up with the recommendation that the Department of Health undertake a detailed assessment of demand and or need for palliative care services in regional and remote areas of WA. Uh, in relation to palliative care for Aboriginal people, we determined that palliative care units need to be designed in consultation with local Aboriginal community members and elders. It was very interesting when we were visiting the uh, uh, palliative care unit at the Bustleton Health Campus uh, to hear of a situation where for an Aboriginal person to die in a building uh, that's up raised above the ground, that that's not a natural circumstance at all. And that's uh, something that uh, perhaps could have been considered had uh, the uh, proper design process been gone through and avoided. Uh, but uh, as, as, as I think satisfactory and pleasant as a setting as it can be, uh, that um, uh, health camps is not suitable for all members of our community. Another very important issue was around advanced care planning. And Palliative Care WA encouraged the committee to consider the, the critical importance of ad advanced care planning as an integral part of palliative care. And the Department of Health had advised us that advanced care planning is a voluntary person-led process that outlines a future plan for health and personal care. The process enables the person to describe to family, carers and health professionals the treatment and care that they would want for themselves in the event they are unable to make or communicate decisions. Advanced care planning occurs on a continuum from an advanced care plan recognised in common law to an advanced health directive or an appointment of an enduring power of guardian, which is supported by West Australian legislation. These only come into effect if the person lacks capacity to contribute to decision making at the time a decision is required. Few West Australians have any form of advanced care planning. That was the advice we received from the Department of Health. Another uh, important area is the uh, contribution of volunteers. Palliative care, like so many spheres of our society, benefits from volunteer effort. It was a privilege to meet volunteers, uh, and I mentioned uh, our visit to the Bustleton Hospice Care, and on our visit there, uh, the, the uh, conversation that we had with the volunteers. And we made a finding. Volunteers play a valuable but unqualified role in the provision of palliative care services in Western Australia. We received evidence that volunteers provide essential community connection and a very personalised service to clients. It was stated that if there weren't volunteers, then paid staff levels would have to be increased. We also made a finding that the funding of volunteer services to support, train and guarantee the sustainable involvement of volunteers in the delivery of palliative care in WA remains under-prioritised. To the workforce, the paid workforce, a major issue for any sector is the size of its workforce relative to the task before it. The WA Primary Health Alliance noted that knowledge about end-of-life care and specialist palliative care across the GP workforce is variable and there is significant scope to improve capability. It was noted that some GPs have concerns about the medico-legal implications of palliative care, which the WA Primary Health Alliance noted may potentially be limiting their engagement with education and training. The Royal Australian College of General Practitioners noted that a key issue in, in increasing GP knowledge and capacity in palliative care was the creation of GP registrar positions in palliative care. And that GP registrar positions do currently, currently exist, but in the college's view, they are not enough. And we made a recommendation that the Minister for Health prepare a plan to increase the palliative care workforce and increase the availability of further education in palliative care and general practitioner registrar positions in palliative care. A strong focus of our report was into the implementation of the recommendations of the Joint Select Committee on End of Life Choices. Progress was noted to varying degrees on the implementation of the recommendations of the End of Life Choices Committee, noting that its report was actually tabled in August 2018. And in our inquiry, we as the members of the Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care found that implementation of the following recommendations had significantly progressed. 
Recommendation 7, that the Minister for Health facilitate the establishment of an inpatient specialist palliative care hospice in the northern suburbs of Perth. Recommendation 9, that WA Health conduct an independent review from a patient's perspective of the three models of palliative care in Western Australia. Recommendation 11, WA Health undertake specified measures to improve understanding of palliative care. Recommendation 12, policy development and improved governance structures for the delivery of palliative care by the WA Country Health Service be prioritised. And recommendation 18, that the WA Health provide specific guidelines on the use of terminal sedation by health professionals for patients at the end of life. We found that some progress had been made in relation to recommendation 10, that WA Health implement a process to determine the unmet demand for palliative care and establish an, on an ongoing process to measure the delivery of palliative care services. And recommendations 15 to 17 regarding ongoing professional development for health professionals about end of life treatment and decision making. We found that limited progress had been made in relation to recommendation eight that the Minister for Health ensure that community palliative care providers are adequately funded to provide for growing demand. And, rec and the progress of, uh, and implementation of recommendation 13 of the uh, Joint Select Committee on End of Life Choices, that the Minister for Health ensure regional palliative care be adequately funded to meet demand cannot be evaluated until a more detailed assessment of demand and or need for palliative care services in regional and remote areas has been undertaken. The committee received evidence that the End of Life Choices Committee recommendation 14 that the Minister for Health appoint an independent reviewer to audit palliative care activity and spending by WA Health will not be progressed. And that is in relation to one of our findings uh, around the need for us to um, ensure that the uh, um, processes be around meeting unmet need rather than uh, unmet demand. So that, that uh, is the explanation for, for that one, not uh, advancing further. Um, we, we have made a recommendation that the Department of Health undertake a detailed assessment of demand and or need for palliative care services in regional and remote areas of Western Australia. We've also made a recommendation that the WA Country Health Service and the Department of Health report on the progress of implementation of recommendation 13 of the End of Life Choices report relating to funding for palliative care in regional areas, that this be in their annual reports. Now, as I've said, much of the committee's work was done by Zoom meetings, and this enabled us to take evidence uh, from right across the state. Uh, we heard evidence in person or by video conference from witnesses based in the following regional locations, Albany, Newman, Busselton, Chittering, Northern, Kununurra, Kununurra Derby, Broome, Geraldton, and Kalgoorlie. And as I say, people, I believe, adapted well to uh, this process and uh, indeed uh, seemed quite familiar with it. And uh, there were, uh, uh, to my recollection, virtually no technical hitches with um, the um, uh, process. Very rare were the occasions that we uh, were waiting for a connection to be established. And I only recall once when there was an unfortunate cut off midway through a conversation and, and I think we did have to terminate our uh, hearing um, uh, uh, a little bit uh, quicker than we'd have liked. But overall, it does seem that um, the uh, capacity for our community to work with uh, various video conferencing uh, options works well and is working well. And um, now to um, some uh, very important uh, thank yous, um, especially to all the witnesses who generously gave their time to improve palliative care in WA. Uh, as I said earlier, their, their professionalism and their compassion uh, shone through at all times. And their uh, desire to invest time with us, helping us provide recommendations, make findings so that we can continue to improve palliative care in Western Australia, that absolutely stood out. Uh, a big thank you to my chair, deputy chair, deputy chair, the Honourable Nick Goran, uh, Honourable Alison Zayman, Honourable Kyle McGinn, and to my fellow Legislative Assembly colleagues, Shane Love, the member for Moore, and Zach Kirkup, the member for Dawesville. Uh, my uh, sincere thanks to your efforts in uh, putting this uh, inquiry together 
in a fairly compacted time frame, and uh, that was something that we did have to deal with throughout the inquiry. Um, and especially my thanks to the uh, uh, wonderful advisory officer, Kimberly Old, who did an outstanding job. Uh, she was assisted by advisory officer, Andrew Hawkes, and our ever IT savvy committee clerk, David Graham. Uh, I do want to just give a note of caution to readers of the report, especially in relation to the findings and recommendations, that it is rather early to be assessing the delivery of commitments that were made through the voluntary assisted dying legislative process. And it does need to be kept in mind that the proposal to establish a joint select committee into palliative care arose during debate on the voluntary assisted dying bill 2019 in December 2019. So here we are, less than 12 months, tabling a, a report after an, a fairly extensive inquiry. It is early and it must be appreciated the primary delivery agent, the WA Government's Department of Health, has been rightly focused on keeping our state safe through the COVID-19 pandemic. There does remain much work to be done to further improve palliative care in WA. I hope the work contained in this report will assist in making those improvements. Thank you. Member for more. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I'd just like to make a brief contribution. Uh, as a uh, member of the uh, Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care in Western Australia, uh, and start by thanking the, uh, the Chair, uh, Chris Tallentire, Member for Thornley, uh, Zach Kirkup, uh, Member for Dawesville, uh, the Upper House Members, Kyle McGinn, Alison Zamon, and the Deputy Chair, Nick Garan. It's the first time I've uh, been involved in a Joint Select Committee. Uh, of any sort, and the first time that I've been involved in a committee operating under the Legislative Council's standing orders. And it was quite a learning experience to find that process can take up so much time of a process. Uh, but um, they are very diligent and do their work very well. And I think uh, seeing the Upper House members uh, in action and the uh, forensic ability that they have uh, developed over the years of that House of Review, that you can see just how important the functions of the Legislative Council actually are. To this, uh, to this place in working through the nitty gritty of, uh, of detail uh, and, uh, and making sure that uh, parliamentary processes are, are kept to. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the witnesses and participants. Uh, we had some uh, hosts down in, uh, in Bustleton as well when we did a brief visit down there. So I'd like to, uh, to thank the members of the Bustleton Hospice Incorporated for, uh, for their uh, hospitality at the, uh, at the centre there. Um, and an explanation of, uh, of the important work that they do as volunteers in an in a environment where they're working uh, largely on a, a WAX campus and a Bustleton Health campus, which um, I think many people don't appreciate that the, many of the, the Bustleton Hospice people are actually volunteers and the work that they do um, has relied on uh, donations from the community over the years. And now the community in Bustleton feels that they're um, they're funded by the government, so they don't have to, to contribute. In fact, they're not. They're still volunteers and there's still a need for, uh, for some help in there. And it's one of the things that the committee um, did find was that uh, um, the work of, of volunteers need to be recognised. And I think we found also that uh, in country areas, um, there's a tremendous um, difference um, between uh, those areas where you have established services, mainly in the south, in places like Bustleton, like Bunbury, uh, like Albany, um, you'll find that there are mature organisations, uh, a mature level of services um, to provide that very important palliative care um, to, um, to the community. Um, and as you go further away from that, uh, it becomes more difficult. And it was quite noticeable, I think, that in the report it was noted that the Pilbara, for instance, has very little services available in the way of palliative care, and we couldn't really get to the bottom of why that was, other than there appeared to be some general lack of services in that area. And then you go to the Kimberley, where there's a, a high degree of uh, Aboriginality. Uh, there's a, um, a great diversity in, uh, in the level of service that's available in different communities between the Brooms and the, and the more remote places. Um, we found that some of those places actually source a lot of advice and service from Darwin. Uh, and from the Territory. And we forget, I think, in our isolated existence in Perth, that there are communities in this state that actually are border communities that actually do um, move to other places to get some of their services, and the Kimberley one of those places. 
Uh, and so they've been particularly hard hit um, throughout the, um, the current pandemic, for instance, where uh, it's been difficult for some of those patients to get access to the tertiary hospitals in, in Darwin. Instead, they've had to come to Perth. Uh, and, uh, and the extra distance and the extra time has meant uh, a lot of uh, disruption. And uh, the, um, the other matter was that uh, many different Aboriginal uh, communities have different cultural beliefs and practices. It's not one standard Aboriginal point of view. And so um, trying to, to work out whether a person wants to uh, spend the last of their days on country or in a facility away from the country will depend on, on the particular community they come from and obviously the, the patient's own wishes um, outside of that. So there is a tremendous degree of, uh, of um, complexity in some of those areas in delivering uh, high quality palliative care. In, um, in this uh, report that, uh, that we have um, uh, delivered today, uh, I think the, uh, the relevant sections that uh, really, from a regional point of view, um, piqued my interest were the, the areas around the terms of reference C and D, the delivery of palliative care into regional remote areas, and D, the progress on ensuring greater equity of access to palliative care services between metropolitan and regional areas. So I've spoken a little bit about some of those difficulties of delivery uh, into the regional remote areas. Um, one other matter I'd like to um, highlight too has been raised as an issue in the past in my own electorate is the difficulty when, uh, when someone is uh, in a need uh, as a palliative uh, care um, or in a palliative state, um, the way they need care and help in the home if they want to stay in the home. Uh, there used to be systems throughout the state uh, where there was um, a hack service, home and community care service located in a, in a hospital uh, or a nearby community where care could be sought for people in that situation quite seamlessly. With the development of the NDIS and with the change to consumer directed care, if you like, in the aged care sector, um, there is an assessment process and a criteria which sometimes people with, uh, with palliative um, conditions will fall through and they won't be able to get that home care that uh, they desperately need. So one of, the, one of the, the most important portions of expenditure that we examined was the, uh, the allocation of money to the West Australian Country Health Service to provide that domiciliary home care. Uh, and that's very, very important. It's been very well received. Uh, I think if you read the, the relevant areas of this report, um, it's a, it's a very good, uh, gives you a very good understanding of just how important that is to people uh, and how um, at the very most vulnerable uh, moments um, they have been let down in the past by that service not being available uh, and now it is. Um, it's only an allocation of $2 million. I'm sure it'll go um, very quickly and we need to ensure that that money keeps on being reallocated in future budgets because that need won't diminish. You might be able to say, well, here we've built a, a centre, we've, we've expended capital, that tick that, we don't have to spend that again. But this is a service, it's a vitally needed service, and it needs to continue. Because the provision of palliative care um, in regional areas, it's quite clear um, that you don't have to be that remote from Perth to be remote from service. And that was highlighted uh, I think it's evidenced by the Chittering Health Advisory Group from my own electorate, and also in evidence from the West Australian Country Health Service Wheatbelt Palliative Care Service, when they highlighted you know, the, the time taken to travel to, uh, to coastal locations, uh, for instance, from Northam, uh, a three hour trip just to go there, uh, and a three hour return. So six hours of the, of the day spent travelling, that doesn't leave a lot of time to actually deliver the service. And so there are a lot of um, people who who actually are not and have not been receiving high quality palliative care in the past, uh, who are just on the outskirts of Perth in my electorate, and I've had those people, their families come to me. Uh, some of the stories have been quite harrowing. Um, and it's good to see um, that there is now a focus uh, on providing service wherever people are, uh, are situated. Uh, as I say, that home care service is very important, but also is the flexi uh, very important is the flexible delivery uh, through telehealth of a lot of health services uh, and incorporating that into palliative care has been very important and that's important work that needs to continue. Um, this is only a progress report. 
It's the final report of this committee, but it is a progress report. Uh, and, uh, and it needs to be uh, the monitoring of this, uh, of this progress needs to continue. Uh, we need to ensure that um, the, the allocations that were made as a result of the end of life choices um, discussion are not a once off. We need to ensure that palliative care continues to be funded into the future appropriately because the service won't be uh, diminished, uh, the need won't diminish into the future. I'd just like to quickly uh, round off by thanking the committee staff. Um, the chair's already uh, done that, but um, uh, I, I learnt uh, quite a bit being on this committee uh, and uh, greatly appreciate the, uh, the efforts of all the staff as well. Thank you very much. Member for Dawesville. To uh, speak to the Twin Select Committee report on palliative care in Western Australia and um, uh, reflect on some of the remarks made by both the chair uh, and the member for. Uh, more, the report before us is absolutely a, a progress report and understandably so because the requirement for this uh, joint, se joint select committee uh, to be established was largely formed uh, as a result of um, debate during the passage of the voluntary assisted dying legislation. The um, report to me I think is, is a good one and I think it does reflect the fact that we, the state of Western Australia is largely in early stages when it comes to the provision of palliative care. Uh, the obvious need to make sure that we pay much more attention to the issues of palliative care came about as a result of some of the conversations and those debates that we did have during uh, the voluntary assisted dying debate uh, where people made it very clear that we wanted to make sure there was a, a very well resourced option for people to pursue at the end of their life when it comes to palliation. And I think what we have done here as part of the 56 findings and 25 recommendations is make sure that as part of the government's ongoing progress the Department of Health's ongoing progress uh, with implementing a, uh, an enhanced uh, and more, uh, I suppose, uh, invested in palliative care service that there is a bit more of a uh, structure about how that investment is pursued and where these services are better rolled out. Uh, what we found, I think, is that in some areas of Western Australia we are still very far off when it comes to the adequacy of palliative care services. Uh, in some of the um, public hearings that we held, one area that uh, stood out was basically nearly all of South Metro Perth is inconsistently applied when it comes to some of the palliative care services compared to the North Metro Perth. Uh, in the area of Peel and Rockingham districts in particular, um, there is a massive, uh, I suppose, shortfall of, of appropriate uh, palliative care services, particularly in an inpatient environment in hospitals. Uh, and then as the member for uh, more rightly points out, the further you get away from Perth in most circumstances, uh, the more uh, desperate the situation becomes when it comes to palliative care. There are pockets of investment that has uh, been out, already rolled out by this government. Again, that was largely came about during commitments that were made ahead of the voluntary assisted dying debate, and they are welcome commitments. There's just the need to make sure there's, uh, I think, better, at, better uh, and more ac accurate, uh, sorry, adequate uh, funding that is equitable no matter where people find themselves live in. I don't think it's appropriate that in, if you live in a particular district in Western Australia, for example, uh, you have better, electoral district that is, you have better access to palliative care because of uh, commitments made by the government during the VAD debate. And then if you live in other electoral districts, there's a uh, massive shortfall. And that's the situation that we do, I think we do find ourselves in Western Australia. It just means that more work needs to be done uh, to make sure there is better investment. Very briefly, the areas that I'm, uh, members have spoken about the areas of the report that they are particularly interested in. Uh, the ones from, the areas for me that I found were of most interest uh, were in particular the recommendations or findings and recommendations in relation to palliative care services in, age, in an aged care setting. I think they are increasingly important, um, particularly though, particularly as we expect that people will age in place for longer and they become more attached to where that they live and we want to make sure that the end of life for a palliative care setting, if that's what residents might choose in those areas, uh, can be better delivered. Uh, there's a, in those aged care settings, we know that there is uh, not perhaps as much uh, investment in those services that would otherwise be required and certainly where we see uh, perhaps demand um, into the future. Uh, another area is indeed regional and remote uh, and uh, palliative care services. Members have already spoken about that. And one that was of particular uh, interest and passion of mine was the services for uh, the Aboriginal community and Aboriginal people. And there are, I'm very proud of the committee's 
attention to that area in particular. We've made a number of, uh, an area, it is an area with a number of findings and recommendations that are attached to that to make sure that there can be better investment in uh, palliative care services for Aboriginal people. It was one of the er issues that I raised during uh, my own contribution in relation to the voluntary assisted dying uh, debate, an area that was a particular interest of mine uh, to make sure that we can see a greater level of investment in a, in a much more culturally appropriate sense. I'm reminded of a visit that we made, uh, acting speaker, to the Bustleton Hospice, and uh, one of the uh, volunteers there uh, spoke to us about an, an Aboriginal elder who um, decided to, that he wanted to spend the rest of his remaining days uh, under the, one of the, I think it was a peppermint tree, remember? Peppermint tree? Uh, just near the beach in Bustleton as part, part of the hospice grounds. And that, to me, was a really nice uh, and endearing option that is available in the old um, palliative care services that were offered in Bustleton. When you contrast that now with a really good investment that has been delivered by the Bustleton uh, Hospital, uh, but it is on a second floor in a confined space with a bit of a balcony that overlooks a car park. Now, whilst it was very, I think, a, rel a relatively relaxing environment, it didn't same, certainly have the same uh, natural aspect to it that in, in the case of some of our Aboriginal people, clearly elders in that area, uh, would have opted to pursue when it comes to their end of life. And I think that's just something that we need to keep in mind. I, I, felt, I, I felt a sense of... I almost honour that we were even just imparted, imparted with that knowledge, that we were told about that scenario and that, that situation, because I think that's what we should try and pursue as much as possible for those, particularly in the Aboriginal community, who, if they've spent much of the time out on the lands, for example, they shouldn't have to find themselves, I don't think, in a clinical setting, as much as, much as they can avoid that in a clinical setting, um, but still a safe and supportive surrounding for the time when it comes for their passing, if they, if they choose that. And I think the idea of what the Bustard and Hospice had delivered through largely, as I think it was the chair said, and indeed a member for more in a voluntary um, situation that was largely one run by volunteers, it was a really beautiful setting to me. Uh, and I would like to see more of that if we can for our Aboriginal community, particularly those in, not in the metropolitan area. Uh, but the report speaks to that and reports, re, the report speaks to the importance of that, uh, in, in, uh, I guess, aspect of ensuring that we can provide culturally appropriate palliative care. I think it's really important. And it's one that I would, um, for my time here, if I have the uh, uh, privilege to serve in, my, in the 41st parliament, it would be an area that I'll continue to pay attention to, as I'm sure all members uh, will. We all know the importance of making sure we can continue to deliver as much as we can in what are already very difficult scenarios for the health and wellbeing of our Aboriginal community in Western Australia. Uh, otherwise, uh, Speaker, I'd like to, this was similarly, this is the first joint select committee that I've participated in. It's the first committee that I've been, uh, that I've participated in under the Standing orders of the Legislative Council. I thought there would be a bit more, um, I don't know, uh, I thought that there might be better food or something like that, that there might be a bit more investment from the uh, a committee that was uh, under the same orders of the Legislative Council. They are similarly frugal as a Legislative Assembly, in my experience. Uh, the, well, perhaps, that, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps they don't want us to see behind the curtain, Minister. You don't get to go to that's right, that's right. <laughs> That's why all the Legislative Council members were filing in and out. No, um, the, uh, and as part of that, I would like to recognise the Honourable uh, Colm again, uh, Honourable Alison Zamon and uh, Honourable Nick Goran as the Deputy Chair, who I greatly appreciated their ongoing interest and the diversity of their views uh, that helped inform what I think is a really good report. And ultimately, that's, there, is a, there is a sense of uh, richness, I think, in the information that is provided in here, because we have so many different perspectives. Uh, from a regional perspective with um, a number of members, uh, from those who are older, those who are younger, uh, those who have had varying positions when it comes to the voluntary assisted dying debate. I think it makes for a much more enriched report that we've been able to offer to this Legislative Assembly. And ultimately, as members have touched on, we must keep in mind this is a progress report in probably the very early stages of what we hope to be an increased level of investment and attention paid to palliative care, because I appreciate now uh, there's much more awareness from a parliamentary sense, from a sense of the government and perhaps across our community into the quality of life at the end of someone's life. And I think this is a very good report that can help guide our journey to make all Western Australians' uh, options at the end of their life that much richer for the time that they are on this earth. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Um, Member for Girawen. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. I present for tabling the 17th report of the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission entitled Meaningful Reform Overdue the Corruption and Crime uh, Misconduct Act of 2003. 
Report table. Thank you. Madam Acting Speaker, it seems apt at the conclusion of the 40th Parliament to table a report which will provide guidance and an overview for the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission uh, of the 41st Parliament. In the 17th report of the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission, unambiguously entitled Meaningful Reform Overdue, uh, you will find a compilation of matters either deficient, obsolete or unclear in the Corruption, Crime and Misconduct Act of 2003. These were identified by stakeholders, uh, the Parliamentary Inspector on the Corruption and Crime Commission, uh, the Committee of the 39th Parliament, <coughs> the current committee, or the uh, C itself. There is a growing consensus that tinkering with incremental and piecemeal changes to the existing Act is no longer satisfactory. It's time for a replacement Act which clarifies ambiguity and which resolves aspects of the existing laws which have proved unworkable or ineffectual. It should be noted that the committee does not express any opinion on the appropriateness or otherwise of recommended changes. That is a matter for government policy to address. We would, however, say that given that the last statutory review occurred in 2008 by Gail Archer SC, that it is timely, if not overdue, to address the issues set out in this report. Optimally, there should be a total overhaul of the legislative regime by the introduction of a new Act. Without much needed change, the seamless operation of the peak anti-corruption body in the state cannot be achieved. For example, as the legislative scheme now operates, serious misconduct is dealt with by the Corruption and Crime Commission. The Public Sector Commission, on the other hand, addresses allegations of minor misconduct. On its face, that appears to be a straightforward demarcation. In some cases, however, uh, in some cases, whether the Triple C or the Public Sector Commission handle an allegation is a matter of negotiation and triage between the two agencies. How evidence the committee heard less than a month ago, it seems as if the threshold has been lowered by the Triple C and is now prepared to look at, at, at some cases which previously it would have defined as minor misconduct and consigned to the Public Sector Commission. It is not clear why this has occurred. Whilst this might seem to be a pedantic quib quibble, it illustrates that legislative definitions are fluid and require attention. Likewise, in a recent committee report, we queried why it was that so few allegations of excessive use of force by police were investigated by the Triple C. That report reminds us that the rationale for establishing the Triple C in the first place arose out of the Kennedy Royal Commission into Police. Unlike other jurisdictions, in WA the Triple C is charged with investigating both public sector corruption and the oversight of police in order to maintain police integrity and as a corollary of this to give the public confidence in our police. As we found in our report, there is little appetite on the part of the Triple C to look at allegations of excessive use of force even where police internal investigation processes have failed or be uh, demonstrably deficient. It may well be that police internal investigations are now sufficiently professional, thorough and robust uh, for it to take the lead, but that does not change the legislative role allocated to the Triple C. This is a case where, as a matter of practice, the legislative intent is no longer ref reflected in how the Triple C allocates its priority work. Although a matter of government policy, it begs the question as to whether a new Act should reflect this change in priorities. Likewise, the so-called organised crime function to be undertaken in, cons in concert with police is rarely used. The only area which it could be argued touches upon organised crime investigations is the relatively recently conferred power to look at unexplained wealth. Such powers are fundamental to any focus on organised crime and corruption, but the original legislative regime contemplated um, an adjunct for organised crime investigations um, is not in fact used. We've also heard evidence over the 40th Parliament 
of the many technical flaws in the current Act which practically hamper the C from optimally performing its important role. All of this begs the question, what do we want to focus upon in any new legislative regime for the C? The kinds of issues we must address in any new incarnation of the C, or more specifically its legislative framework, are sim similar to those currently facing the federal government. The Common Commonwealth is moving at glacial speed to establish an integrity commission. Earlier this month, it released a mind-boggling 390 pages of draft laws. Under these, the integrity commission will be split into two divisions, one investigating enforcement agencies, the AFP and immigration, and the other looking at public sector and MPs. The first will have power to hold public hearings, but that won't extend uh, to that which investigates politicians. This is a somewhat artificial distinction and is controversial and has left its proponent, no, no doubt grateful for any distraction, uh, Federal Attorney General Christian Porter, asserting ultimately a court should make a, a public determination of guilt or innocence. Others, such as MP, uh, independent MP Helen Hayes, Haynes, who has introduced her own bill, impatient at the lack of progress, proposes that public hearings when in the public interest with ethical safeguards to prevent unfair trashing of rep reputations. Leading ac academic, uh, Professor AJ Brown, in an article in the conversation on the 2nd of November, considers that there are three elements to establishing a successful anti-corruption body, resources, scope and powers. The proposal for the new federal body is that it be allocated $42 million annually. This compares with the $27 million uh, allocated in Western Australia alone for the Triple C. Brown asserts that this $42 million is not enough to fix all the gaps in the federal government's accountability framework, but it is a move in the right direction. Of more concern is the scope of the new body. It will only extend to 20% of the public sector. Law enforcement regulatory bodies like ASIC and ATO will be covered by the existing Australian Commission for Law Enforcement. The powers of the new body will not only be exercised in private, but only where there is a reasonable suspicion of a criminal offence. So while broad powers of phone taps, compelling evidence and search and seizure under warrant are conferred, the grey area of corruption, such as undisclosed conflicts of interest, cannot be examined unless a criminal offence like theft or fraud is already evident. Likewise, the obligation for agency heads to report suspected corruption offences is also limited in the same way, namely there must be a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity at the outset. Even more alarming, according to Professor Brown, is the fate of public sector whistleblowers who approach the Integrity Commission. Not only will they be turned away if there's no actual evidence of a criminal offence, but even the, they even face the risk of prosecution for an unwarranted allegation. We know from Western Australian experience that the role of whistleblowers is vital and they should be not deterred from acting. In, in most, if not all, of the high profile cases in WA, whistleblowers have, uh, of investigations have been initiated um, by virtue of information from whistleblowers. Madam Acting Speaker, it's also argued that the Federal Integrity Commission cannot act on anonymous tip offs, uh, but must only act on referrals from other government agencies. There is also the power conferred for the Attorney General to declare certain information should not be disclosed to the Integrity Commission on broad grounds that it would harm Australia's defence, prejudice relations between Commonwealth and the states, harm national security, interfere with a trial or reveal deliberations or decisions of the Cabinet or one of its committees. This provides generous wriggle room to avoid scrutiny. <coughs> Madam Acting Speaker, it's worth noting that polls have consistently shown that the public overwhelmingly supports a creation of a Federal Integrity Commission. 
A recent Guardian Essential poll shows 81 per cent of the public support the establishment of an anti-corruption watchdog. No doubt these respondents base their views on experience of the good work of state bodies. The underlying question remains, if official corruption exists and is disclosed at a state level, why is it the Commonwealth is so reluctant to concede corruption must also occur at a federal level? I doubt that the public would support the model currently proposed, which I've briefly outlined, and which contains exceptions and exclusions, minimising its scope and transparency. Madam Acting Speaker, I've used the example of the current deliberations in the federal sphere to illustrate that we'd be ill-advised to completely discard the current triple C model and start from scratch. It is a long and torturous process. However, a new act should be drafted which draws on experience, more clearly sets out legislative intent on the way and the way forward and resolves technical issues which hamper efficient and seamless operation of the Commission. From the Committee's perspective, robust parliamentary oversight of operations of the Commission is a given in any new Act. A recent paper uh, published by the Westminster Foundation for Democracy earlier this month, entitled Combating Corruption Capably, sets out five components for the relationship between Parliament and an anti-corruption agency. And these are, first, Parliament's role in establishing the legal framework and mandate of the anti-corruption agency. Second, Parliament's role in the selection, appointment and removal of the leadership of the anti-corruption agency. Third, Parliament's role regarding resources allocated to the anti-corruption agency. Fourth, Parliament's consideration of and follow-up to annual and other reports of the anti-corruption agency. And finally, Parliament's policy and awareness raising cooperation with the anti-corruption agency. Madam Acting Speaker, it goes without saying that any reiteration or redraft of the uh, Corruption, Crime and Misconduct Us Act must incorporate all of those elements. Madam Acting Speaker, throughout the term of Parliament, the Committee has been afforded excellent cooperation and assistance by the Triple C. Our requests for information and background on occasions were comprehensive and may have required diversion of resources. The committee was mindful of this but appreciated the thoroughness and compliance effectively informed our deliberations. I wish the Triple C well in its future endeavours. Uh, the work it does is important. Likewise, the ready assistance from the Office of the Parliamentary Inspector of the Triple C, the Public Sector Commissioner and the Auditor General was valuable. And it goes without saying that I thank members of the committee who diligently and conscientiously wrestled with a wide range of issues. Deputy Chair, the Honourable Jim Chown, MLC, Mr Matthew Hughes, MLA, Member for Kalamunda, and the Honourable Alison Zamon, MLC. We were ably and assiduously supported by committee research officers Vanessa Beckingham, Sylvia Wolfe and Lucy Roberts. Clerk Assistant Liz Kerr was also readily at hand if required and I thank them all. In conclusion, members, I need to remind you that combating corruption goes to the very heart of our democracy and if not eliminated, disproportionately impacts on those most in need of government attention and support. Nowhere is this more cogently expressed by the man of the moment and the then Vice President Joe Biden in 2014, when he said, corruption is a cancer, a cancer that eats away at citizens' faith in democracy, diminishes the instinct for innovation and creativity, already tight national budgets, crowding out important national investments, it wastes the talent of entire generations and it scares away investments and jobs. Member for Kalamunda. Um, the uh, tabled report of the Joint Standing Committee of um, the Corruption and Crime Commission Report 17, Meaningful Reform Overdue, the Corruption, Crime and Misconduct Act, as outlined by the Chair of the Committee, provides a 
useful summation of the observations made over three successive parliaments um, as to why the Act is in much need of review and, if not a complete rewrite, and I would urge all members of the 40th Parliament in anticipation of the 41st Parliament to uh, give it a good read over the summer. Um, members, I would also like to acknowledge the work of the Chair and uh, my fellow committee members, Alison Zaman, the Honourable Alison Zaman and the uh, Honourable Jim Chown, MLC. And I note that uh, the Honourable Jim Chown will not be contesting the election next year, and I wish him all the best in whatever future endeavours he has beyond his career in this Parliament. Um, I've got a, a particular matter that I want to refer to in relation to the uh, deficiencies of the current Act. And in my contribution to the Assembly in May on the matter of the deficiency of the Corruption Crimes Commission Act, I enumerated the revealed shortcomings of the, the Act regarding the appointment of a Commissioner, or in the case of the 40th Parliament, the reappointment of a serving Commissioner. And in the short time that I've got available to me to speak on the report, I want to return to the deficiencies of the Act as they pertain to the reappointment of a serving Commissioner. Um, it became abundantly clear, um, as I brought to the attention of Parliament early in the year, there's no guidance as to the process to be followed in terms of the appointments process. Um, if uh, bipartisan and majority support is not provided by the committee, has happened, what happens then? Well, we know what happened then, because we're in the position that we're in now, where we have yet to appoint um, a commissioner to the position. The, um, it's also clear that the committee or dissenting members are not required to provide reasons for not supporting the recommended candidate. There's no provision in the Act to resolve deadlocks. The Act is silent on the process to follow if the Commissioner seeks reappointment. Um, and because of the unsatisfactory nature of the current process, this matter alone points to the fact that the Act needs to be amended. Um, I, my comments on the deadlock in the Joint Standard Commission of the reappointment of the Honourable John McKechnie became public following the Government's decision to proceed to bring in a bill to amend the 2003 Act to facilitate his reappointment. The fact that that Act has not progressed through Parliament <clears throat> is a matter for the Opposition to um, explain, because in relation to the opportunities provided for the Opposition to negotiate <clears throat> a positive outcome in relation to the amendment to the Bill that was brought before this House, the Opposition has been, able to do, has been unable to do anything about that. The, there is a, um, a deficiency, difference in the Act between the appointment and reappointment of a Commissioner, but procedurally under the Act there is not a difference. <clears throat> I remain steadfastly of the view that in the circumstances of a known candidate who is the incumbent and serving as a Commissioner seeking reappointment, written justification needs to be provided where there is either bipartisan dissent or a failure to achieve bipartisan concurrence. It bothers me, as an elected member of this 40th Parliament to this Assembly, that the Act does not require this, and that the incumbent, who has the right to seek reappointment, has no rights to know why the reappointment is being denied or to challenge those grounds. Where is, members of Parliament, members of the Assembly, the natural justice in that. There's no natural justice at all. If there were an action taken to dismiss a serving commissioner, the Act requires, um, it's quite clear about what has to happen. The matter would be brought before each of the Houses of the Parliament, and the matter aired publicly, transparently. More importantly, the incumbent would have, I trust, the opportunity of a right of reply. My commentary on this matter has always been directed towards what I believe to be the significant deficiency of the operations of the Act in respect of a deadlock. And as I've said, the Act is silent on this matter. The Act should be amended to secure a clear pathway out of a deadlock. That is unfinished business within the 40th Parliament, 
and it needs to be something which is brought to the agenda in the 41st Parliament. And I hope, members, to be a member of this Assembly when that Act comes before us, that Bill comes before us. I again note the comments from the Honourable Nick Garan in the Council regarding ex his experience as Chair of the Joint Standard Committee under the previous Government. I do not believe they were particularly helpful. None of the previous Commissioners served a full term and none, therefore, sought reappointment. I understand that in a previous Parliament, the Joint Standard Committee had agreed not to support the Premier's nominee from the list of three equally suitable qualified, qualified candidates for reasons known to the Committee. But to suggest the, to the Premier that he consider the appointment of one of the other three. This was quite a different set of circumstances than the one that we faced in this Parliament, which recommended the reappointment of an incumbent Commissioner for a second allowable five-year term. A Commissioner who everyone recognises has been the most effective Commissioner of, uh, uh, um, supervising the Corruption and Crime Commission that this State ever has had. I reiterate once again, the remedy lies in the Act being amended to ensure that the situation faced by the Honourable John McKechnie is not faced by any successor, successor commissioners. But these are the facts at the end of the 40th Parliament. Mr McKechnie's term as the head of the Corruption and Crime Commission expired on the 28th of April 2020. Mr McKechnie was the only commissioner to serve a full term and the first to seek reappointment. Mr McKechnie was the outstanding candidate of the three eligible nominees identified by the nominating committee, which was chaired by the Chief Justice of Western Australia, the Honourable Peter Quinlan SC, and a recommendation to that effect was made to the Premier. However, the Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption Crime Commission was unable to concur with that for reasons unknown to this Parliament and un for reasons unknown to the people of Western Australia. That is a condemnation of the ineffectual nature of the opposition to join in at an open invitation to engage with this government to remedy the failings of the Act and to overcome what was a, a palpable misuse of the power of the Joint Standing uh, Corruption and Crime Commission Joint Standing Committee. Members of this House, I will do all that I can to ensure that the public of Western Australia, certainly my electorate, realise what has happened in this place with respect to the reappointment of the Honourable John McKechnie. I will drive that to the election and you will be answerable for your inability to adopt a bipartisan approach in relation, to the, in relation to the invitation offered to you by the Premier of the state to overcome, to overcome a debt log which was a patent misuse of what happened in that Joint Standing Committee. And thank you, Act, um, Acting Chair, for your indulgence. Member for Hillary's. Thank you, um, Acting Speaker. I present for tabling the 10th report of the Community Development and Justice Standing Committee entitled Response to Attorney-General's Request to Conduct an Inquiry. Paper table. Uh, Acting Speaker, with your indulgence, on the 27th of October 2020, the Community Development and Justice Standing Committee received a letter from the Honourable John Quigley, MLA Attorney-General which forms Appendix 2 to the report I just tabled. As reported by several media outlets, the letter regarded Mr Aaron Cockman's request that the Attorney-General direct the State Coroner to hold a public inquest into the death of Mr Cockman's family members on the 11th of May 2018 in Osmington. The Attorney-General advised the committee that he had received advice from the Solicitor-General of Western Australia, Mr Joshua Thompson, SC, that the Attorney-General was unable to make such a direction. The Attorney-General considered that the committee was best placed to conduct a formal inquiry into the matters raised by Mr Cockman and was hopeful that the committee would agree to undertaking an inquiry. 
As the Attorney-General's request was made publicly, the committee thought it appropriate to respond publicly and explain why it is unable to undertake an inquiry at this time. A committee inquiry typically includes the following stages. Scoping and determination of terms of reference, announcing of terms of reference, advertising and calling for submissions, writing to stakeholders, receiving, reviewing and analysing submissions, researching, holding hearings, seeking expert advice, planning and travelling for future hearings or investigations, writing and adopting a report, reporting to the Legislative Assembly and uh, eventually a government response. Depending on the nature of an inquiry, not all stages may be necessary. The length of each stage will vary depending on, for example, the number of submissions received or the number of hearings held, whether and where the committee travels and the length of the report. However, it would not be unreasonable to expect a scoping period of one to two months, a submission period of six to eight weeks, holding hearings over the course of several months, as well as two to three months to write, finalise and adopt the report. Some stages may occur in order. For example, scoping an inquiry should occur before terms of reference are determined, and a government response can only be prepared once the report is tabled. Other stages often overlap and run concurrently, and in some cases, some stages need to be revisited. For example, a committee may hear from a major stakeholder during a scoping stage, at an initial hearing, and at a hearing towards the end of the inquiry to test potential findings and recommendations. In some inquiries, a committee may decide to issue an interim report, as this committee did during its inquiry into the protection of crowded places from terrorism acts, to clarify and define issues under active consideration and seek further submissions from stakeholders. A smaller inquiry with specific and narrow terms of reference and few stakeholders may be able to be reported on within a few months. A larger inquiry with broad terms of reference and many stakeholders can take significantly longer, in some cases several years. At the time of receiving the Attorney-General's letter, the Legislative Assembly had three sitting weeks and the committee only two meetings scheduled for the remainder of the 40th Parliament. A standing committee can continue to meet when the Legislative Assembly is not actually sitting. However, when the, legislative, when the Legislative Assembly is prorogued, a standing committee's activities are suspended, and upon dissolution, a standing committee is terminated. The date of prorogation and dissolution are at the discretion of the Governor upon advice from the Government. However, if not dissolved earlier, the Constitution Act's Amendment Act 1899 provides that the Legislative Assembly will be dissolved on the 31st of January 2021. This set deadline would provide the committee with at most three months to conduct an inquiry. Although terms of reference for the potential inquiry have not been determined, the committee anticipates that it would be a sensitive and significant inquiry into a horrific and tragic event with considerable legal complexities associated with inquiring into the operations of and potentially the law governing the Family Court of Western Australia. Clearly, the committee does not have enough time to tackle such a difficult inquiry in the comprehensive fashion that the situation demands and the Cockman family and other um, families that are affected by this tragedy deserve. In conclusion, although the committee considers an inquiry into these matters to be worthy of further investigation, it is not in a position to undertake the inquiry itself during what remains of this term of parliament. The committee is also not able to bind the activities of a future committee in a future parliament. Therefore, whether the Community Development and Justice Standing Committee of the 30, 41st Parliament decides to consider this matter further is a matter for it once established after the 41st Parliament commences following the March 2021 State General Election. However, in making the letter of the Attorney General public through the tabling of it in this report, the committee is making it available to that future committee for its consideration. And I will add my, my personal uh, comment that, that apart from being chair of the committee, in a personal capacity, I think that the Cockman family and the other families that, that have been affected by this tragedy have a right to demand answers and they deserve an opportunity to at least seek some of those answers. So I hope that in the 41st Parliament that issue can be looked at by a committee, whether it is 
the Community Development and Justice Standing Committee or some other committee to enable uh, those families to, um, to at least, at, at very least, get the opportunity to put their views um, into the public sphere and to demand that the, the answers that they haven't got so far from our system. And, and member for Hillary's. Thank you. I now rise to present the tabling of the 11th report of the Community Development and Justice Standing Committee entitled Hearings Held with Agencies Responsible for COVID-19 Response. And um, with your indulgence, Acting Speaker, on the 11th of March, the human coronavirus known as COVID-19 was declared a worldwide pandemic by the World Health Organization. Shortly afterwards, on the 15th of March, the, the Minister for Emergency Services made a declaration of state of emergency in Western Australia. On the 16th of March, the Minister for Health declared a public health state of emergency. The declaration of a state of emergency, the first since the Emergency Management Act 2005 was enacted, triggered the operation of the State Emergency Coordinator and the establishment of the State Disaster Council. The State Emergency Coordinator, the Commissioner of Police, is responsible for coordinating the emergency response during a state of emergency. Chaired by the Premier and including relevant ministers and the State Emergency Coordinator, the State Disaster Council is the mechanism through which government is kept informed of developments in response to a state of emergency. Various other bodies and officers also manage and participate in the state government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The declaration of state of emergency has been extended approximately every 14 days and still remains in place. Uh, we now have gone um, more than eight months since that initial uh, declaration. During a state of emergency, the state emergency coordinator and other authorised officers are granted emergency powers to make di directions regarding the movement of people, the closure of places and quarantine conditions, amongst other things. In consultation with the chief health officer and various others involved in the state government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the state emergency coordinator has made directions that have affected all Western Australians. Since March 2020, to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, all Western Australians have been subject to restrictions on movement, varying in severity based on evolving health advice over time. Many businesses were forced to close for a short period of time, and thankfully it was a short period of time. People that could began working from home. Uh, at one point, travel between intrastate regions was not allowed unless certain cr criteria for exemption were met and Western Australia's border was closed to everyone subject to specific exemptions. The Community Development and Justice Standing Committee oversees emergency services, community services, police and 18 other portfolio areas. Given this role, the committee thought it important to gain an understanding of how the state's emergency management framework operated, the role of each of the emergency response bodies or officers and their activities, and how lessons being learned during the management of the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic were being captured to be leveraged off in the event of a future state of emergency or in the event that things during the current state of emergency become uh, more urgent and more immediate than they are at this point in time here in Western Australia. Unfortunately, the onset of COVID-19 contributed to the committee extending the duration of an earlier inquiry, leaving insufficient time before the conclusion of the 40th Parliament for the committee to conduct a formal inquiry into how the Western Australian Government was responding and had responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Also very importantly, the committee also recognised the need for lead government agencies to focus on service provision and their response to the rapidly evolving COVID-19 pandemic, whilst ensuring the health and safety of staff and the public. And the committee took a very bipartisan view on this. We wanted our lead agencies to be out there in the field doing the work that needed to be done, uh, rather than being brought into inquiry after inquiry. 
So we're very cognizant of treading lightly in this space whilst our wonderful first responders and emergency services workers across all of the agencies uh, were out there doing the work that they continue to do out in the field. So on the 9th of September, the committee resolved to conduct a series of hearings into the Western Australian Government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The committee decided to invite agencies or officers to discuss aspects of emergency management, including preparedness, response recovery and support for those most affected. These hearings were held in public to enable media atten attendance and the publication of transcripts that then become available to the public. The committee held hearings with the State Emergency Management Committee, which is ably chaired by the Honourable Dr Ron Edwards, uh, hearings with the State Emergency Coordinator, who is the Police Commissioner Chris Dawson and his senior staff, uh, with the State Recovery Controller uh, Sharon O'Neill, who is also the Public Sector Commissioner, and also at that hearing, the acted, Acting Director General and the Deputy Director General of the Department of Premier and Cabinet were in attendance. And we also held a hearing with the State Welfare Coordinator, who is Michelle Andrews, who's also the Director General of the Department of Communities, and a lot of her senior staff. And, and we thank all of those people and the agencies behind those people for making themselves available uh, for those hearings. If the committee had had more time before the end of the 40th Parliament, perhaps we may have embarked on a formal inquiry into the state government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Ideally, such an inquiry would be conducted after the declaration of state of emergency ceases to have effect. Such an inquiry would have allowed the committee to consult more broadly and consider evidence from a range of other stakeholders. It may be that this or another committee of the 41st Parliament decide to embark on a COVID-19 related inquiry. And I think I speak for every Western Australian in hoping that um, the current declaration of state of emergency and the ongoing declarations eventually cease to have effect as sooner rather than later. I think it's an expectation on a global basis, but we'll just have to wait and see what, what happens in the future. The committee would sincerely like to thank the State Emergency Management Committee, the State Emergency Coordinator, the State Recovery Controller and the State Welfare Coordinator for meeting with the committee to discuss their roles and activities during a time of great uncertainty and when they have significant demands on their time, as I, as I outlined earlier. Uh, the committee also extends our thanks to all of the government and non-government workers who have been involved in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic in some cases being separated from family and risking their own health to care for others and ensuring that essential services are maintained and the state continues to function. Of course, we also thank the public of Western Australia. It is really because of the public's compliance with the necessary restrictions on movement and other restrictions that has reduced the spread of COVID and it's saved lives. With no community transmission of COVID-19 since April 2020, our state has been able to ease restrictions and we've removed, uh, we, we've returned to a state of what is near normality. It's a new normal uh, and I think most people have been using that term uh, because it's likely to be with us for a significant period of time and, and we see almost on a weekly basis, we've seen what's happened this week in the neighbouring state of South Australia and we wish them all the best in their endeavours to bring um, the recent outbreak and community spread in, in their state under control as soon as possible. I think our state finds itself in a very strong position to respond to the ongoing risks of the COVID-19 pandemic, including anything that, that resembles what happened in, um, in South Australia over the past few days. But of course, we cannot be complacent. And I think right at this stage, complacency remains our, uh, one of our biggest threats in the COVID-19 uh, space. This report that we have tabled is going to be the last report of this committee in this parliament. It's been a wonderful ride. Um, it was the first opportunity I've had to chair a committee and being a, uh, a non-government member 
of the parliament. Um, I was wondering how it would work and what sort of um, uh, what sort of direction the committee would take and what sort of direction the relationship between the committee and the government would take. Right from the outset, I sought to make this truly a bipartisan committee. I've said in here before that I am true, I'm a true believer in the ability of the parliamentary committee process to affect great work on behalf of Western Australians in a bipartisan manner, to gather evidence and to guide future reforms that benefit our state. And I like to think that we have achieved that in this committee. No small part to all of the members of the committee, the deputy chair, the member for Burns Beach, and the member for Bunbury, who have been with me for the entirety of the journey of the committee. Uh, the two previous members from the Liberal Party, my colleagues, uh, the honourable uh, member for Kareen and the honourable member for Dawesville, um, who uh, were of great assistance, and then they have been more recently replaced by uh, the honourable member for Churchlands and the honourable member for Vass, and they too have contributed in their way to the functioning, functioning of the committee. I hope, as I said, uh, those who hadn't served on a parliamentary committee before um, recognised the value of the process, and, and I, I trust some of them may become strong advocates for a strong and well-resourced parliamentary committee system that works in a bipartisan and multi-party manner to continue to affect good recommendations for good reform in this state. No committee can operate without its staff. It's as simple as that. They make us look good, everyone says that. They work diligently, they work tirelessly. They are a font and a wealth of knowledge. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the staff of the committee, the previous staff, Francesca Walker, Dr Amy Lampard and Marcel Chasson, and, and especially the current staff of the committee, Alison Sharp, Catherine Parsons and Alice Jones, who work, as I said, they work tirelessly, they work so efficiently. They not only produce quality work, but they produce quality work to tight timeframes, sometimes under significant pressure. And um, as members, I think it is important for us to pause and reflect on that and thank them for the contribution that they make. It's not just a contribution to the committee, but it's a contribution made by non-elected members of parliament, just lay people. This is a contribution that they make to bettering the state of Western Australia for all of our citizens. And, um, and I sincerely thank them for the work that they do and wish them very well in their future. Obviously, the support from the clerks, um, clerk committees, Liz Kerr, and all of the staff has been wonderful as well. Um, as I said, I am a passionate believer that one of the great benefits of having a parliament is having a well-resourced and well-functioning parliamentary committee process. Earlier in its term, the committee made a recommendation when we looked into the uh, state election conducted in 2017 in Western Australia that perhaps there could be a joint committee that was tasked specifically with electoral affairs um, and looking at electoral affairs as an issue. I know it's a committee that operates in the federal parliament and in most of the other state parliaments. And I look over at my colleague, uh, the member for Girraween, who was previously a chair of the same committee and has previously made rec that recommendation. I dare say, member for Girraween, you may not necessarily have been the first to make that recommendation oh. either. Uh, and that goes to show, I think... Yes, there you are. And we followed in your footsteps, and we had them again recently, <laughs> and that, that transcript is on the record. Um, I, um, as I said, I hope that the future parliaments continue to resource committees 
in a manner that allows them to do their work properly and efficiently and for the benefit of Western Australians, and that a future parliament <coughs> considers the creation of other very, very appropriate parliamentary committees that can continue to serve parliament and the democracy of Western Australia into the future. And I, I really have welcomed the opportunity to be the chair of this very important committee. Member for Churchlands. Uh, thank you, Acting Speaker. Uh, I'd just like to pick up uh, on some of the remarks made by the uh, member for Hillary, the chair of uh, this fantastic committee, the Community Development and Justice Standing Committee, which did get an opportunity to have a look into the, um, how the state, how the government has been responding and is responsible for the COVID-19 response. The, um, some of the key aspects to what's gone on this year uh, have never been seen before. The declaration of a state of emergency is the, f is the first time that um, the Emergency Management Act of 2005 was, was enacted. And so, for the great part, government has been looking at how it has been managing uh, the COVID-19 pandemic with a piece of legislation that was never used before. So there's always going to be uh, lessons learned, there's always going to be areas for improvement and there's always going to be uh, things that could be done differently. And so that's why it was important for this committee to try and get an opportunity before the 40th parliament rises uh, to actually get some feedback from some of the key players in this space. And that was the State Emergency Coordinator, the State Disaster Council and, um, and of course the State Emergency Coordinator being the Commissioner for Police. How did they go about responding to this emergency? Now, for the people of Western Australia, um, they have, you know, in good faith, uh, followed the directions of the professionals who have been telling them what they need to do. Uh, and so that's been impacting on the movement of people, the closure of places, the quarantining conditions that people have had to abide by. Uh, we know that many businesses have been forced to close. Travel uh, between intrastate regions was not allowed for a period of time, and there's been a hard border in Western Australia uh, subject to specific exemptions. So all of this required, and I, I agree with the, uh, the chair of the committee, that all of this requires um, an opportunity to, to take a bit of a deep uh, parliamentary committee dive to see how it went. And it's unfortunate that we've run out of time in that regard, uh, but I encourage um, maybe the next uh, committee of the Community and Justice Standing Committee to have a look at, that, uh, have a look at this as an opportunity moving forward. Um, with the people that we were able to receive hearings from, the uh, State Emergency Management Committee, which was um, chaired by Dr Ron Edwards, um, for, for me, to listen to Dr Edwards uh, in that hearing showed me that we have a very, very experienced, measured leader who's able to under, who understands government, has a background in, in politics and in government, and was able to genuinely uh, oversee that committee uh, with a fair degree of experience. And so it was good to see the calibre of the leadership uh, with regards to that committee. With the State Emergency Coordinator, we got to hear from the Police Commissioner, Chris Dawson, who has two hats. He's the Police Commissioner on the one hand, State Emergency Coordinator on the other. A very professional police officer with an, an, another um, person with enormous experience that we as, uh, mem as members of parliament and as citizens of Western Australia uh, should be very pleased to know we've got somebody of that calibre in that position. Uh, during the commissioner, when he was giving some evidence to us with, uh, his, in his role as state emergency coordinator, we asked a number of questions in and around how the border uh, management was going, the good to go pass system, uh, quarantining arrangements. And uh, one, a particular area that we were keen to look into was a breakdown of the number of people entering Western Australia on a weekly basis since uh, restrictions commenced and how exemptions to standard quarantining arrangements took place. Uh, we received some information with regards to that. Uh, the Commissioner, as is evidenced in this report table today, um, said that he did not support um, a lot of those responses being made public because he was of the view that it was coming from different areas and could not yet be verified to provide a sufficient level of confidence as to its accuracy for the purposes of statistical reporting. Now, the committee agrees that during the state of emergency, uh, the last thing we want the Western Australian Police Force's efforts to be concentrating on is, is data management. Um, we recognise that it needs to respond to the COVID-19 situation and needs to make sure that its staffing and resources are in the right place at the right time uh, with regards to that. 
Um, however, I agree with the chair that the collation of information uh, post-pandemic would provide a useful summary of the actual activity undertaken during the pandemic response. I think that is important. But I'll go one step further and I'll say this. I believe there is a need for accurate record keeping now and collection of information now, um, including uh, decisions made. And, and I say that because we should always have ongoing review of our systems and processes. We should have ongoing review of data and information. And that is necessary for uh, go ongoing governance um, of the COVID-19 uh, management. It's, it's important uh, for ongoing assessment of lessons learned, including strengths, weaknesses and areas to improve, uh, so that those improvements can occur quickly. Uh, it's also very important for procedural and uh, legislative change down the track. So procedural, possibly now, adjusting to changes and legislative change if needed um, very quickly as well. So it is an important aspect. So I, I would ask that um, the government consider uh, looking very carefully at improving its data management of the, of the uh, information that's coming through on a daily basis. Um, it's also an important aspect of leadership and management so that decisions made and the culture of, uh, of how the organisations are run um, uh, can evolve um, with proper oversight, okay? And data and information is so important to that objective. Um, with regards to the State Welfare Coordinator, it was, it was great to hear um, from Mrs Michelle Andrews in that, in that respect. I was particularly interested in, uh, in how the homeless um, in Western Australia and specifically in the CBD of Perth uh, were being looked after and were being managed with the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, it was of some concern to me that an accurate record or register of, of homeless people was not um, you know, at um, the government's fingertips. I think there should be an accurate register of the homeless people uh, who are moving through the CBD. Now, even where there might be a, a reason given that it's, they don't have any identification or it's not, uh, we don't know who they are by a birth certificate or whatever, you should still be able to, un, um, I suppose for want of a better term, categorise that person, understand that person, understand who they are, where they are, wh what their movements are. And the reason for that are obvious because we need to have a really solid understanding of, of uh, what we've termed and other um, aspects of government, the human terrain. We need to understand the human terrain of the city of Perth, for example, to know the people moving into it and out of it, so that if there was a COVID outbreak in the city of Perth, um, we, we know who the homeless people are, we know where they are, we should be doing more, obviously, to look after them and, and give them appropriate uh, housing or shelter. But in any case, we need to know who they are, where they are, and um, so that we can very quickly respond if there was to be a COVID-19 breakout. Can I, on behalf of um, this side of the chamber and everybody in this chamber, no doubt, uh, thank all of those state emergency management uh, frontline personnel, the health personnel, the police, uh, the defence force personnel, and all the people, the public servants, and all the uh, contractors that are involved in helping to make Western Australia safe and to keep it safe, uh, to follow the directions of the leaders. Uh, thank you so much for your energy and effort to do so to date. We're, we're not through the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic yet, as we have seen with the recent outbreak of the COVID-19 in South Australia. We've still got a way to go, uh, but I uh, thank all of those frontline um, personnel for their efforts to keep us safe. And I also thank the community of Western Australia for doing its bit to follow uh, directions, to follow instructions, and to do the right thing during these difficult times. Finally, um, thanks to the committee. Thanks to our chair, um, the member for Hillary's for his leadership uh, on this committee. It's been, uh, for me, for the year, it's been a fantastic uh, year of committee work, really enjoyable, looking at some difficult problems uh, through the magistrate's court situation around Australia through to dealing with the COVID-19 in this report today. Thank you to the member for Burns Beach, the member for Vass and the member for Bunbury for your collegiate uh, and friendly approach to committee work. It's really been a pleasure. Uh, I wish all of us the best of luck, of course, in the upcoming election in the second Saturday in March. 
And, um, and I know that all of us are very keen to get out in there with our communities and to get re-elected so that we can continue the good committee work that this parliament does for Western Australia. Orders of the day. Government business order of the day number one, appropriation recurrent 2017-18 supplementary bill 2018 and appropriation capital 2017-18 supplementary bill 2018. Cognate debate, second reading, adjourned debate. Member for Bunbury. I rise to continue uh, my contribution to these bills that I commenced yesterday and I would like to reiterate and begin by again thanking the people of Bunbury who elected me to this place. It has been a, a real ple pleasure to represent Bunbury and Alialup over the past three and a half, nearly four years, and um, to realise how much of a difference you can make in this place to the everyday lives of people who go about their business in the community, uh, not only from the point of view of the major projects that we might deliver, but also the legislation and the social reform that can be achieved through legislation as we continue. Um, and I was part of a team that went to the 2017 election with an agenda which was clearly about fixing the state's finances, an ambitious range of legislative reform and programs, particularly in relation to jobs, health, education, public infrastructure, and a clear agenda not to sell Western power. And I also went to the election with a commitment to be accessible and available to the community. And I've thoroughly enjoyed over this period of time all of the mobile offices, the town hall meetings, the Zoom meetings over the last six months, and the events that I've attended, and the individual meetings I've had with constituents. And I've learned from every one of those processes, and uh, I think it makes me a better person to have had that experience. And I was also part of a very strong Labour team in the South West, um, with Mick Murray, with a wealth of experience, and Robin Clark. Uh, and Mick, of course, is about to leave us, uh, but uh, hopefully will be replaced by an outstanding candidate in Jody Hands, representing the seat of Collie Preston. And it will be great to have another strong and talented woman in this place. Um, you would recall back in, uh, at the time of the March election, we were faced with some real challenges, not the least of which was issues around revenue and the GST, controlling expenses, uh, and managing uh, a, a transition to a fiscal discipline that could take the state forward. Um, that was very important for my region because Bunbury sits at the um, top of a, a regional economy that's worth around $15 billion in gross state product annually and has grown each year. And it makes a terrific contribution in terms of the diversity of its economic base whether that's in mineral processing, mining, tourism, hospitality, agriculture, small business. It is an incredibly vibrant region and the electorate of Bunbury is incredibly vibrant as part of that. The plan for Bunbury that we went to the election with set out an agenda for the future growth of the city. And it was really looking at taking forward a process that had started back in the mid 80s with the Labour government about what the future of Bunbury should be as a second um, uh, capital of Western Australia. And we had an agenda that looked at transport, and um, I'm very pleased to see things like the Outer Ring Road about to commence after many, many years of planning, and the duelling of the Bustle Highway. And I think both of those projects will really put a backbone into the future road infrastructure for the Southwest as a whole, and cater for both its passenger and its freight needs well into the future. Very important projects. And I'm very pleased that we are replacing the Australind. The Australind was a, a train built in Bassendine, built by Western Australians, and the replacement trains, not just train, will be built in Western Australia, built by Western Australians. And uh, I think it's a, a bit of a wait to get to it, but it is gonna be well worth the wait because it has a purpose-built train for an intercity journey between Bunbury and Perth. And uh, that particular piece of work is accompanied by a lot of work around how we can improve the journey times and how we can improve the experience of the journey. So I do think that that is a, a great step forward. And in health, we've had the construction of the Step Up, Step Down facility, um, the commitments to expand our hospital, and to really look at its role as a, future, as a teaching hospital in terms of regional and remote area medicine. 
Uh, and I think that the, uh, the impacts of things like improvements to the emergency department, mental health, theatre space, uh, general medical, car parks, which is a major issue, we'll be seeing those works commence very, very shortly. And the Step Up, Step Down facility has been an amazing contribution in terms of the needs of people who may be about to experience an acute mental health uh, experience or maybe transitioning back out of hospital into the community. The transformation of the Bunbury waterfront has been absolutely outstanding, not only in terms of reconnecting Bunbury to its waterfront, but also in terms of how people view our city and how locals view our city and the connection they have, both from the CBD to the waterfront, which at the end of the day, Bunbury is a peninsula city, and how to engage in that and improve the quality of life for all locals. Education. Uh, worked very closely with Ian Harvey to see South Bunbury Primary School get its new pre-primary and uh, grade one classrooms. And what a delight it was to accompany the Premier to see the kids in, and the teachers enjoying those new spaces. And the same with Newton Moore, where we've embraced the step up step, uh, these STEM agenda with science, technology, engineering and maths with a new facility that will take Newton Moore forward. And of course, Bunbury Senior High School getting new facilities, particularly around the canteen after um, I think about 1940 or so that the canteen was last um, addressed. Sport and recreation, uh, the fantastic contribution that the Minister for Sport made in terms of finally resolving the open drainage ditch uh, in front of the Bunbury United Soccer Club. And I commend uh, local resident Marina Quain for her work in that area. Uh, Dal Yallop, uh, the Dal Yallop Surf Club, again, a community organisation that had lived out of uh, sea containers and we've been able to support them in uh, obtaining new facilities to store all of their equipment. And uh, the Forest Park facility with new cricket nets, uh, a great contribution on the sporting agenda. And then, of course, we've got the private sector with Albemarle, who've made a significant investment in the Bunbury area, driving the jobs agenda that we hold so important on this side of the house. The plan is either delivered all actions, they're either completed, under contract, or they're funded. So I'm very pleased to be part of a government that does exactly what it says it's going to do, and that rolls up its sleeves and gets into it. Now, I do want to acknowledge that... Um, um, sorry, our... Member, this business is interrupted and adjourned until a later day of this day's sitting. Member's statements. Member for Hillary's. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I am so glad to stand up today and confirm that strong advocacy by a local member and a local community can get real results. Finally, the State Government has listened to the people of Hillary's and has answered our call for a new school to replace the tired old buildings at Hillary's Primary School. This school has been ignored for far too long. When I became the member for Hillary's in 2017, I called for the rebuilding of local schools like Hillary's Primary that were old, tired and well past their use-by date. Hillary's Primary School is the largest primary school in my electorate. With almost 600 students, it is facing growth pressures and is bursting at the seams, as well as coping with dilapidated and unsafe buildings. It took some time for the government to listen. Even after a ceiling at the school collapsed and fell on three students in September this year, no money was found in the October state budget to rebuild the school. But the amazing school community and the people of Hillary's would not take no for an answer. Hundreds of people signed my petition to rebuild the school and backed my calls for the government to listen. The people of Hillary's are grateful that there is now bipartisan support to rebuild the school so that local students and teachers can enjoy the modern state-of-the-art facilities they need and deserve by the start of the 2023 school year. There is so much more that needs to be done in my area. Old schools like Springfield Primary School also need to be rebuilt. I assure all residents in the electorate of Hillary's that I will continue to fight for the needs of our local community because our locals deserve to be treated with the respect that every other Western Australian gets. Member for Rowe. Today I take this opportunity to acknowledge the achievements of the CEO of the Great Southern Development Commission, Mr Bruce Manning, and celebrate his contributions to regional development. Based in Albany, Bruce was appointed a CEO of GSDC in 2000 and is an ex-officio member of the board for 20 years. Bruce has upheld the guiding principles of the GSDC, has led with integrity, built lasting partnerships and maintained a strong regional focus. Bruce came to the role of CEO with an extensive background in regional development, natural resource management, business and strategic development, marketing, tourism and risk management experience and a passion for the environment. 
This year marks 20 years of Bruce's role as CEO and I would like to thank him for his contribution to regional development and for striving to promote the economic and social growth of the Great Southern Region. I had the honour of working closely with Bruce when I was GSDC Chairman between 2009 and 2016 and had the pleasure of working with him on many great projects, including UWA, Albany Centre, Albany Entertainment Centre, Centre of Excellence in NRM, Super Towns Program, New Katanning Sale Yards, Yonganau Mallee Fowl Centre and Codger Place in Kojanup. I always knew Bruce was on the case with his early morning phone calls and his advocacy for the whole of the Great Southern Region, from Woodnilling through to Jeremungup and Denmark. Bruce is a regional champion. <coughs> Member for Cottesloe. Thank you very much. This uh, is an important matter that I've previously written to both the Minister for Child Protection and the Minister for Lands about, and I take the opportunity to raise the matter again. The Australia Red Cross has made the decision to cease operating the Lady Lawley Cottage in Cottesloe as a respite care centre for children with special support needs. It will be a great shame for families with special needs children to no longer to be able to obtain respite care at Lady Lawley Cottage. There are hundreds of families who have used the facility, and it's very clear from the many that I've spoken to that no other provider delivers completely duplicate services. Lady Lordy Cottage provides intimate and high-quality care in an ideal physical environment. The close proximity of the beach provides unique recreation opportunities for the children staying there. Lady Lordy Cottage enjoys very strong support from the local community. Everyone in the Cottesloe sees the cottage and especially the children as important members of our community. I've spoken before when discussing changes to the strata title laws about the importance of the comfort and security that comes from living and being in a place that you know well. The availability of quality and familiar respite care is as critical for the mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters and extended families of the affected children. The availability of quality respite care gives them the freedom to enjoy a break in their own homes. Equally, the availability of quality respite care at Lady Lord Cottage is important for the very gradual adjustment to future care arrangements for special needs children once their parents or grandparents are no longer able to support them. I know it's a complex issue, but I strongly urge the government to continue Lady Lawley Cottage. Member for Belmont. Today I rise to acknowledge the tireless efforts of my staff. To Marina Mawana Ward and Helen Laddams, who work for me in my capacity as a State Parliamentary Labor Party Caucus Secretary, thank you for your constant support and hard work. M, your knowledge is second to none, and Helen, your work ethic is nothing short of outstanding. You always go over and above. Emily Doherty in my, Doherty in my electorate office, I truly love working with you. You are such a calm head, quiet and clever, brilliantly organised, thoroughly compassionate and so hard working. And I I so look forward to you coming back from maternity leave in your own time. Big love to the beautiful little Lucia. Ryan Hart, I feel so lucky to have someone so capable in my corner. You are incredibly intelligent, unquestionably and 100% dedicated and seem to take everything in your stride. Even when you're drowning in emails, you never quibble about the often long hours, monsoonal workload and no doubt annoying ideas thrown your way by your boss. Thank you. Justine, your talent truly shines through and your work ethic is outstanding. Your capacity never ceases to astound me. This was evident from the moment you interned with me. Your keen eye for detail, fastidious organisational skills, exceptional writing ability and dedication is something I am immensely grateful for. Often working for a member is intense. The workload is fulsome and relentless and the demands are many, but my staff are absolutely incredible and I am truly grateful to each and every one of you. I owe you a debt of gratitude. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Member for Baldarvis. Speaker, the Baldarvis electorate is home to many great small businesses that provide provide high quality goods and services and today I speak of one of them. Brother of Mine Cafe is on Far Lap Parade and just like the mighty thoroughbred, it's fast becoming legendary. Brother of Mine, or BOM to Baldivians, is a family run hospitality powerhouse funded by two brothers, Brits Ben and Joss Wettingsteel. Think Jamie Oliver times two with similar accents, cheeky smiles and a passion for hospitality. They opened three years ago and customers haven't stopped coming. From tradies grabbing early breakfast to Mackaybe Rise school mums enjoying a post-drop-off coffee, it's hipster meets homely, fashionista meets 
casual. Locals have always known how good BOM is, now WA does too. This year, brother of mine was named WA's Cafe of the Year at the Australian Restaurant and Catering Awards. <coughs> During COVID, they kept going. Now they employ 40 local people even more than before. This is an inspirational small business that typifies the local entrepreneurial spirit that exists right across our electorate. As well as Joss and Ben, there's Jessica Ruri Nui, General Manager, Lachlan Boyd, Head Chef, Jean Plummer, Graphic Designer, Charlie McKenzie, Admin and Culture, and a long list of other key members. It's true to sp say, Speaker, that BOM is the BOM. Member for Bunbury. There are a number of organisations who provide extra services and support at Christmas time, and I want to acknowledge the Salvation Army with Zoe and Mark Schatz, Food Bank with Carol Hearn, the in-town lunch centre that provides a Christmas lunch, our South West Refuge supporting families, South West Foster Carers supporting uh, toy drives, the Bunbury Soup Van with Denise and Sasha, who will be out with the van, providing a hot meal on every public holiday, and doors wide open, Jane, Linda and Anne, who are collecting food items and gifts for children to support individuals and families dealing with the impacts of addiction. There are many other organisations, but all of these organisations will be out collecting for Christmas this year, and I would encourage everybody to get behind and help those people who've done it a little bit tougher than everybody else who might need a little bit of extra support. Uh, the Salvation Army will be particularly drive on a toy drive, and toys are always very welcome. Uh, toys that kids can play with, as well as providing food for people who, um, who are pretty, sometimes fairly desperate. So I do support all of those organisations, and if anybody would like uh, further information about where to contact them, they are welcome to contact my office and we'll link people up. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I will leave the chair until the ringing of the bells. Get up. Get up. It's a full house. Order. <laughs> Members, question time. Be nice to me today, thank you. <laughs> Leader of the House. <laughs> I'm My old. question is. Oh, no. <laughs> I gave it to I gave it to the member for um, Mr Murray there because uh, I thought he needed it more than me. Leader of the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, th given this is the last scheduled question time, will you finally come clean and outline to the House what is the true impact? of the automated outer harbour on the important marine habitat of Coburn Sound. Members. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker uh, uh, can I... Uh, we'll have Christmas speeches later on and can I wish all members all the best and no doubt uh, we'll say that at that point in time. Uh, but it is uh, uh, interesting and I suppose um, uh, sad in a way that this is the last sitting day scheduled uh, of uh, this parliament, so I do appreciate all members' questions. I especially appreciate that question, uh, <laughs> Leader of the Opposition, because uh, it's come to my attention uh, that either today or yesterday, you, today, you tabled a petition with more than 10,000 signatures on it, and then you pushed that petition to the uh, elements of the media, uh, advocating on behalf uh, of what was in uh, the petition, Mr Speaker. Uh, and the petition had 10,000 signatures. It's signed at the bottom by yourself. Uh, no. And in it, it calls for the construction. It's, signed by me. It, it's got your name on the bottom. You, pre you presented it. I presented it. Oh, yeah. It's the presenter. Oh, OK, it's the presenter. All right, as you admit, as you admit, the presenter. Well, I can only see, I can only see your name on it. Order. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. You it's got, it's got, well, it's got your name on it, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, and uh, in the petition, it calls for uh, the, uh, the construction uh, and it calls for committing to Westport and the construction of a new harbour. <laughs> <laughs> in, 
in Kwinana, Mr. Speaker. So, 10,000 signatures, the Leader of the Opposition tables signed. it, then circulates it to, to the media saying, why is the government not delivering on all these things, including that, Mr. Speaker? So, what I would suggest to the Leader of the Opposition is maybe before she tables these documents, she might want to read it first. And before you table it and then circulate it to press outlets and say, Put pressure on the government. They need to deliver all these things uh, that are contained within this petition. And I notice it's on an online news service. Maybe you should actually think about it before you do so. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, what we are doing? No, Mr. Speaker, the, the facts are there for all to see. The facts are Leader there for all the to opposition. see. The facts are there for all to see. This, uh, well, Mr. Speaker, did you push it to the media? Did you push it to the media? I accepted the petition on behalf of the constituent oh, as I was supposed to do. That's right. Funny face. So you come in here, you members, you come in here members, and attack me. Members. You come in here over and attack me over a project we took to the state election before the last state election that we are progressing with full EPA assessment processes, which we are funding, Mr. Speaker. On the day you table a petition and circulate and push it, calling for the same project, Mr Speaker. Do you wonder why the people of Western Australia have absolutely no faith in the Liberal Party in this state? Yeah. 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 Supplementary Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I'd just like, before I ask my supplementary... No. <laughs> Members, um, members. Mr Speaker, I will proudly stand in this parliament any day of the week and table a petition on behalf of any constituent. Uh, just a supplementary, and that's all you're allowed. Otherwise, I'll sit you down. Leave the opposition. So, Premier, just Throw to be you clear, out. you're refusing to provide the detail. Is that because you don't know the impact of the outer harbour on Coburn Sound, or you do know and you don't want to advise the public? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, I said before that the Leader of the Opposition's name was on it, and she denied having signed it. Yet there at the top, Mr. Speaker, is the Leader of the Opposition's you signature. You have to sign it. You have to sign it. Her signature is on the document. Members, Mr. Speaker. The petition. It's on the document. You're misleading everybody in this, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I Premier, said Premier, she signed this document. Premier, and Premier, and point of order. Excuse me, you don't tell the Premier to sit down. I do. Then for doors to a point of order. Point of order, Speaker. The Premier is clearly impugning the motives of the The Premier is asserting that the Leader of the Opposition signed that. She has to sign it to endorse it in the first place. Member, the doors are all cool. order for the first time because I gave a decision and you kept going. And the Minister for what do we call you now? Um, emergency yeah. Services, I call you to order. So, Mr. Speaker, so, Mr. Speaker the petition itself that the Leader of the Opposition tabled, and she signed her name at the top, calls for the construction of Westport and the construction of a new harbour. That's what it does, with 10,000 signatures. Now, the Leader of the Opposition said that she only did that as a formality, Mr Speaker. Yet I have a photograph of her with the petition pushing it to the media outside of Parliament, yeah. calling, calling for the media to take up this case, Mr Speaker. And there she is, there she is with the member for Darling I, I Range and the proponent the of the uh, petition, Mr Speaker. There she is, Mr Speaker. So if it, was, if it was just a formality... Members! Members of my right, your Premier's on his feet. If it was just a formality, why did you go outside the Parliament pushing it to the media and having your photograph holding the petition, Mr Speaker? Why did you do that? Members of Darling Range, I call you to order for the first time. I think this explains The question is, why didn't they go to the member for Armadale? That's the question. Mr Speaker, in four years... Leader of the Opposition. Minister for Transport. Do you two want to go outside and have a little chat and come back and feel better? <laughs> Premier. Member oh, for Member for Darling Range, I call your orders for second time. Member for Armadale, I know you're leaving early, but I'll call you to order for the first time. <laughs> Now, I did read the online story, Mr Speaker, in which the uh, Leader of the Opposition pushed the petition committing to Westport, Mr Speaker, and uh, had the photo and signed it, Mr Speaker. I did read the article. I did read the article, and I note the Member for Armadale, a very good Member of Parliament, 
was able to point out some of the great things we're doing down in his community, like the rebuild of the TAFE, Mr Speaker, in the heart of town that we committed to as part of the recovery project, Mr Speaker. The Denny Avenue project talked about for actually 100 there years uh, that we are doing, Mr Speaker, uh, as, we, yes. uh, as we speak. Uh, the nearby industrial estate that we uh, committed funds to uh, to allow for major uh, industrial activity to take place. And of course, Mr Speaker, the Byford Rail Line. The Byford Rail Line, Mr Speaker, which I note is also on the petition, Mr Speaker. I note the Byford Rail Line has been called for in the petition, and I note on the weekend the Liberal Party is out there protesting against it. <laughs> now, Mr Speaker, what are we to think? What are we to think? So I was asked, I was doing my press conference on Sunday because I do weekend press conferences. I was doing my weekend press conference on Sunday, uh, and uh, one of the journalists, I think it was Jeff Parry, asked me, Mr. Speaker. Oh, oh, water. Sam, nothing to do with the bike. <laughs> this government's continuing on action to listen to the residents of the Darling Road. That's <laughs> no, not a point of order. It was a good Mr. Try, Speaker. Though, it was not a point of order. And he asked me about the Liberal Party protest uh, against uh, the Byford Rail and, in particular, against the Thomas Road overpass. Now, I know Thomas Road quite well because I've driven it many, many times. Nearly had an accident on there myself once, Mr. Speaker. This project is much needed much needed, and it's an integral part of the Byford Rail Line. One group is out there protesting against it, the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party. Out there so it's in the petition. It's in the petition like Westport is, yet you don't, oppose, you don't support either of them, you claim, and yet you're out there outside Parliament promoting it. It's very odd, Mr Speaker. Now, in terms of environmental assessments, obviously, obviously that is an important part of any such project. Uh, that will be undertaken fully and thoroughly by EPA processes as we committed to, as we've outlined on numerous occasions. Yeah, yeah. The for Wanneroo. Okay, my question is to the Pem Premier and Minister for Jobs. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to supporting local jobs and ensuring the WA economy is kept safe and strong. And I ask, can the Premier update the House on how the unprecedented efforts of the McGowan Labor government during the past three years and eight months has delivered more local jobs and helped get more West Australians back into work? I thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, Mr Speaker, the figures that came out today are incredibly encouraging and very, very strong for Western Australia. Uh, we now have, in the month of October, 15,300 jobs being created, Mr Speaker. Uh, that's the second strongest employment growth of all, all of the states. Our unemployment, is, our unemployment rate is down again to 6.6 per cent, uh, the second lowest unemployment rate in the country. But, you know, we have the highest participation rate of anywhere in Australia by a number of points. So, uh, Mr Speaker, have we had the national average of the participation rate, we we'll easily have the lowest unemployment rate uh, in the country. Uh, the figures today show that 89,300 jobs have been recovered uh, since May, uh, since uh, COVID uh, hit, Mr Speaker. That's around 87 per cent of all jobs lost have been uh, recovered. And, of course, as part of our recovery plan, investment is taking place all over Western Australia uh, to get jobs back, and we were the first government in Australia uh, to launch a uh, recovery plan, Mr Speaker. done numerous things across the state, Mr Speaker, but this morning I was able to address a major industry forum uh, and outline the fact that we're going to have a $27 billion look forward of our pipeline of work, first time ever, all over the state. Industry will be able to see for years ahead the pipeline of work that uh, government agencies and instrumentalities uh, will be tendering for. Terrific for business all over Western Australia, including the city and the regions, Mr Speaker. We're delivering uh, over this term, and hopefully if re-elected over next term, Metronet, rail car manufacturing, uh, nearly a billion dollars of social and affordable housing. We've cut TAFE fees, undertaken economic reform, planning reform, environmental law reform, liquor reform. Uh, we've uh, slashed payroll tax, taking up defence industry, the biggest investment in roads, especially in the regions. Uh, ever seen, Mr Speaker. Greater job security for West Australian workers, infrastructure WA, invest in trade WA, the LNG Jobs Task Force, the Madagarit Bridge, back from Malaysia, where the last government was building it, Mr Speaker, back from Malaysia, secure the Perth City deal, Mr Speaker, the GST deal that we are defending very, very vigorously, Mr Speaker. But I want to talk about one thing. Uh, we have, as part of the recovery plan, launched a $492 million investment in school infrastructure across WA. Very, very significant. Mr Speaker, today we announced that we're adding to that. 
We're going to be spending $16.7 million rebuilding Hillary's primary school, Mr. Speaker. Rebuilding Hillary's primary school. Now, Mr. Speaker, magnificent, magnificent project for the people of Hillary's, Mr. Speaker. It'll have 16 new general learning classrooms, two kindergarten classrooms. Uh, and obviously it will require a re-elected Labor government to do this, Mr Speaker, because the, the school has been there for 50 years, 50 years untouched, untouched by successive Conservative governments, Mr Speaker, untouched, untouched by Conservative governments, Mr Speaker, over all of that time. And the great thing, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, it's good news Mr Speaker, I knew, I knew I'd get the reaction, Mr Speaker, I knew I'd get the reaction. I'd like to thank the community of Hillary's. I'd like to thank the Labor candidate for Hillary's Caitlin Lewis Collins. I'd like to thank her. I'd like to thank her. She's met with parents, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank her. She's she's met with parents and staff. I knew I knew the member of, of, for Hillary's would get upset, Mr. Speaker. But I just say to him. I just say to him, Mr. Speaker. I just say to him. I just, I just want to two. say to him. I, if I can just have a bit of silence, Member for Hillary's, because Member for Hillary's, Member for Hillary's, my office is just down the corridor. If you cared so much about it, you could have come and knocked on my door. You could have come and knocked on my door, and you could have said, you could have said, you could have come and knocked on my door, and you could have said, Premier, Premier Hillary's primary school needs rebuilding. But you know what, Mr. Speaker, the Member for Hillary's, he never did that. He never raised the issue in here with me. He never asked the question. Member for he never showed any interest. The first time. It took Caitlin Collins working with the school community, working with the people of Hillary's, to ensure that project comes to fruition. And under a McGowan government, Mr. Speaker, it will. If we want to take a deep breath. Member for Bateman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to the Liberals' plan for cheaper power bills, and I ask. <laughs> Members. <laughs> Premier, I refer to the Liberals' uh, plan for cheaper power bills, and I ask. <laughs> Members, please start again. Premier, I refer to the Liberals' plan for cheaper power bills, and I ask, can you confirm your refusal to allow retail competition to end Synergy's monopoly is preventing more than 300,000 households from selling more energy from their solar panels to innovative clean electricity retailers? Uh, Mr Speaker, no, I can't confirm that. I can't Premier. confirm that. Uh, and what I find about the member for Bateman is uh, his, uh, his knowledge of these matters uh, is uh, not strong. Uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, it's very shaky. Uh, and uh, as I point out on numerous occasions, you had eight and a half years to do something about this if you wanted to. <laughs> eight and a half years. And the reason you didn't is because you knew when you were in government that in order to do what you're saying, you have to put prices up. You have to put prices up. That's, that's the advice every government has always received in respect to these matters. You have to put prices up. Uh, and then what you'll do, Mr Speaker, of course, is allow for cherry-picking of customers, especially in the regions. That's exactly what will happen. Regional power prices will go through the roof, if you excuse the pun, Mr Speaker, yep. through the roof uh, if uh, the Liberal Party's plan uh, comes into fruition. And as we know, obviously, the Liberal Party, in their DNA, wants to privatise all of these electricity assets. Uh, and it's part of that as well, Mr Speaker. So don't worry. We're more than happy to, to debate you on this. More than happy. I note the Leader of the Opposition was out there the other day calling for 8 o'clock trading on a Sunday morning, devastating small businesses across the state, devastating the lifestyles of families all over the state. Don't worry. We're happy to tell small business. Because I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Labor is the party of small business in this state. We are the party of small business in this state. We are the party of the regions because we're standing up for regional people against these plans that will put their prices up, Mr Speaker. Uh, we're ensuring that major utilities remain in public ownership. You can see in New South Wales, our good friends in New South Wales who sold it all off, Mr Speaker. What's happened to debt, Mr Speaker? It's skyrocketing in New South Wales. Of course, they were meant to, that was meant to sort of uh, cauterise uh, the debt increases in New South Wales. What's happened? The opposite, Mr Speaker. That's exactly what happens under the Liberal Party, both in New South Wales and Western Australia, and we look forward to reminding everyone of that fact every single day for the next four months. 
Supplementary member for Bateman. Premier, so to confirm, you are refusing to provide Western Australian households. <laughs> Members, I'll hear the supplementary in silence. Premier, so to confirm, you are refusing to provide Western Australian households with access to a cheaper, cleaner and more innovative electricity. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, why don't you yeah, very good point. Why don't you ask the Minister for uh, Energy a question? But the idea let's just think about this. The Liberal Party the Liberal Party, let's just think. The Liberal Party is now the friend of renewables. <laughs> That's the substance of your question. The Liberal Party is now the friend of your renewables. I don't know if you've watched what's happened across this country over the last 10 years. The Liberal Party is not the friend of renewables. You are not the friend of renewables. Have a look at what's happened. Have a look at some of the commentary from Angus Taylor and some of these characters, Mr Speaker. Have a look at some of the commentary of the Liberal Party across Australia. The idea that the Liberal Party is the friend of renewables is frankly wrong and goes against all of the, all of the available evidence across this country, Mr Speaker. Member for Warren Blackwood. Three times I've called you. This government, as the member for Collie well knows, has done more for Collie than ever before. Second time. We have ensured the sustainability of Collie. We have also supported investment in renewable energy across this state, something the Liberal Party was incapable of. The member for Belmont. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is for the Treasurer, and I refer to the McGowan government's commitment to keeping WA economy economy safe and strong. And I ask, can the Treasurer update the House on the work undertaken by the McGowan government during this term to drive economic growth, create local jobs and support local businesses? And can the Treasurer outline to the House how this compares to the economic disasters left by the previous Liberal National Government? Good question. Well, Mr. Speaker, Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the member for Belmont for that very good question, Mr Speaker. And uh, the Premier just made the point that Labor is the party for regional WA. We're the party for small businesses, Mr Speaker, and I think it's beyond doubt now uh, that WA Labor is the party for strong financial management, economic growth and job creation, Mr Speaker. Uh, the last 20 years, in particular the last four years, has absolutely confirmed that point, Mr Speaker. When I became Treasurer, and I've made the point many a times in this place, Member for Belmont, is that when I finished as Treasurer, I wanted to ensure that the balance sheet was better able to respond to the circumstances that we may find ourselves in. And I'm pleased to say that has certainly been delivered, Mr Speaker, by the McGowan government and McGowan cabinet, Mr Speaker. Uh, $9 billion is the change in debt uh, that we achieved over the four budgets delivered by this government, a billion dollar in interest savings over that time, Mr Speaker. As a result, we have, and it's, if you think about it, this is an amazing figure. Bearing in mind the global shutdown of our economies, compared to March 2017 to now, there are another 63,000 Western Australians in work. 63,000 Western, Australia, 63, Western Australians in work on the, ba on the back of a much larger participation rate now than it was in March 2017. That highlights the resilience of the economy uh, compared to when I became Treasurer after four years of domestic recession, Mr Speaker. We now have economic growth. Uh, and tomorrow's uh, accounts, I suspect, will continue to show that good story, Mr Speaker. As a result, we've been able to do so many things, so many things. Every minister uh, in the government has been able to do so many things in their portfolio areas. The Minister for Culture and the Arts will shortly be opening a wonderful museum, Boulevard, this weekend. Quite spectacular. Minister for Transport sitting next to him. Uh, multi-billion dollar Metronet program, plus what seems to be a new road wherever you go around regional Western Australia. The Minister for Sport, wherever you go, he's giving somebody a football, Mr Speaker. It's quite extraordinary. The Minister for Housing, nearly $2 billion going in uh, to the property sector. The Minister for Corrections has built an entire prison within the prison footprint. And not only that has delivered drug and alcohol rehab centres, uh, prisons that are being incredibly successful. That's why we don't have 110 per cent capacity in our prisons anymore, Mr Speaker. The Minister for Mines, the Minister for Energy. Someone called out a minute ago what happened to Waradaji. The Minister opened it just the other week. That's how successful that Minister has been. Uh, the Minister for Child Protection, perhaps the toughest area uh, in government, Mr Speaker, has done an incredible effort around kids, Aboriginal kids 
kids in care. And I want to acknowledge Wondrening and the efforts we've gone to to reduce and redirect kids uh, coming into care and making sure families take on them. The Minister for Tourism, up until the point he shut down the cruise sector, was doing a tremendous job, <laughs> tremendous job. Record international tourists coming into Western Australia, Mr Speaker, under, this, under, under that minister. Uh, the Minister for Water sitting behind me, record, in fact, the investment going into our water infrastructure is causing disruptions in some places, Minister, that has been so successful. The Attorney General has managed to appoint every lawyer in the state a judge, and I think that is an outstanding outcome. And of course, the Minister for Police, 950 police officers, stab proof vests, investment in infrastructure in a way the police haven't seen before uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, Minister. I want to thank all these ministers who have done a tremendous job. And the only reason we've been able to do it, Mr Speaker, is the reason why Labor governs. Strong financial management isn't the end. Strong financial management is about doing, creating jobs for Western Australians and ensuring we deliver services for Western Australians that are sustainable for the future. And I want to thank all my colleagues. Yeah. I thought you were retiring, Treasury. You need to get some more votes and caucus, but that's uh, good. <laughs> Member for Warren Blackwood. Mr. Speaker, my question without notice is to the Minister for Tourism. Minister, I refer to a recent decision by Tourism WA to cancel a Hello World uh, familiarisation tour to WA by six travel agents from New Zealand, sorry, from Queensland, Tasmania, and the ACT a market connection that is very important to tourism operators here in WA. And I ask, one, what is the basis for cancelling a familiarisation tour to WA for travel agents from states where there is currently no travel restrictions? And two, do you support familiarisation tours by travel agents from COVID safe states as a strategy to build our interstate travel market? Uh, Mr. Speaker, thanks, um, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for the question. Look, uh, you're talking about an operational matter right down in the weeds, actually, with respect to a famil by Hello World representatives from where were you saying? Uh, from Queensland, the ACT, and Tasmania. Look, uh, without without uh, awareness of what date the cancellation was made, I wouldn't be able like to. I wouldn't days. be able to. Uh, enlighten you as to the reasoning behind the cancellation. So until very recently we had a, a hard border. We then went to a controlled border only you know, a matter of a week and a bit ago, two weeks ago. Uh, the consequence uh, of having the hard border would have been we were preparing for a future opportunity to market to interstate markets when they became available. So we have in Tourism WA for some time now, in fact right throughout the, uh, the COVID uh, response, we've had in-market buyer right across the eastern seaboard. We've just been rolling it over. A lot of measures that we would normally undertake to grow visitor numbers, we've either paused or we've had to cancel. So, for instance, seeking out big events which draw people. No point doing that when you couldn't bring people here. Similarly, uh, for mills for travel agents are the sort of thing that are done when you have the capacity to market to a market. There's not much point spending taxpayers' dollars on activity that wouldn't result in a return. So I would assume, without Setting again, up for the future. had you given me some notice, I might have been able to find out exactly why it was uh, cancelled and why the measures, uh, you know, the visit was uh, no doubt postponed rather than, than completely uh, you know, ended forever. There, would, we, there will be an opportunity for these types of activities to return when it is appropriate. We'll spend Tax, valuable taxpayers' money on things that get returned. You don't, you don't risk that investment at a time where you might not be able to exploit it. So I, I can't. If you wanted to actually know the answer, you might have given me a little bit of notice. Supplementary. Supplementary. So, Minister, can you confirm whether we are open to tourism from Queensland, Tasmania, and the ACT or not? Because it would appear your agency doesn't seem to think so. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, <laughs> I've. <laughs> That's a, a bit of a leap from a you know, three-person delegation uh, coming for a familiarisation with tourism, um, tourism attractions in Western Australia to not being open. But obviously, we're in a pandemic. Uh, things are a little unpredictable. As recently as a few days ago, a state that we were 
uh, having a controlled border with and we were uh, welcoming we were welcoming visitors from has gone into complete lockdown the toughest lockdown in the country in excess of what Victoria had uh, and so therefore I would I would commend tourism WA for being a little prudent about use of taxpayers money uh, that is focused on attracting visitors in the event that there may, may not be much of a market right now because people may be inclined to be a little reserved about travelling in this environment. They may be inclined to be a little bit uh, precautious about, about leaving their own state in the event that a border um, arrangement may change at short notice. I would commend Tourism WA. And I'll, I'll just finish. I'll finish, uh, in, I'll finish in, in not really giving much credence to your question by saying, by saying that Tourism Western Australia is demonstrably the best tourism agency in the country. In 2018, we went from inheriting a disaster in tourism from you, from your lot, in a, a, an absolutely depressed environment where no, no thought had been put to uh, what would happen at the end of the business travel boom that happened in the mining sector uh, when that ended. We went from that to having a two-year action plan that we implemented at the start of 2018, the biggest out-of-state visitor numbers in history in 2018, only exceeded in 2019 when we got even bigger numbers, and we were on track for even bigger numbers in 2020. Uh, of course, the pandemic That's intervened. Right. Nevertheless, the Wander Out Yonder campaign is the best, the most successful interstate campaign in history, and we have the best tourism market in the country. We have more people travelling in Western Australia's regions than any other state has, and that is a big part of what the Treasurer just referred to. The hospitality, accommodation and tourism sector have been the big contributors to the growth in jobs since we got back into operation. Member for Thornley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's efforts in keeping the WA economy strong through its record investment in transport infrastructure. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on this government's investment in Metronet and how the delivery of the single biggest rail expansion in Perth's history is supporting local jobs? And can the Minister advise the House if she is aware of anyone who doesn't support this investment in Metronet and other job creating transport projects? Minister for Transport. I thank the member for that question. I thank that member for that question. And his commitment to Metronet, to local jobs, local companies, local work members. Now, of course, of course. We are delivering a record amount of rail infrastructure in Western Australia. Never been seen before. Eight projects underway and more to come. And let's just go through those projects and see who opposes those projects in Western Australia. Who opposes them? First of all, let's start in your area, remember, the Thorley to Coburn Rail Link. A much needed project. A much needed project that the that the other side could never deliver, could never deliver, and could never deliver. Now, I'm quoting a former member for Southern River, who in 2008 told the West Australian he had unsuccessfully lobbied the government's leadership to commit to the line in the lead-up to the state election. I think they figured that the polling showed I was doing extremely well, said the former member. And then, this, so, the, so in 2015, in 2015, I'm hoping that within five years we'll either get a commitment or it's even under construction starting. Well, former member, construction has started under this government member, under this government. The Yanship Rail extension underway, member for Butler. We've been member out there Bass, a few times. Court order for the first time. The Yanship Rail extension opposed by by the Liberal Party members, opposed by the Liberal Party. Now, the uh, Leader of the Opposition, in 2018, there's plenty of land up there, not many houses, not many people living up there at the moment. I'm curious to hear the Minister's explanation of why Yanship was progressed. Again, the Liberal Party opposing the Yanship rail line, Bayswater Rail Station. Now, remember, what did the Liberal Party commit to the Bayswater Rail Station? Nothing. Well, a new ramp and a toilet. <laughs> a new ramp and a toilet. It's an excellent toilet. <laughs> a new ramp and a toilet. As part of their $1.8 billion forestal commitment, they committed, I think, $4 million to a new ramp and a toilet. 
We have committed over $200 million rebuilding a brand new Bayswater station, a whole new precinct, the Morley Ellenbrook line. Shall we go through that again? Failed, failed to deliver their election commitments. Failed to deliver their commitments. Twice you failed, you broke a promise to the people of Ellenbrook and that entire corridor. And even, even after the last election, they said, oh, look, um, it, uh, the member for Riverton, it is out there prioritising a rail line to Ellenbrook, which is not needed for 10 years. The member for Bateman, if you look at... Member for Vasco, you ordered for the second time. You'll miss out in the crayfish the way you're going. If you look at the population, member for, uh, member for Bateman, there's not enough to sustain a capital investment at this point in time. Opposed to the Ellenbrook rail line. And of course, we've got the Denny Avenue level crossing underway, another massive project for Kelmscott and Armadale. The Mandra car sta station um, car park underway, the Byford rail extension. Opposed by the Liberal Party. They don't want us to deliver the Byford Rail extension. An incredible position, an incredible position by the Liberal Party, running a campaign against the extension of the Byford Rail Line. Presents a petition, presents a petition today calling us to get on with it, to get on with it, goes out there, does a, does a media you know, event. And then comes and then opposes the rail line. I mean, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Can't you actually match what you're doing on a Sunday to what you're doing on a Thursday, members? And of course, the Forestwood Airport link, being delivered by this government. Yeah. This government started under this government. Over four kilometres of track being laid. So, member, there are people in WA who don't support Metronet. It's the Liberal Party, members. It's the Liberal Party, and they are fighting. They're opposing, they're criticising, while we've got thousands of Western Australian workers out there delivering a record program of investment. Member for Vass. Wow, you're on three. <laughs> Just let me you get my I book think? so I can get ready to send you home. I've seen a few meetings of the Liberal Party members today, yeah. not involving the Leader of the Opposition. No. I think they've got the polling results, members. <laughs> I think they've seen the polling results because I've seen a few groupings out there, all very, very hushed. No, no, wait a minute. What, what is your point of order? The point of order is in relation to. Remember, now you can't talk and then comment on the point of order. <laughs> the point of the point uh, the point of order, Speaker, <laughs> is specifically in relation to the relevance of the question that was asked of the minister. No, I think it's okay. Just. No. The member for Vass is enjoying it. So. Yeah, they're very sort of, you know, they're very nervous on the other side. I think they've all been given, as um, as the uh, minister for culture and the arts said, the Manila folder with their their their, their polling results, oh. and they're out there. I've seen them all having meetings, and, and the minister asked which group is the member for Dawesville in. I don't think it's the leader of the opposition's group. Oh. I don't think it's the leader of the opposition's group, is what I can see. Make a personal explanation. <laughs> point of order again to the relevance of the question that was asked. Uh, just hold on. When the, uh, when the point of order is on, I hear it in silence. Thank you very much, Speaker. The Minister was asked a question specifically about Metronet projects. I don't believe yeah. her statement is yeah, relevant. Yeah, I, I think you're drifting away. Thank you very so much, <laughs> <laughs> Just drift back to the question. I'll, pi I'll pivot back again, members. I'll pivot back. Uh, I think you're Minister right. for Water, I know you like to have a say, but I don't want to hear it. Call it to order for the I'll, I'll first time. Again. I'll pivot again. I call it to order for the second time. <laughs> you're right, actually, member. It was actually asked in the uh, Liberal Party polling. So there's only one party that can be trusted to deliver Metronet yeah. jobs and rail lines for our future, and that's Labor. Yeah. <laughs> Don't pick up the wrong pile. <laughs> Don't pick up the wrong pile. <laughs> Member for Armadale, I'll call you the second time. You, you've got no taste in clothes either, so don't give me. And for Dawson. Uh, Minister for Housing, you're, you're not what you call a fashion icon either. So. Call your order for the first time. Any other people who think they're 
funny or you want to say something? No, OK. I think you look great, mate. Thank you. From, well, considering you wore a powdered wig this morning, Speaker, I'm not sure that's a compliment. But, uh, <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to the Liberals' exceptional announcement to rebuild King Edward Memorial Hospital and establish a $60 million maternal and child health research fund. And I ask, Members. is your, government, is your government committed to women and children's health? And if so, will you match our commitment? <laughs> Members, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, you might recall uh, that um, the uh, the government uh, made an important announcement about uh, a new women's and babies hospital there. Uh, either I think it was last year uh, when we settled the BHP matter uh, and uh, committed uh, the vast bulk of the settlement there uh, towards the women's and babies hospital. Uh, we retained planning money uh, for the Women's and Babies Hospital, but obviously with, withdrew some of the effort uh, on the basis that we had to deal with COVID, which we had no, no, no which we did back in March, April of this year, uh, which we, when we didn't really understand, and no one did, uh, how serious the matter would be. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have retained uh, money in the budget uh, for work on a new Women's and Babies Hospital, and we understand uh, the importance uh, of a new facility there. Uh, the, uh, the government, as I said uh, on numerous occasions over the course of the last couple of years, remains committed to that project. Very, very important project, and we announced it uh, last year. Uh, we'll obviously have more to say about that, Mr Speaker, in the future. Uh, but I do note uh, that uh, the $500 million commitment by the Liberal Party goes absolutely nowhere near meeting the costs of a new women's and babies hospital. Absolutely nowhere near it. Not, not in the ballpark. Members, not in the ballpark. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's a very, very small commitment uh, towards women's and babies by the Liberal Party that you made. Uh, just so you understand, very, very tiny commitment that you have made. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, the Liberal Party are not good at costings. Not good at costings, Mr. Speaker. And we do remember, we do remember the experience with lead in the pipes, lead in the pipes at the Perth Children's Hospital, which we are still now involved in uh, ongoing matters uh, with the builders because of the performance of the last government. Uh, Mr Speaker, it was great. This morning I had a group of um, uh, contractors, a thousand of them, that I addressed this morning, very interested in our pipeline of work, Mr Speaker. I was able to hold up the new thermostatic mixing valve uh, that the West Australian, new West Australian government was able to put through the hospital, 1,800 of them, and fix the lead in the pipes that you left us. That you left us, Mr. Speaker. So, what I can say to the people of Western Australia, when it comes to these projects, there is one party and one government people can have faith in. Under you, lead in the pipes. Under us, we <laughs> fix the problem you struggled with for years. Speaker, supplementary. supplementary. Speaker. Premier, if your government is committed to women and children's health, why have you not funded the rebuild of King Edward Memorial Hospital in the last four years of your government, or with the billions of dollars of your surplus? Mr. Speaker, if your policy is a rebuild. We understand. That is your policy, a rebuild, Mr Speaker. Obviously, our view is a new hospital is required, Mr Speaker. Our view is a new hospital is required, not a rebuild. But the uh, the uh, King Eddie's has uh, been there a number of times recently. It is, uh, what, 100 years, 100 and, uh, at least parts of it, at least 100 years. As we announced recently, part of it we are retaining for mothers and fathers who uh, whose uh, who's, uh, deceased uh, babies. Uh, were, there's a little park there to commemorate them. Obviously, we're retaining that, uh, and uh, that will be a very important part going forward. And I've had lots of positive feedback from parents uh, about that, Mr. Speaker. But I just want you to understand. I want the public to understand. Five hundred million dollars is a budget. minuscule commitment towards budget. a new hospital. Five hundred million dollars is a minuscule commitment towards a new there women's and babies hospital. I heard if that is your commitment you and your no commitment is a rebuild, I just want everyone to understand that is the Liberal Party's commitment towards this project. Uh, the member for Murray Wellington. I ask my question to the Minister for Emergency Services. I want to thank him for his service to the emergency services and in particular. To the preamble, Dick, the well, question. I refer to the McGowan Labor too. government's efforts in keeping WA safe and strong, and I ask, can the minister update the House on this government's record investment in bushfire mitigation across Western Australia and its unprecedented reforms to rural bushfire fighting across the state? 
Thank you. Thank, it's Retiring a very good minister. question um, because uh, you know the bushfire season is nearly upon us. And can I acknowledge the member for Murray Wellington's relationship with the, all the volunteers, bushfire volunteers in your seat, and what a fantastic relationship you have with them, having uh, visited virtually most of them with you over uh, over the last couple of years. Can I, uh, Mr. Speaker, if you um, if you uh, remember back to uh, March? Uh, or April 2017, and what the incoming McGowan government was were left with in the area of emergency services, we were left with the Ferguson report and all the recommendations from the Ferguson report, none of which had been addressed by the previous government. And it was left to the McGowan Labor government to sort those out, and we did. We did. March to uh, April 2017 marked the beginning of the new bushfire management reform, with record mitigation, the, the commitment and now the completion of Australia's first bushfire centre of excellence, better funding and support for local governments, and improved relationships and improved training for all volunteers in Western Australia. If you remember back, I had to kick it all off, I had the inaugural bushfire mitigation summit down there in Mandurah back on the 23rd of June in 2017, and that set the, that set the direction and the objectives for the reform program going forward. And over that period, over the last nearly four years, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Commissioner and I have travelled over 100,000 kilometres in Western Australia. We've met thousands of volunteers. We've established a, a ministerial bush, uh, volunteer advisory forum with the, 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 uh, bodies, the, the bodies that represent all the volunteers in Western Australia, and we've met four times. We established volunteer liaison officers in the, the Fire and Emergency Service Commissioner's Office. We created 11 volunteer management of officers in regions to assist the volunteers out there with their increasing administrative duties. We expanded the, bushfire, the State Bushfire Advisory Council, and that's since met th uh, three times, and we're currently working on the State Bushfire Policy for, for uh, emergency services going forward. We've transformed the, the approach to rural fire management in Western Australia and no more than in the area of bushfire mitigation. No more than in the area of bushfire mitigation. Putting in a record $50 million into keeping our state safe from the threats of bushfire is more than any other state in Australia. It's more, we've done more here than any other state in Australia. And the Treasurer taught, uh, referred earlier to Labor being the, being the friend and being the party of, the, of rural people. And we are. We're, a, we're the party of rural Western Australia. Yeah, yeah. Think about the amount of money that we've put in to rural Western Australia that for, for meaningful projects, meaningful projects to improve the lives and safety of country people. Just, yeah, yeah. just in the area of mitigation, in the, in the area of mitigation, in the member for Moore's electorate, over between 2017 and this year, we will have put 3.93 million to the areas of 2J, Karnama, Chittering, Jinjin, Irwin and Northampton. Never been done before. Well done. That was never done before well done. by previous governments, and particularly previous Liberal National Party governments. In the, air, in the member for Rose electorate, We've, over that period of time, will have invested $2.83 million in Woodenilling, Cabelling, Narragin, Wagin, Ravensthorpe, West Arthur, Williams and York. Never done before in your area. Never done before by national MPs. And in the area of uh, the member for Warren Blackwood, who's uh, disappeared, Nanup, Nanup, Boyup Brook, Bridgetown, Greenbushes, Denmark and Manjimup. We've invested $4 million in bushfire mitigation, working with local governments to make those towns safer, to make those people feel that their threat of bushfire is not going to consume them. Things, we've done things that you didn't even dream about, didn't even dream about as a national party, supposedly representing people in West, country people in Western Australia. It's only been Labor that has actually... Here we go. Here we go. 
It's only been Labor, Mr Speaker, that has protected the people of, of country Western Australia and reform the approach to bushfire management in Western Australia. Yeah, well done, Mr. Well done. The Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Tourism. Minister for Tourism, I refer to the dire shortage of worker accommodation across towns in regional WA, which mainly rely on tourism as their main economic driver. And I ask, given you have publicly confirmed in the Albany Advertiser last Tuesday that there is a shortage of worker accommodation in every regional centre that you've visited, what have you and your government done to urgently address this issue? Speaker, uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank the Member, tourism. for her confirmation that the Wander Out Yonder campaign has worked far more than anyone could possibly have hoped for. The most successful, the most successful regional tourism campaign in the history of this state. When other states, when other, when other states, when small businesses, when small businesses across Australia outside of our state are struggling under the burden of lack of demand and lack of confidence in the community, when those businesses are wondering what they're going to do when JobKeeper ends and the, and the cliff approaches, the businesses in Western Australia are confronted with the challenge of having to get more workers to meet the demand. Now that is a, that is a challenge, Mr Speaker, that I would prefer to have. And I say, and I have travelled the region since we lifted the restrictions. I have been right across this state conducting roundtables with tourism businesses in every single region of the state, including in your, in your seat, in your seat in uh, York and Northam. I was um, meeting with people where they told me it is something that they have, it's undreamed of numbers. Un inconceivable that they would be confronting the challenge of how do they how do they meet how do they meet the demand how do they accommodate it now that that is a challenge now part of it is uh, directly attributable to the fact that and, and you know rightly and, and you know a statement or a, an instruction that I applaud and, and agree with the prime minister told working holiday makers to go home at the start of the pandemic he told them to go home and many did that is uh, what has caused a significant challenge with respect to workers in the regions. They, uh, working holiday makers, uh, colloquially termed uh, backpackers, they are a big part of our tourism sector, but they are also a big part of the workforce for uh, the tourism sector and regional, uh, regional workforce. They often do uh, hospitality work, they often do jobs like cleaning in hotels and other accommodation, they uh, work behind bars, they work, they work as baristas, they do all of those sorts of jobs. They frequently do it uh, at the peak of a season, they'll save up, they'll live on the smell of an oily rag and then they'll splurge in your, in your, uh, in your market, so that's all a good part of the uh, sector. But the truth is, tens of thousands of those people were sent home and they went. And so that is a workforce that you no longer have. Beyond that, uh, there are demands in every sector, not just in accommodation, not just in hospitality, but in, in resources, in manufacturing. I know in the defence is, uh, issues portfolio, we've, we've done such a good job of supporting uh, the industry in Western Australia. There's lots of opportunity in that sector. So every sector is seeking uh, skilled labourers and unskilled labourers so they can train people, and that's, that's a competitive market. It is something that is confronting... Confront, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm answering the question, Mr Speaker. Apparently the opposition don't want you to answer the question. They, like, they would like, prefer that I, I ignored it when they, answered, when they asked it. But the truth is, it is we've, we've, uh, we've launched a, a Work and Wander Out Yonder campaign, very successful, getting thousands of uh, responses and uh, demonstrated interest to attract people to the metropolitan area. But ultimately, Mr Speaker... Ultimately, Mr Speaker, in Western Australia, we confront the challenge of getting more workers for more jobs because there is Members, lots of opportunity in WA rather than that problem than the one they confront in South Australia right now. Supplementary, Mr Speaker. So, <laughs> he'll get the chance because I'm just seeking clarification, Mr Speaker, as part of my supplementary. Just so I'm absolutely clear, can you confirm that all you've done is hold a series of talk fests and blamed the federal government on the issue of worker shortages? In effect, you've Members. done nothing. Look, Mr. Speaker, member, look, honestly, I've, I've um, 
spoken, as I said, to hundreds, personally spoken to hundreds of small businesses no across Minister. regional Western Australia. No and, and the last meeting to which you refer was in Albany uh, with, all, I think, some 20 or so local businesses. And sitting across the table from me was a, uh, a, a farm stay operator. And what he said to me was exactly what you've said. There's, there's a, our biggest challenge is getting people to work. But you know what he said to me after that? His very next sentence, I'd rather have this problem than the problem they're having elsewhere in the world. And that is the truth. Now the member for Bicton. The president of East Fremantle Football Club and guests in the speaker's gallery. My question is to the Minister for Sport and Recreation. President I refer to the Fremantle. Public Accounts Committee's recent report into the use of state funding by the WA Football Commission. Yes. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on his response to the report and its findings? Great question. Thank you, Member. Thank you, Member for Mount Lawley. <laughs> Can you give me the call? Yeah, I'll give you the call. I'll give you the call for the last time. This my time, mate Mick. The last time. Yeah. I promise not to cry. Just get the words right. Look, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question, and uh, it is a very uh, important question on uh, where we go with football into the future. While the department has had not the time to prepare a formal response to the report and its findings since it was released just recently, it would be remiss of me not to provide some comment because I won't be here into the future and Parliament also will rise. So the, the committee itself uh, identified the complexity, the breadth and the importance of football and the significant changes that have occurred since the creation of the WFC in 1989. And I do make the comment um, that in 1990 there was another uh, press release that sounded so similar as uh, what was had, the same problem as we've had in, the, in recent times. So sometimes we see the full circle go around and uh, we're back there again. As we know, Aussie Rules has a strong brand recognition and loyalty which befitted football in WA through revenues from the Eagles and the Dockers. But this has come at a cost in terms of the identity and recognition of the WAFL as a preeminent competition in Western Australia. And a lot of those clubs have struggled with that and, and about not being the number one entity in the, in the state and uh, many people recognise that. But they have a challenge. The challenge for the West Australian Football League is now how do they remain sustainable, how do they create a following and out, as outlined in the committee's report, could this be through such issues such as the return of the Colts and uh, there's movement in the station on that area already or the responsibility totally for junior football so that they do have an identity on the way through. The report also shows that the government's process of the WAFC is about as complicated as it gets. And even today, I shake my head that it was able to be put into place. There's something about that the WAFC has ex have expressed a desire to change. However, as it's an incorporated body, the only way it can change is for those with the existing power the AFL clubs, uh, the WAFL clubs and the commissioners agree to relinquish the power and redistribute it to others. Yes. And as we know, that will be a very difficult task for anyone in that area. It will be very strange to say we're going to give away our power and we have a look at the voting rights in there, something has to change. The same uh, for the Eagles and Dockers, they were not created as clubs, as some VFL clubs were, they were formed as businesses. The Eagles and the Dockers are wholly owned by the WAFC, meaning the general public, in fact, is not members but season ticket holders because they are businesses. Again, as the report shows, this can change but there needs to be a willingness to implement change to give up that power. When there are young players that do not make it through to an AFL draft, but do not, sorry, where there are young players that make it to an AFL through the, to the draft, through the draft, but do no, not make the team and are essentially discarded, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks in the draft system, mm. the committee points out who is responsible. And we see some of those tragic stories of kids that have been drafted and don't quite get there and then fail when they go back into their communities as well. Something that really has to be looked at hardly. Yeah. So the added challenge is how does an organisation balance the diversity of the sport 
from the challenges of the mental well-being of elite players that do not make it to provide participation opportunities for young kids, not only in communities but remote communities. It is not simply a matter of the funding. As the report shows, WAFC receives more funds, whether it's through grants or agreeing to provide content at Alpha Stadium, than any other sport. And we all know that many of those sports would love to get the 11 million a year that comes from the stadium agreement into some of those small sports. And I've been out there when you've given checks out for five thousand dollars to some of those smaller sports, and they get down their knees, on their knees with gratitude. Oh. Yet here we have, you know, the big boys of town whinging about how much they get. So, you know, those those smaller clubs that do it with um, uh, how. Smaller, the smaller clubs do a lot more with a far less in their time, something that the Football Commission and the elite clubs must recognise. It becomes a matter of choice through informed decision making. The report shows that the WAFC is doing many good things for the community. The arguments in the report more relate to whether the choices that the WA Football Commission are making are ones the community feel they should be making. So they've lost touch with their community. They must work hard to get back and to uh, gain that respect from many of those areas. In the terms of female grassroots participation, the report makes a number of observations which I'll take on board, particularly the development of pr appropriate facilities to accommodate the rapidly growing female participation numbers. But I should point out that this increase in female participation has not been reflected at the executive and the board level of football in WA. And I believe it's incumbent on the WA Football Commission to lead by example. Yeah. The passion in sport is one of the greatest strengths and at times its greatest weakness when passion overrides or clouds more logical judgment and process. Again, this is highlighted throughout the report. Sport is not simple. The report confirms this. But there are crystal clear areas for improvement in transparency and representation decision making. The issues and challenges outlined in this report also apply to many other larger sports in Australia, and the pursuit to commercialise this is a topic that has led to many robust conversations nationally as to the future management of sport. I look forward to continuing to monitor how the report progresses and the way the WAFL and the WAFC use this opportunity to reach common ground and to reset Australian rules football in Western Australia. As many would be aware, most major sports have, have, due to COVID, had a major rethink and restructure. This, along with the parliamentary report, is a great opportunity for the WAFC to consider and implement changes that will sure, ensure a robust future for football in he's WA. Done, he's done, he's done, he's done. Members, I'll hear the point of order. I ask you to draw him to tighten his response to the relevancy of the question that was asked. There's well, it was asked about the Football Commission. It's a very long answer, Speaker. Yeah, but the it's good, even the threat. I've got to think of the clerk's ears when I use this all the time. I think you had a pretty good whack there, remember? You uh, ready to finish? Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. With due respect, may I finish my report? Last one. Yes. I finish my report by saying yes. thank it's you for everyone in the chamber. I wish you all a Merry Christmas. Yes. <laughs> and, and bar humbug to you, Member for Dawesville. Member for yours. I'm glad that wasn't directed at me, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Commerce. Minister for Commerce. I refer to the issue of um, cladding on public and private buildings of the same style as led to the tra tragic Grenfell Tower fire in London. And I ask, can you update the House on how many high-risk public and private buildings still require remedial action, how much money the government has allocated to address this important public safety issue, and when can we expect that all public and or private buildings in Western Australia comply with cladding requirements so we don't have uh, the risk of, the, uh, of a tragic fire as happened at the Grenfell Tower. Minister. 
Uh, of course, the government is responsible for the public buildings and uh, the public buildings uh, that have uh, fallen within the dangerous uh, category uh, have had remediation effected. Uh, in relation to private buildings, uh, the government is not responsible for those, nor do they have power uh, over them. The Building Commission, however, has been working with local government authorities, and remediation notices have been served by local government authorities upon private owners. Um, but the uh, extent of uh, that report uh, is coming back from uh, local government authorities to the Building Commission. Uh, all of those buildings uh, have not been remediated uh, because the, the private owners themselves have to effect those remediations and comply with notices served upon them by uh, the local government authorities. But I will take uh, on notice uh, your request for the numbers of those buildings that remain outstanding once I get those figures from the local government. Just before my supplementary, can, can I just uh, seek a point of order? The minister said he will take that on notice. What procedure do we have for that question on notice to be responded to? No, he's, 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 he was taking note of it, is the way he order. meant it. Okay. Okay. I'll take him at his word that he'll, he'll get back to me on it. Um, my supplementary, Minister, is there any state government financial assistance available? My supplementary, is there any financial assistance from the state government available to struggling strata title owners in some of these towers that may not have the, capacity, the financial capacity to pay for a levy that is levied upon them to fix this dangerous high-risk cladding? No, no, there is not. The state government is not funding the remediation of private buildings. No. The, the, the remediation of private buildings is responsible is the responsibility of the owners of those buildings Absolutely. that have got that cladding on. They may in turn, however, they may in turn, however, have claims back upon architects and That's building right. surveyors who certified, incorrectly certified the buildings as complying uh, with the regulations. Might I uh, stress that the regulations against flammable cladding uh, have been around for uh, decades. Uh, but uh, some surveyors, some surveyors started to stretch the definition. Flammable cladding was allowed, as you know, for decorative purposes and for awnings. But mm. some surveyors started to stretch this uh, definition and started to apply it as cladding. And the and the private owners will have claims against uh, those uh, th those uh, architects and and uh, building surveyors. Who, who incorrectly certified their buildings as compliant uh, with the building regulations, which they clearly not, but the, it's not for the government to step in uh, and, uh, and, and to pay for that aberrant behaviour. That's the end of question time. Members today are received within the prescribed time. A letter from the leader of the National Party in the following term. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you there. I have some questions of the Minister for Water. Minister for Water. Um, I have uh, questions on notice 6512, 6500, 6509, 6513, 6499, 6502 uh, that were due on the 15th of November. Um, I'm wondering when I may receive those. Member for Cottesloe, I will get you answers to those questions as soon as I can. Thank you. Papers? Oh. Um, the following papers are presented for tabling. Statements of corporate intent for 2020-2021 for Development WA, Gold Corporation, Insurance Commission of Western Australia, Landgate and Western Australian Treasury Corporation. Papers tabled uh, today. Once again, I received within the prescribed time a letter from the leader of the National Party in the following terms. Dear Speaker, not Mr Speaker. I give notice so I move as a matter of public interest that this House calls on the McGowan Government to reassure West Australians of its preparedness to respond to the COVID-19 outbreaks appropriately while keeping key industry and businesses operating. The matter appears to be in order. And if there are at least five members who will stand in support of the matter being discussed, there's five, and the matter can proceed. Thank you. 
My sincere apologies for not <laughs> including okay, the, the appropriate uh, salutation. Try it again. Through no lack of respect. Acting. Oh no, Deputy Speaker. That'll do. How are you? <laughs> uh, I move that this House calls on the McGowan government to reassure West Australians that they are prepared to respond to COVID-19 outbreaks appropriately while keeping key industry and businesses operating. And I think uh, that this this is a very important issue that members, we've raised today. Excuse me, Member. Uh, members, could you please take the conversations outside, particularly those of you who are leaving? <laughs> oh, thank, you. thank you, Acting Speaker. Deputy Speaker. This is our last chance to uh, raise this matter before the parliament is prorogued and our last chance to determine whether we have the capability within the state government systems to uh, match the rhetoric that we hear from the Premier and uh, their ministers every day. It's our last, our last chance to really raise the concerns on two key matters that get raised with us on, regular, on a regular basis in uh, particularly regional Western Australia. The preparedness of the state government to respond to a COVID outbreak and how that will be managed in a regional context particularly given what we've seen happen over the course of the last weekend, and the impact of ongoing labour shortages on key regional sectors. Now, we asked a question in question time today of the Minister for Tourism. That is one of those sectors that we, uh, that we, we have great, grave concerns about. And the answer I got was, was it, it fell short, Deputy Speaker. Uh, there was a, a great deal of talk about talk, a great deal of talk about we understand, we can define the issue, but what I didn't hear was a solution. What I didn't hear was the efforts of this government to address the concerns of those key sectors that are keeping our state moving, tourism, agriculture, horticulture, our pastoral industry, uh, those that sit alongside the mining sector, uh, good, honest working people that are very concerned that they are not going to be able to meet their obligations. And we've got a couple of examples to raise today. They are the two things that I think this government needs to make sure when we leave this place and we don't have the chance to provide that scrutiny any further, that they have done everything and that they have a plan and that people in this state can be assured that if we see what happens in South Australia, happen here in Western Australia, that those people People living in regional WA are not going to be adversely impacted. And we raised this issue two weeks ago, two weeks ago in, specifically in relation to the health issues that we are, we are, we are uh, concerned about. Concerned about the fact that if we are in regional Western Australia and we see a COVID outbreak, how are we going to cope when we've already got a health system under, under pressure? How are we going to cope when uh, we saw people coming across the border, South Australia has an incident, we then see the border close back down again and uh, we, kick into, we kick into gear to respond. Now, I think uh, there's been an enormous amount of luck on behalf of how this has been managed coming forward. I'm not, I am not for one moment uh, saying that the Minister has not been working incredibly hard, but I think there has been a good and healthy dose of luck uh, for Western Australia not to have been exposed or have to deal with a, a serious incident to this, to this point. And, uh, and I think we all want our state to continue to be able to operate uh, without the restrictions we see over the borders. And so that's why this is the chance for the government to provide us with that reassurance. The reassurance that uh, we are looking for in relation to contact traces. I heard the minister talking this morning on the ABC uh, when asked about how many contact traces we have. I, I'm not sure that he could actually answer it specifically. Uh, and yet we know that the number that they're aiming for is 1,000. 1,000, but we haven't quite got there yet. Do we have enough if we are faced with uh, an incident that, or an outbreak in, in the course of the next couple of weeks, months, days? I don't know. Is there enough? Why has it taken so long for us to get to this point when we've had plenty of time, plenty of time in the run-up to the change in the border, to actually put this into play? Uh, and when you add that to the concerns we've raised previously around the record numbers of uh, men people with mental ill health um, uh, emerging on our doorsteps in the emergency departments, when you talk about the uh, ramping of uh, uh, ambulances at our hospitals, at the RFDS, having the, uh, the highest transfer fare rates that they've ever experienced, uh, where we see the stress on our emergency services volunteers in regional Western Australia, order to general reports that claim uh, that this government is uh, sort missing, uh, missing the plan on how to deal with elderly patients in, uh, in uh, aged care facilities uh, should there be a COVID outbreak. I think that's uh, rightly an issue that we are able to raise here and, and expect a response. Um, rightly, we also have the, uh, the, the, uh, the opportunity to walk in here and say uh, we are out in regional Western Australia talking to the businesses, talking to the businesses that the tourism minister tells us he's having the, the discussions with, talking to the businesses that the Minister for Agriculture continually tells us that she's talking to. But we see no action. I talked to uh, the owners of an abattoir uh, in the member for Rose 
uh, electorate the other day. And they have tried to take advantage of this failed uh, program that the government put in place, the work and wander out yonder. They have tried to employ up to 40 people. Not one of those people have stayed for more than two days. And they paid over tote, over odds, provided accommodation and actually transported those people out of Perth and down to uh, where they needed to work in the regions. The, that program is an, an absolute failure, but it continues to be the thing that the government points to and says, here's what we're doing. It's not working. We need something done to address the cliff face that is emerging or is already present in these key industries of agriculture, in these key industries of horticulture, in our pastoral sector and also in our tourism industry. They are two very, very important issues and uh, my colleagues have got specific issues relating to their electorates and I'll let them uh, let's flesh them out a little bit further as, uh, as we raise this on the last day that we have before we prorogue this parliament. Member for more. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to contribute to this excellent MPI, and it's very uh, important as this uh, parliament comes to an end that we raise again the importance of preparedness uh, for the COVID uh, situation throughout Western Australia and throughout country areas of Western Australia. This is, is apparent uh, that uh, the communities are greatly concerned uh, for their, their health and their, their safety. Now, as the leader of the party has outlined, uh, the minister uh, today, I think, was reported in the ABC as talking about the need to put the numbers of contact tracers, uh, people who are trained in, in following up on the COVID outbreaks and uh, finding who uh, might have been in contact with someone who may potentially be a carrier of the disease. Uh, they're pushing to have a thousand of these uh, people in place. Uh, 640 contact tracers have been trained or offered training. So 640 have been trained or offered training. How many are actually being trained? There's a big difference between being offered training and being trained. Now, this is the same answer that was reported in the Auditor General's uh, report, which was released back in September. The same numbers are quoted there. Apparently, there's been no progress made since the Auditor General's report, which I think was quoted in one of these discussions as being a vindication of the government. But the Auditor General is very careful to say that that is not an audit. That is simply a, res a response report uh, and is done at a lesser level than an audit would be. Uh, a quick and dirty look at what health's done, a desktop study uh, taking the assurances of the health department on face value. Now, back then they were told the same thing the minister has been saying today. So for the last six weeks at least, we've had no progress reported in this, uh, in this developing situation of contact tracing uh, workforce. Now, we know that the situation in Victoria highlights just how important it is to have in place good contact tracing. Uh, and uh, an excellent report on background briefing on the, on the weekend from uh, Rachel Brown, uh, Victoria's coronavirus restrictions lifting could be the first test of the revamped contact tracing system. It illustrates in that report just how much more difficult it is to do contact tracing when you are in a free-moving society. So Victoria's been in lockdown. It had trouble catching up with these cases after weeks and weeks and weeks of lockdown. Its systems will not necessarily cope in a situation where people are moving around freely. We have just opened up our borders. Six weeks ago, we had the same number of contract traces as we have now, six weeks ago. The borders are open. The borders are open. People are moving around in our electorates. We don't have any assurance that this government has actually trained even the 640 people that, uh, that are being quoted. They've been offered training. We know that when you start moving around from the Victorian reports and Victorian experience, that the, the job of contact tracing becomes so much more difficult. In order to do it properly, they're moving now to going to three rings of certainty. So that you go from no one contacts to people who have been in contact with the no one contact to people who may have been in contact with those people. That's how you can get on top of the disease, and you can only do that in a lockdown. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult when you've got people moving around. Do we have any assurance that a 1,000 is the right number? Do we have any assurance that these people are being trained in the appropriate way? We don't, because we've got the same answer being given now as six weeks ago. This government has become complacent. This government's been patting itself on the back about what's happened in Victoria and other places and saying, we're better than them. But we've been better than them because we are the most isolated community in the, in the world. We are very, very isolated and for us it's been relatively simple to shut the borders, control the small outbreaks that we had, and that's been our answer thus far. 
now we're open to the, to the country. Uh, now we've got people wandering out yonder from not only from Perth but from all over the country and there is no assurance that we have in place the contract tracing systems that will be necessary to get on top of an outbreak very quickly. The answer in South Australia has been to lock the state down again. It's going to be hard to lock the state down when we've got the, uh, the country areas full of tourists moving around who don't actually live there. If we shut down in that situation, we're going to have all sorts of uh, uh, problems in terms of uh, social welfare problems, in terms of people not being able to get service, uh, not being able to get food, not being able to get medical treatment because they're in an isolated area. And we need to actually get on top of this now. Uh, yes, uh, Member for Rowe. And can I just back up the, uh, the comments of the uh, Leader of the Nationals and the Member for Moore? I'm, I'm worried on two fronts, uh, Health Minister. This government should have been preparing since March. We've got the, the only tool in the toolbox that this government has got is shut the border. And we've seen that in the developing in the last few days. You've had six months to adapt and plan. We've had originally the smoke and mirrors from the Minister for Health back in uh, May the 2nd to the 7th, where he introduced figures from April saying how we've got the highest testing regime in Australia when it was actually the lowest. We've got six months, he's finally moved into wastewater testing. Six months, we now have finally uh, recognised we actually need more people for training and, tra and COVID tracing. So these, these are all the things that the chief scientist, Dr Alan Finkel, has pointed out in his federal government review as essential. And finally, finally, our health minister and the government is actually recognising that our people in our regional areas are the most susceptible. They need good communication, they need good aged care, and they need care for our frontline workers. So that, that's my worry. Um, the other worry that I've got is the shires and towns that are on the front line. And we've seen it in the last week. We've seen the Shire of Dundas. We've seen it on the ABC News, the Shire President there of Norseman. We've seen the Shire President of Esperance. They're out on the front line because when those people come through from South Australia, uh, down the highway, they're the towns that actually have to deal with it and adapt to it. So what we need, what we need from uh, this minister and our police and the like is more communication. We need better um, quarantine facilities, if you like. We've got the Shire of Esperance out there trying to set out the Newtown new Conning Up Football Oval for a quarantine centre and then told, no, no, that's, that's not what we need. Um, we're going to take over and do something else. So this is the communication that's required. The other thing that I worry about is our workers um, in tourism in Esperance especially. We've got that situation. Every time I go to Esperance on the ABC uh, radio, what are you doing about uh, worker accommodation? We're really worried we're not going to have a w enough workers in the tourism industry over this big summer coming up for Esperance. And that is a real concern for me. We're not getting any direction from the Minister for Tourism. We're not getting any direction from this government about accommodating workers and how we're going to deal with those shortages. And that, that, to me, is a real concern. The other one that the uh, Leader of the Nationals mentioned is our ag sector. Uh, in the electorate of Roe, I've got uh, Hillside uh, Abattoir in Narragin, and I've got Beaufort River Meats in uh, just uh, south of Beaufort River there. And they are really vital um, employment sources for my electorate. I'm really concerned that um, they've tried to do everything they can. And in actual fact, I've spent quite a bit of time trying to help them out with PPE as well, Minister. Um, and I have had, I must admit, some assistance from your department, so that's very much appreciated. But now we're having trouble for them sourcing workers. And this is the sort of field that our state government can really come to the fore. We've had the issues, obviously, with harvesting. Uh, shearing and the like, well, our farmers are just getting on with harvest. Uh, the, the Wander Out Yonder campaign has just not produced anyone of any substance. So our farmers, as usual, they've adapted. They're out there harvesting the crop and getting stuck into it. Um, shearing, we're running way behind there. We've had a few couple of shearing schools. Um, that's helped to a small extent but learner shearers take a long time to uh, bring it up to speed. So these are the issues that are developing uh, in, in my electorate of Roe. Um, I'm looking for that support. 
Minister, we can do better. One of the doctors in my region was sent a sandwich box with two masks in it. Now, that is not addressing PPE shortages. So these are the types of issues. I'm worried about our aged care, I'm worried about our health care system, and I'm worried about our frontline workers. Member for North West. Speaker, roll gold transparency. That's what the government, the Labor Party, when they came to government, said that they're going to be roll, have roll gold transparency. But yet we've got no transparency whatsoever with this McGowan, not Labor government, but McGowan government, because that's the way you're campaigning now. Take the Labor Party out of the campaign. There's no oversight, no oversight, and there's no inquiry, like every other state that's actually making sure that they're inquiring into COVID-19 to have best practice, to have roll gold transparency. There has been no risk analysis of your wander out yonder campaign. That, of course, people from Perth are going to wander out yonder because they can't wander anywhere else. Of course, of course it's going to be a successful campaign, something that regional WA has been advocating for forever and a day. It's a success because the borders are being closed. It's a success because no one can go overseas. But what's not a success is the lack of a risk analysis when we've got deaths occurring in regional WA. And we've seen that at Mount Augustus, where three, where three, where three people died. Three people died on Mount Augustus. Mount Augustus, because there has been no risk analysis. The, the, the health system where the, your volunteer ambulance service, who was stretched because it's normally the small business operator, is the volunteer or their worker struggling to fulfil the roles of having an ambulance service. Well, they're in Coal Bay, Exmouth, Sharp Bay, Cow Barry. But here we go. The health service, we can't even have a nurse at the nursing post if you're living queue. The traffic that's been going past, whether it's for the resource sector or tra uh, for tourism, they cannot even put a nurse there to protect those residents uh, uh, in the case of emergency or visitors. Absolutely no a risk analysis has occurred. But when it comes to the uh, Minister for Small Business and uh, Tourism, who says he's been to every regional town, Select few people were actually invited to sit down and talk to the minister. Select people. He selected the people that he wanted to be there. And what he got was, we need workers. We need workers. If we can get workers, we've got nowhere to house those workers. What are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? And he acknowledges that there's a problem. This is a test of the Labor government. No, sorry, the McGowan government is to fulfil those issues, those issues that are arising in regional WA. And you call yourself a regional party, but let me tell you, the North West knows that the Labor Party has left the North West well and truly out of their budgets, well and truly out of supporting uh, your volunteer ambulance services, well and truly not supporting the health system. God forbid. God help us if there was an outbreak of COVID-19 in regional WA, because a risk analysis that you haven't done is clearly leaving a gap in regional WA, a gap, a gap that will cost lives. And we've seen that because you haven't done the risk analysis of people who are going to regional WA. Three people, three people in a week and a half that died at Mount Augustus and still there has not been any changes in the practices of government not having someone based at Mount Augustus, based at Mount Augustus as a ranger to ensure that people are well prepared on going up the, uh, the largest monolith in, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. You need to wake up. There is no oversight. People will wake up after the March election, let me tell you, because the four years to the 2025 election is going to be the hell of an undoing uh, because people are going to wake up to your to your you should be you should be bottling COVID nineteen because if it wasn't for there you would probably wouldn't be there after March election so so we know the scaremongering and it's easy to have the rhetoric have the rhetoric of closed border control border it should be a smart border 
smart border, ensuring that we can get work pe uh, people coming out to work in Western Australia, into regional WA, people to be able to see their families, see their families. That's something that you've actually put to the wayside. Shame on the McGowan government because you've let down regional WA and shame on you. The question is, the motion you're going to get up? Be get up. agreed to. Minister for Health. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this, um, on, on this the most hapless of, of, um, of motions. But it's an important issue that covers around, around our preparedness of, of COVID-19. Um, I'm sorry that they've petered out after just a few minutes of debate, but, um, but maybe there'll be others that can, um, that can leap to their defence and try to provide a little bit of analysis, a little bit of a little bit of um, a, a little bit of commentary, but first, just to a couple of the points that were made, Ms. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and it's not surprising to hear the opposition once again running down the efforts of the West Australian people to keep Western Australians safe, to do all those things that made us all so proud of the people of Western Australia to make sure that we stay on top of this insidious disease. The, me the, the member for, for Central Wheatbelt calls it luck. The member for Moore says it's because we're isolated. Well, Deputy Speaker, you make your luck. You make your luck by, doing, by having good, sound policies that look after the health of Western Australians. Keep them safe so that then you can make sure that you have the opportunities to, to uh, continue to uh, expand your economy. And, these, and as the motion says, to keep indus key industries and businesses operating, which is what we have done. The member for Moore says it's simply because we're most isolated. Yet Western Australia has the largest number per capita of, of international people coming back to, to, um, to this country than any state in Australia. We, we bring more people back than, than Queensland, more than South Australia. Of course, Victoria doesn't bring anyone back. There's a few trickling in through the Northern Territory um, through, through Darwin. Of course, New South Wales takes the lion's share. We take over 1,000 people a week, and we are the ones that bring more people back to, to Australia than per capita than any other state in Australia. So we're not isolated. On the contrary, we are in the thick of the action of trying to make sure that we can bring Australians back to, back to Australia while at the same time keeping Western Australians safe. So to say that we are isolated, given that our biggest risk is from international arrivals, is quite frankly false, misleading and unsurprising coming from you, Mom. Unsurprising, because you have taken every opportunity to run down, to create negativity and, um, and fear in the community through your continued um, carping and criticising of what is a great achievement by the West Australian people. A great achievement by the Western Australian people. Now over seven months since we had community spread of this disease and we've continued to pe keep people safe. Whether it's, pe whether it's the risk elements associated with our airports, the risk elements associated with our, our maritime industry and, Deputy Speaker, we have now had over eight ships come in with COVID-19 without any uh, spread of the disease in the community. At some point, those opposite are going to have to actually concede that there's people out there doing a great job on behalf of the people of Western Australia in keeping them safe. But no, every day you come back in here and you say, oh, it's simply a matter of luck. It's a matter of time. We're not ready. The, the Department of Health isn't doing, isn't doing well enough. Why don't you just concede just for a moment, just for a moment, of the amazing work that's been done out there on behalf of, of the community, by the Department of Health, by the police, by all the other emergency services who are all doing an amazing job to keep Western Australians safe. Everyone in Western Australia is thanking them for their efforts. Everyone in Western Australia is saying thank you. We are really pleased with the situation we're in Western Australia, except for one group in the community, and that it's you opposite, the Liberals and the Nationals continue to, to detract. Now, because, Deputy Speaker, because we kept, in, kept on top of the health issues, made sure that we kept Western Australians safe, we have been able to keep our key industries going. Our oil and gas and mining industries continue to operate throughout this entire experience. 
and indeed, uh, Deputy Speaker, we actually had a situation where even though we relied so heavily on FIFO workers, uh, the McGowan government sat down with the mining industry and said, how can we make this work? How can we keep this, your, your industry going? How can we make sure that the wealth, the prosperity and the income that you bring to this state, how can we keep that going even though we are facing the, the, the threat of a global pandemic? And we worked through those issues, making sure we put Detect FIFO, a program of asymptomatic testing of all our FIFO workers, uh, uh, to, um, to make sure that we kept those industries operating. Tens upon tens of thousands of workers have now been tested on a regular basis to make sure we kept those industries moving, to make sure that we could continue to enjoy the wealth that that brings. And that's enabled our manufacturing industry to continue to operate as well. Whereas in across the world, and indeed in Australia, you see economies decimated, decimated as a result of COVID-19. In Western Australia, you see jobs back. You see families reunited. You see communities actually once again enjoying that quality of life that cohesive communities enjoy. That is something which is denied uh, com uh, societies right across the globe, Deputy Speaker. And just for once, just for once, we'd like to see a vote of thanks from those opposite to the great people in the Department of Health, to the great people in police, the great work that's being done by the people in tourism to make sure we keep our economy moving. Deputy Speaker, we've also done a, a range of, uh, of activities around uh, focusing on our agricultural workers. Because as you know, Deputy Speaker, as a result of COVID-19 pandemic and as a result of our borders, we've, we've had to... We've had to uh, uh, the, the access to backpackers, particularly international backpackers, hasn't been the same as it was. So, Deputy Speaker, we launched, um, we've worked closely with industry since March to deal with this issue. We launched our Work and Wander Out Yonder campaign, a $1.6 million campaign, and our Regional Travel Accommodation Support Scheme, which is a $3.1 million program, to encourage Western Australians to fill those labour shortages. And we're seeing successes. In phase one of the campaign, more than 50,000 people have visited the campaign websites and Work and Wander adverts on SEEK have had more than 90,000 views. We have connected more than 500 job seekers to employers uh, through uh, Studium, which is the online portal for agricultural workers. We have al almost 600 pre-registrations for our travel and accommodation incentive scheme. Between the 5th of October and 18th of November, 126 applications totalling $153,500 have been paid out to, of the Regional Travel and Accommodation Support Scheme, and a further 162 applications are currently being assessed. We had hoped the Federal Government would respond, Acting Speaker, Deputy Speaker, to our calls for further incentives for people on job seeker to work in agriculture. And while the Federal Budget did include some relocation assistance, uh, which we welcome, we would, we would not have seen any real action in, in, to incentivise those on job seeker into harvest jobs. Uh, De Deputy Speaker, we've done a, a lot around continuing to make to work with the Commonwealth Government to see if we can bring other international workers into Australia, such as from places like Vanuatu. We have a, a program of 300 seasonal workers from Vanuatu currently uh, quarantining in the Northern Territory and take out working opportunities there. We are looking forward to seeing them join our other um, agricultural labour uh, force to make sure that we. Um, that we uh, can, can access those workers. But, but at the end of the day, safety, safety is our number one priority. Safety is our number one priority. We've heard from you, from member for more, you call it luck. We call it hard work. We call it about a strong commitment to, to keeping people safe. And as a result of that, we have done just that. We have kept people safe and we've energised our, um, our, uh, our economy. Uh, Deputy Speaker, of course, there's still three important elements associated with, uh, with the, COVID, the fight against COVID-19. It's test, trace and isolate. And to date, we continue to test between 13 and 15,000 people every week. Uh, we continue to make sure that we, that we get as many people to go to our COVID clinics who are, who are symptomatic as possible to make sure that we have vigilant in relation to, um, to, the, to uh, any outbreak of the disease. And Deputy Speaker, with this week we've had uh, more people, as many people go to our COVID clinics as back in March. 
So we, we see that people have he heeded our call to say to make sure that they understand the importance of continuing to go to our COVID clinics. In addition to that, Deputy Speaker, uh, we, um, as part of our new controlled border arrangements, we had um, people fill out G2G passes, and as a result of that, um, and then the subsequent outbreak in South Australia, we were able to contact all those people who had come from South Australia to say, get yourself tested. They haven't done that in, in Queensland, Deputy Speaker. They haven't done that in Queensland because they don't know who they are. It's our control board of arrangements which have allowed us to be able to reach out to those South Australians and to say, get yourselves tested quick, smart, because there's been an outbreak from the state from, your, from which you've come. And that's enabled people to actually, um, that's enabled the WA government to keep on to keep on top of the situation. And we will continue to, um, to support uh, improvements in testing. And as I announced recently, we've committed half a million dollars to, to um, uh, uh, Avicenna systems uh, around piloting new technology, which will allow us to do a rapid uh, response, high scale testing of, of people um, into the future. So that potentially, Deputy Speaker, you can have a situation where uh, people uh, can be uh, tested upon arrival and then tested over the next few days so that we can continue to live. Open up the borders, as the member for North West Central uh, um, Coastal sorry, uh, said we should do, and of course we've already done, but he hasn't been here for quite a while, so he probably hasn't caught up. But, um, but as a result, sorry, Member for Dawsonville. Just So you weren't in Parliament, you're actually just in your electorate? Anyway, it's good to see you in the same room as the leader of the Nationals, um, and uh, I, I hope things work out for you. But, uh, Deputy Speaker, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, the, um, the new ways of testing will, take, will guide us into the future and make sure that we can continue to, um, to continue to have vigilance. Our wastewater testing regime is now on, on foot and that's an, that will be an important element as a, an extra part of our armory to make sure that we can, um, that make sure we can to maintain that level of, of um, that level of vigilance. Deputy Speaker, a number of the people have members spoken about have referred to our COVID-19 contact tracing. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I'm very pleased to say that recently Alan Finkel, as part of a national panel, um, said um, overwhelmingly Im the impression he was that was that wherever we looked, we saw excellence and commitment. Each jurisdiction runs its pandemic health response in its own way, but we are willing to share and to learn. And Deputy Speaker, a number of the members um, were, drew attention to the great work of our contact tracers, and they're doing contact tracing for South Australia as we speak. We have 50 full-time uh, contact tracers at any point in time. We have uh, approximately another 640 staff who are part of or are on our surge register, Deputy Speaker, and we plan to have 750 FTE, around about a thousand staff, as part of our surge capacity. That will enable us to uh, contact trace um, essentially 440 cases a day. So we have more than, our, more than our need in relation to the capacity of our contact tracing. As I said, we are doing some of the heavy lifting now, helping out South Australia with contact tracing. And finally, Deputy Speaker, our isolation. Um, not only has Alan Finkel given us the big tick around our contact tracing, but, um, but Jane Holton, former secretary to the De Commonwealth Department of Health, has said our, our, um, our uh, hotels are up to scratch. The only criticism she had about our hotels is that they were perhaps a bit harsh because we don't let people out to, to have a smoke or get some open, open air. Our, our hotels are, water are airtight. They are an important element of making sure that we can stay on top of the COVID-19 risks. And as the, the, the Premier has often said, uh, um, uh, uh, our international rivals are our biggest risk factor at the moment, and our hotels despite the fact that they have been operating since March this year, have not had any adverse outcomes in relation to the disease escaping from those hotels. And we continue to learn. We continue to learn and review our, learn from other states and review our, our processes, which is reason why this week we're bringing in mandatory uh, testing for our high-risk employees at our hotels to make sure that we can continue to make sure that our hotels 
uh, are producing the work they do. There's two other important uh, 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 pieces of information I'd like to impart on the Chamber Deputy Speaker. One is about personal protection equipment. Member for Rowe, uh, the, the doctor you referred to is what's known as a general practitioner. General practitioners come under the, 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 uh, the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth Government. It's the Commonwealth Government's responsibility to bring uh, to to provide uh, extra support to the GPs in relation to PPE. Uh, but we are continuing to work with WAFA to make sure that they do have the, the supplies they need. We have supplies uh, in Western Australia now to make sure we can protect our, our frontline workers and they can protect their patients. And in addition to that, Deputy Speaker, we'll soon be beginning fit testing, which is um, obviously a request from the health unions to make sure that they have the um, support that they need to. Um, uh, in relation to that. Deputy Speaker, not one healthcare worker in Western Australia has caught COVID-19 in a clinical environment. Not one healthcare worker. And that includes all those people who are in the Joondal Up Hospital during the Artania crisis. That is how good we are. That is how good our doctors and nurses are. And our infection control is second to none. But we haven't seen any acknowledgement from the other side in relation to that, Deputy Speaker. And finally, Deputy Speaker, we'll soon be introducing um, a new con uh, contact registers for all our venues, uh, uh, including the opportunity for them to access a digital version of that. That is um, software which is continuing to be, um, to be worked up and will continue to make sure that they have, the, um, that they have a, an easy to access way of, of ensuring that they can trace, that we can properly trace those people have been to their venue in the event we do get an outbreak. And Deputy Speaker, it's obviously a, a real possibility that there's an outbreak. People experience that everywhere. What is important is not so much as, uh, an outbreak as how we respond to it. And I'm really pleased that the Minister for, is it under tourism or um, small, business. small business, is holding a consultation session this afternoon, again working with the industry around the introduction of the mandatory arrangements of those on the 28th of November to ensure that we're ready to go. Everywhere we look, Deputy Speaker, we see uh, members of, the, of this government working with industry, working with stakeholders, working with, with the community to make sure that we continue to be vigilant and ready in relation to COVID-19. This is great work that's going on. It's continued to keep our key industries open, such as our resources industry, such as our transport and logistics industry, such as our agriculture industry. Our tourism industry is now enjoying times never seen before. And that's because uh, of that the, the, the McGowan government has looked after everyone's um, health, and as a result of that, everyone is looking after each other in bringing the economy back to life. The member for um, so, and finally, uh, Deputy Speaker, the member for North West Central said that we're not being transparent enough. We've put all our processes up for national review, whether it's the Halton review, whether it's the Finkel review, whether it's um, our own analysis by the Auditor General or by our, our panel, which is, um, goes and looks at our preparedness. We are ready to go and we continue to improve our processes. Um, people recognise that, Deputy Speaker. People all around the community recognise what a great job we have done as a community to get this under control. And everyone recognises that. Everyone except a very small group in the community, Deputy Speaker. A very small group in the, in the community. And that's all those opposite. And just for once, we wish you'd take a leaf out of the opposition, uh, out, of the, out of the leader of the opposition in South Australia's book and actually come on board and help us continue to, to play a constructive role, not this carping, undermining and criticising which we see from you all the time. Western Australia is the envy of the world in relation to how it's got COVID-19 under control and how it's brought jobs back into the workplace, how it's brought communities back. And we continue to work with industry. And, and um, I, I should just add, Deputy Speaker, we'll soon have a forum with um, church groups and other cultural groups about how we can continue to improve their capacity, um, again, utilising the contact tracing uh, principles. So, Deputy Speaker, um, I think we've got lots to be proud of, lots to be proud of as a community. Um, I wish the others would, on the other side would be equally proud. But in a, but in, 
but in the spirit of that, that pride, Deputy Speaker, I move to delete all words after House and insert acknowledges the McGowan government's efforts in responding to COVID-19 to keep Western Australia safe and strong. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Question is the amendment. The words to be deleted be deleted. All those in favour? Aye. 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 All those against? No. no. I think the ayes have it. Division call. Was that it? No. Did I hear a division? No, no. Oh, my apologies. I thought I heard a voice. Um, the ayes have it. Thank you. Um, second question, members, is the words to be inserted be inserted? What words? I don't think so. I think, the I think that the question is a motion as amended be agreed. Uh, I wish to speak to Go the Go ahead, motion. Member for Dawesville. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. I appreciate um, some of the contributions that have been made by the National Party here today in moving uh, the original motion that was to call on the McGowan government to reassure West Australians of its preparedness to respond to COVID-19 outbreaks appropriately while keeping key industry and businesses operating. I think it's an important motion that was moved and reflects the con growing concern in the community who are nervous about what the future holds. And certainly in the case of my district, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I did a survey recently, um, some weeks ago now, and had hundreds of people respond. And what was obvious to there is that more than half of the respondents indicated that they were more concerned now about what their future holds than they were uh, prior to COVID-19 hitting. We know that this is a concern right throughout our community. And it's no wonder. When the Premier yesterday or the day before in question time was urging people not to undertake panic shop, panic buying, I think, that we saw hit a couple of suburban, uh, in my case of what I saw in the, on Twitter, some suburban Coles outlets, where people were once again struck with the fear of what had happened in South Australia. If people were confident in what had happened uh, across in our state, I don't know if we would see that same level of panic buying. And join with the Premier in making sure that people feel calm and safe here in Western Australia and don't need to undertake uh, that type of level of activity in our state shops anymore. It's not a necessary uh, undertaking to go through and try and, you know, make sure they have months' worth of toilet paper and the like. But the, the reality is that there is, we have to understand there is a need in the community to be reassured of this, and that is all that this motion is calling for. There is a level of reassurance that is required in our community because, of course, in this ever-changing environment, people are genuinely quite worried about what their future beholds. And the Minister of Health uh, has, at a number of times, uh, said in this place that those opposite have never congratulated the government. I'll do that now. The, congratulations to the state government on making sure that we have kept Western Australia uh, safe, together with the National Cabinet, from COVID-19. I think that is worth, worth repeating time and again, because, of course, Deputy Speaker, everyone in this chamber is on Team Western Australia. Had the government, had the government not been successful, uh, people would have died uh, at, at an alarming rate. That's what we've seen in other jurisdictions. Everyone here wanted to make sure we could continue to work with the government. That is why we've supported urgent pieces of legislation, more than a dozen, through this place in an expeditious fashion to make sure new laws could be introduced to help protect Western Australians. Done so in a matter of days with the uni unity ticket of the Liberal and the National Party. Now, the, the Speaker yesterday, the Speaker yesterday, well, one of many, I'm sure, one of many, I'm sure, Member for Rowe, that might come in the next 114 days, but the idea, the idea of what we saw yesterday in the report table by the Speaker as part of the Privileges Committee, the Parliament was the only continual Parliament of Western Australia was the only Parliament that continued to operate without an alteration to its scheduled sitting. And that is because members of both the Liberal and National Party continued to support the government in the legislative agenda that it was trying to pursue to protect Western Australians. We stand uh, absolutely ready to support the government however we can and have done so and will continue to do so. The reality is, if you listen to the no do doctors and nurses and people in the community, there is a need for reassurance. Doctors and nurses, for example, want to know when fit testing for N95 and P2 masks will commence. We are still some time away from that happening, Deputy Speaker, when it has been undertaken in every other state and territory in the country. There's a need to understand when QR codes will be implemented for uh, venue check-ins, something that has operated in New South Wales now for a number of months and if not in other jurisdictions as well. There's a need to undertake sewer testing so we can, uh, so we can get a better understanding of whether or not COVID-19 is running through a town or parts of Perth in, in our city. 
Uh, that is something that has been occurring in every other jurisdiction yet, still not in, yeah, still not in Western Australia. The idea that we can make sure that our hotel quarantine system has been reviewed, a review that is welcome, but there is still a level of concern in the community. That is not uh, a reflection of anything else other than people's fears that they need to be reassured that there is uh, a government that is in control and the health department is ready, because there are people out there, the doctors and nurses most recently, who are worried about the lack of PPE, who are worried about the processes when it comes to the fit testing of their masks, for example. And when people look to other, national, and other uh, jurisdictions in our country, Deputy Speaker, they see that there are measures undertaken to protect those citizens there that aren't being undertaken here. Sure. When the government seeks to do that, we'll support it. We'll support and back in the health advice every single day of the week to help keep West Australians safe. We'll support, as a Liberal Party, any measure the government wants to undertake to make sure that we keep Western Australia COVID free, because the Liberal Party and the National Party are part of Team WA, and we want to make sure that West Australians are kept safe today and safe tomorrow and safe for the future. Your continual politicisation of this from the government only seeks to try and divide the community at a time when it needs unity most, and we stand united with the government to keep West Australians safe. Yes, Member for Darling Range. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to uh, just back up the comments by my uh, good colleague, the Member for Dawesville, and also the motion moved by the National Party, and congratulate them on uh, this motion. What I'm actually perplexed about is why the government would even want to amend the motion. Um, that the House calls on the McGowan government to reassure West Australians of its preparedness to respond to COVID-19 outbreaks appropriately while keeping key industry and businesses operating. Why would the government be against that? Why would the government be against this motion? It actually makes no sense whatsoever. But no, let's politicise, exactly, Member for Dawesville, let's politicise COVID-19, which they keep saying they're not doing. But no, instead of standing up and saying, you're right, the National Party, you're right, opposition, this is what we're doing and this is our plan, they stand up and they amend the motion. Why do they amend the motion? Because they actually do not have a plan. They are not prepared. They have sat on their laurels and all they've done is they've expected handouts and fix-ups from the federal Liberal government every single time. And the Deputy uh, Premier, even in his response to this motion, said, we're disappointed because we asked for more help from the federal government and they didn't deliver it. How much more do you want from the federal government? You're getting handouts left, right and centre, yet you have no plan. So here we have, here we have right now the heavy lifting being done by the Liberal federal government and the heavy lifting being done by our small business community because this government is absent, absolutely absent in supporting. There are two ways you fight a pandemic. One is health, two is economics. Now you have just shut the borders, got your head in the sand, thinking if we just don't look up and look out and see what's going on, everything will be dandy. Well, it's not going to be dandy if you don't have a plan to back up your biggest employers. Now, unemployment, you've all stood here the last two days uh, pleased as punch, pounding your chest that you're proud about your unemployment figures. Well, you tell Western Australians that you're proud that there's 96,200 people in Western Australia right now without jobs. 96,200 people without jobs. We've got 29,900 youth unemployed. You go tell the mum and dads that their kids don't have a job, but you're proud of it. You're proud that there's 123,300 people right now in WA underemployed. And why are they underemployed? Why are they underemployed? Because you have done nothing to support small business. You have done nothing to help the sector that is the biggest employer in Western Australia. You have you've sat on your laurels while you're collecting a GST income of $3.8 billion this year, an iron ore royalty income of $7.4 billion for the year, the Bell Group settlement $665 million this year. And what have you done? Sat there with all that money in your pocket with your surplus of $1.2 billion, please just punch, smiling away, going, aren't we clever, while we have over 96,000 people looking for work. We have people who cannot pay their bills because of your increases on power, your increases on water, your increases on car registration. We have people in mortgage stress, but you sit there with your pile of money like the king in his counting house, counting all his money, looking down at the poor people in West Australia who can't afford your power bills, who can't afford your water bills, who can't afford your car registration. 
And you sit there going, haven't we done a great job? Well, Premier, you've not done a good job on making sure those 96,000 people have got a chance of getting a job. You have not done a good job on making sure our youth have got a chance of getting a job. So please, start making a plan. The federal government have tried to put it at bay. They've put in uh, their JobKeeper and their job seeker allowance. But where's your plan when that JobKeeper falls away in March to keep those businesses open? The businesses have put everything on the line. They've hopped themselves up to the hilt to make sure they can keep their door open. And what have you done to support them? Nothing. Every other state has supported their small business sector except this state. You should all hang your head in shame and do not go out there beating your chest that you've done a great job in creating jobs because you haven't. You have failed the West Australian people in creating jobs. You've failed our small business community and you've actually failed on being prepared on what we're going to do in COVID-19. And the fact that you come in here and instead of just simply being bipartisan and saying we agree we're going to have a plan and we will reassure West Australians that we will get them out right. of this. Yeah. Members, the question is the words to be inserted be inserted. I do have to move that. So all those in favour, aye. Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll move the motion. You can speak to it in a minute. Um, all those against, no. I think the ayes. <coughs> So, um, hang on. So, at the beginning of this, I said the words to be deleted be deleted. I then yes. have to get this bit inserted, and then we move that. We, you can speak on it if you want to, and I'll move it all at the end, member. I was just trying to clarify things, but okay. go ahead. Now, what are we seeking to insert? That we acknowledge the McGowan government's efforts in responding to COVID-19 to keep Western Australia safe and strong. That's what we're asking that we take a bipartisan approach to acknowledge the efforts undertaken by the McGowan government to keep the state safe and strong. I know it is beyond the Liberal and National Party to look at this COVID pandemic in a non-party political way, because every time... Member for more. Every time, every time we sit in this place the opposition want to play politics with a pandemic. And that's again demonstrated today. That's again what they've demonstrated today. Again and again and again. Again and again and again. I mean, the comments made by the member for Darling Range that the bell money we pocketed and we haven't done anything for electricity users, well, we gave $600 to every household from that bell litigation money. The idea, you have the National Party... I didn't need to interject, Madam Deputy Speaker. Quite so, Member. Go ahead, Minister. So we have cut the fees of training courses. We've got more training courses ever before targeted at young people to get them in the jobs, to get them in the jobs. The National Party said, what are we doing? We want to train Western Australians, Members. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do train Western Australians to work in our um, small businesses and throughout Western Australia. That's what we're trying to do. Now, I don't know if, you, if there was an easy solution to, in relation to workers in WA and workers across the nation, someone would have thought of it already. It is a challenge to, to grow an economy during a pandemic. It is a challenge. And we're doing all we can to support businesses. We've got the Minister for Agriculture looking at the agricultural worker situation. We're undertaking new training courses, targeting young people to get jobs in our industries, more than any other state, more than any other state. The comments by the opposition, by the Liberal Party and National Party, showing that all they want to do is come in and attack the government all along the way. And I note, I note today, today the member for Dorsville, who's currently not here, but I'll quote some of the words that he said in this chamber just a few, I think just a few months ago. The Premier needs to harden up. I didn't realise we elected a princess in 2017. <laughs> and he went and called him um, a comment in relation to, oh, I'll, you know, in relation to being slimy. And that was replayed on the TV that night. And I tell you what, 
I've rich. never. Member for North West. You're rich being this place, mate. You're rich. Member for North West and member for Wanneroo. That's not helpful. The minister is on her feet. The member for Dawes will make made those comments. And one of those things Sit where down. unprompted people Sit came down. up to me and said, I can't believe what that person called the Premier. Called the Premier. And let's go. I know the member for North West Central continues to bully and abuse. Oh. <laughs> Members, thank you, Premier. Please take your seats. Member for the North West, you will not interject. It's been asked several times. And I note the member for West Swan did not interject on any member's opposite, and I asked the member for North West Central to desist. That's exactly, the Premier. Premier, that's exactly what I've just asked. Would you like to ask point of order? The, the member for West Swan is casting aspersions on the member. No, I'm sorry. And no. Where, no. It's okay to cast no. Everyone else. No. If you want to stay in this house, take your seat. Member for Darling Range, what would you like to add to this? Border, um, the Premier accused the uh, member for North West of bullying, which is totally inaccurate. In this House, we have robust conversations, and I'd ask him to withdraw. Member, the Premier raised a point of order, and I have said that's not a point of order, and we are moving ahead with this discussion, please. Go ahead. Minister. They, don't, they want to avoid what they've said in the past. That's, in, that's the issue of the Liberal <laughs> National Party. Now, of course, they oppose the hard border again, again and again. And as a result, again and again and again on TV, we saw the Leader of the Opposition. Um, so, Jacob Kagi, if you were a Premier, would you re reopen the interstate border now, the Leader of the Opposition? I would. Um, the Leader of the Opposition. There doesn't appear to be a valid reason to keep the interstate borders closed. Um, the Leader of the Opposition. The Premier needs to show us the advice that there's a constitutional issue because it clearly isn't. The Leader of the Opposition. It's politically expedient to maintain the hard borders. You had the Leader of the Opposition, the Liberal Party, supporting Clive Palmer every step of the way on this issue. Every step of the way. The Liberal Party together with Clive Palmer. The Leader of the Opposition. I think the Premier is blocking Clive Palmer and it's political. Why is he blocking Clive Palmer, said the Leader of the Opposition. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Member, I call you for the first time and you will take that back. Okay. But she's misleading Parliament. Point of order. Point of order, Madam Speaker. There you, is a request is for a withdrawal. You are simply to withdraw. Quite correct. I withdrew. That's quite correct. Uh, she Leader of the House. Member for Darling Range, you, I'll call you for a second time. I withdraw. Third time, I'm sorry. You're on your. You're already on three calls. Then, member, I think you need to take a break. Thank you. For the rest of the day. Oh, good. There you go. Cool. Oh, member for Darling Range. Enough. Stop pointing fingers. It's not primary school. Member for Darling Range, you are on your way out. Thank you. Thank you. Minister for Transport. Continue. So I'll keep quoting the Leader of the Opposition on her comments in relation to Clive Palmer. I'll let Clive. Yes, Member for Dawesville. Yes, darling, right. Well, usually she has been usually called a... four times. Sure, I'm I injecting that. her. Just, usually there is a, a procedure to read from the speaker to eject Would you member. Give me the words. I can't hear the white noise in the background here. It's coming here all over. I don't quite like remember. <laughs> I'm just waiting to get the correct words, if you would like me to use sure the correct right. words, but I think the member for Darling Range understands. <laughs> member for Wanneroo, you'll be out too in a minute. Get Please, it. Call it order. enough. <laughs> she has you I think I've said this once before, and the member for Darling Range does understand what has happened. She's been on four calls, actually five, and I've asked her to suspend her from the House for the rest of the day. All right? Now, can we? And member for Wanneroo, you'll be close on her heels, crayfish or not. Mem, mem, a minister for transport. Now, now, I know the Liberal Party don't like to remember just how close they were with Clive Palmer. They don't want to be reminded that they were there standing next to Clive Palmer all the way, all the way. That they wanted to bring down the hard border. They wanted to bring the hard border down again and again and again. 
and they were with Clive Palmer. So they stood with Clive Palmer and let the leader of the opposition. I'll let Clive Palmer do what Clive Palmer does best. He's got very deep pockets. He's probably one of the few people that can fund the challenge that he's funding. So there we had the Liberal Party siding with Clive Palmer against WA, against WA. And members, I don't know what parallel universe you're living in. I don't know what parallel universe you're living in. I don't know who you're talking to. But the feedback that we get around the state, yes, people are always cautious. Of course, handling a pandemic is a challenging, a challenging situation. It's constant. It's constant. And the thousands of people, the police, the, those working in the health system across the public service are doing their best to keep Western Australians safe. And the idea that you come in here all the time and try and play cheap politics with it, angry that somehow that the government's getting credit. What our job was to do was to protect Western Australians. We'll continue to do that. And your cheap political scoring, your, try, your attempt to score cheap political points has won you no favour, members. And you think you'd learn, but again, you have learnt nothing. And I know you've seen the polling, and I know that that polling is completely disastrous. Uh, Premier. Speaker, uh, can I just conclude the debate? I just want to uh, pass on uh, my Thanks and regards to all the people who have um, accepted the rules and the advice uh, across Western Australia over the course of this year uh, and done the right thing, and that's uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of West Australians uh, who have behaved with dignity and understanding uh, during a difficult uh, time. Uh, we obviously have been through a stressful period. You've seen what's happened in other countries around the world. You've seen what's happened in other states. Uh, we have been a uh, beacon, I think, uh, of understanding and acceptance of uh, rules uh, and uh, restrictions uh, that other places uh, could have learnt from. Uh, I'd also like to pass on my thanks to all the people who have made it work. Uh, that is the police on the borders, uh, the, uh, the officers of other government departments on the borders, the police at the airports, uh, the uh, other officers at the airports. Uh, the staff in the uh, hospitals, uh, nursing and other uh, health, medical, other ancillary staff, the ADF that has assisted us along the way, uh, all of those people uh, over the course of this period. I can also thank the senior management in the public sector who have uh, made sure that these uh, issues have been dealt with uh, uh, very expeditiously. And, uh, even, and I want to make particular thanks of our legal uh, officers, uh, both the Solicitor General and State Solicitor and uh, their staff, who have drafted away directions and uh, laws uh, very, very quickly and very effectively uh, that have uh, made sure the entire system has worked uh, very well, often at extremely short notice. I'd like to thank the Parliamentary Council's office who have done that as well, passed laws, uh, drafted laws overnight uh, that we've needed to pass uh, through this House. They've all been absolutely uh, terrific uh, over the course of this year. The Solicitor General and the State Solicitor, of course, have had to manage some pretty serious uh, court cases over the course of this time, had to go east and then come back and quarantine uh, in the service of the state. Uh, I'd like to thank them uh, for that. The COVID coordinator, Sharon O'Neill, the police commissioner uh, as well, the Director General of Health, the Chief Health Officer, uh, the, head of, uh, the acting head of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, uh, all of these people have uh, done a marvellous job uh, on behalf uh, of Western Australia. It just shows to me, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, and Western Australia is my adopted state, uh, but it does show, it does show to me uh, that people here are very, very committed, very committed to the service of the state. Uh, I'd like to thank them all uh, for their work over the course of this year. Uh, the future, we don't know what it holds, uh, but uh, certainly uh, we'll do our best, our absolute best, to keep the virus out of Western Australia and to keep uh, our people healthy and safe, uh, to keep the state safe and strong. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think uh, as long as we continue on our current uh, trajectory and our current pathway, uh, our state will uh, continue to do extremely well. Uh, and certainly uh, I'd like to thank my ministers and uh, the government, the caucus, uh, for being understanding and supportive over this period uh, and for working incredibly hard, incredibly hard. Uh, it has been a period of great uh, turmoil and turmoil, uh, but the ministers, in particular uh, the health minister, has done a marvellous job every single day over an extremely stressful period. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, who's made the entire system work on behalf of everyone across this state. Members, uh, there are two questions. The first is that the words to be inserted be inserted. All those in favour, aye. aye. All those against, no. I think, 
I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question on the motion, members, is that the motion as amended be agreed to. All those in favour, aye. aye. All those against, no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you, members. Uh, Leader of the House. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I move that uh, order of the day, uh, uh, order of the day number one, be resumed. Yes, members, the question is the motion be agreed to. All those in favour, aye. aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. And Government Business, order of the day number one, appropriation recurrent 2017-18 supplementary bill 2018 and appropriation capital 2017-18 supplementary bill 2018 second reading adjourned debate. Member for Bunbury. Of my contribution. <laughs> And uh, it's very appropriate that we've been it. talking about COVID-19 because up front I want to acknowledge the community of Bunbury and Dalyallop for the way they have responded to the pandemic right through this year. They have done everything that has been asked of them. I especially thank the volunteers who supported those who are most vulnerable and the many businesses that supported their workers that chose, that had to close, had to adapt and had to reopen. But at the right through that period did their best to maintain people in work. And uh, I acknowledge that the member for Dawesville thanked the government for keeping the state safe. But of course he neglected to mention that we're also keeping the state strong and that we have a very strong commitment based on the work of the best treasurer in Australia who has put us into a great financial position, a great financial position to give us the power to actually make sure that we can keep the economy strong, keep people in jobs for the future and provide the certainty, the stability that this state needs so much during the most challenging period that we have ever faced. Now I know that certainly in my community we have got a strong approach to economic recovery and supporting our community into the future. It is about a safe community and a strong community. And we have, um, I want to actually go through this for the benefit of members. This is just in the southwest region alone. And if we take into account the efforts of this government, the McGowan Labor government, right across Western Australia, it is a mammoth $5.5 billion economic recovery plan. And once again, once again, I say that it's down to the fantastic work of the Treasurer and his team in Treasury and the discipline of this cabinet that has put us into that, that position. Now, 252.3 million will be invested as part of the Southwest Recovery Plan, and that is on top of the enormous contribution this government has made as a legacy to the Southwest in terms of its core infrastructure, such as the Outer Ring Road, such as a Bustle Highway, such as the redevelopment of many schools in my electorate. Uh, of that 252.3, and I'm going to talk a little bit that outside of my electorate, it's across the whole of the Southwest. Uh, residents will also benefit, on top of that 252, from $32 million to expand the lower fees local skills program, significantly reducing TAFE fees across 39 high priority courses. That is about the future. That is about training uh, young people, training people who need to change their jobs, providing new career opportunities. That's the sort of investment this government makes for the future. 15 million to the Australian Senior High School for new classrooms. 6.27 million to the Margaret River Senior High School. How many times have I sat in this chamber and listened to the members opposite saying we only look after our own electorates? These are not our electorates. These are the people of the Southwest. 3.1 million to the Bunbury Senior High School for upgrades to performing arts, specialist classrooms and the indoor sports hall. 2.5 million to the Kingston Primary School, the member for Murray Wellington, the great member for Murray Wellington sitting over there in this chamber week after week looking after her electorate. 1.2 million to the Harvey Senior High School, again Murray Wellington, $25 million for free TAFE short courses. Right across our region, 4.8 million for the apprenticeship and traineeship re-engagement incentive program that em provides employers with a one-off payment for six of $6,000 for hiring a trainee whose training contract was terminated on or before or after March 1st, 2020. A revamped by local policy. That's what businesses in my electorate have been looking for. An absolute commitment through our West Australian participation plans to local contracting. 
38 million of additional funding towards the Bunbury Hospital redevelopment, long neglected under the previous government, making it a $60.8 million total investment with priority areas on clinical areas. $8 million to build the new Dalyalup multi-purpose community youth centre. $5 million to rebuild hands over. Thank you very much, Minister for Sport. Great contribution there. Six million to the Donnybrook and District Sporting and Recreation Precinct. Donnybrook long overlooked by the previous government. Long overlooked. Shame. 11.9 million towards the Bunbury Water Resource Recovery Scheme. What a great project. Bringing recycled water into green, the Bunbury Dal Yallop areas. Great project. Seven million to upgrade level crossings on the southwest train line in Cookinup. Remember for uh, Murray Wellington, I know you've been working hard on that. Coolup and Waruna, helping to ensure the efficiency of the train line into the future and providing a much needed safety upgrade for locals. Fast tracking the $852 million Bunbury Outer Ring Road with construction expected to begin three months early. How many times have the members opposite said we don't get progress? Projects off the ground, and here we've got the hard-working Minister for Transport on the job day in, day out. I've seen her come into this place with the safety boots on. We know exactly what this government's about. 15 million through the Regional Road Safety Programme to upgrade 240 kilometres of southwest roads, and the list goes on. 1.5 million for upgrades and maintenance at Collie Police Station. 1 million for upgrades and maintenance at Donnybrook Police Station. 690,000 for upgrades at Augusta Volunteer Fire and Rescue. 230,000 for upgrades at the Boyer Brook Volunteer Fire and Rescue. 15,000 for upgrades at the Allenson Bushfire Brigade Rescue, a very hard working group there. 44,000 for upgrades at Wellington Mills Bushfire Brigade Station. 2 million to provide water tanks to volunteer bushfire brigades across WA. 80 million for targeted maintenance programs for regional social and government workers housing. Approximately 200 homes in the southwest region. 141.7 million to refurbish social housing across WA's ageing housing stock with houses in the southwest set to benefit and 6 million for installation of roof rooftop solar PV on social housing including properties in the southwest these are significant investments and then we've got the 1.19 million for Bibbleman track upgrades and Mundabidi track upgrades 1.5 million for the Wellington Dam mural and I've seen the cars lining up to see it seen them lining up down there 3.08 to fast track the third and final stage of the Margaret River Main Street development pro project that includes a festival precinct, safer in sections, outdoor seating, helping Margaret River to become the true tourism destination that it is. 775,000 to expand and upgrade the car park and provide new facilities at Redgate Beach. Not a Labour electorate, I might add, but we're right there for the people of Western Australia. 411,000 for the development of the Blackwood River foreshore. Oh, I'm starting to get a sore throat reading out all of these, um, these projects. 231,000 for the Bridgetown Hall and Civic Centre. 50,000 to replace a jetty on the Don Inley River in Manjimup. 450,000 for Pemberton attraction projects. 40,000 for mountain bike trails, 15.5 million for the Bunbury Port in the Harbour Access Road and Bridge, 3 million for upgrades at Bunbury Port, 3.8 million for a feasibility study to look at new infrastructure at the Port of Bunbury and Quinana, which includes planning, uh, 7.5 million towards the Kemerton Strategic Industrial Area for waterworks, $600,000 towards a business case for new industry at Collie, and $6 million towards continuation of the food industry project program, including programs through the premium food centre in management. That is about a strong economy. That is about jobs. That is about training. More importantly, it is about diversity for the economy. The South West has probably got one of the most diverse regional economies in the world. And in, sorry, in, in Australia, but certainly as a regional economy, it would be right up there uh, internationally. It has strong export links. It's got a great future thanks to the investment of the McGowan Labor government. And I want to acknowledge uh, Mick Murray, who's leaving, great member for Collie Preston, great support for me, great support for the member for Murray Wellington. Well done, Mick. You've left a real legacy. Uh, I thank all of the people who've. Um, supported us as Team Labour down in the South West, and I certainly thank the Premier, I thank all of the Cabinet Ministers uh, for their commitment not only to the safety and strength and the future of Western Australia, but their absolute commitment, their absolute commitment to regional Western Australia and to making sure that Western Australia as a state prospers, prospers in the new world of dealing with COVID-19. Thank you, Treasurer. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Ministers. Members, the question is the...
Bill be read a second time. Ah, hello, Treasurer. Go ahead. Yeah, for this, um, I never thought that this Speaker. bill would actually make it through. It's passage in the lower house, just to come back again next year. Um, with the no doubt proroguing the prorogation of the parliament will mean that uh, we have to deal with this all over again. Um, and there are actually a range of appropriation supplementary bills to deal with. Um, there was a bit of a backlog, actually, and hopefully, in due course, the um, amendments to the Financial Management Act might provide us with an alternative way of dealing with, um, of dealing with these bills so they don't clog up the parliamentary system. Uh, but nonetheless, I thank all, all my colleagues for their contributions, and I'm delighted uh, that this will be my last bill uh, passed in the parliament, and it's a very significant bill, and I think everyone appreciates the significance uh, of this acknowledging money that was spent in the, in the financial year 17-18. Uh, so can I thank all my colleagues and uh, we've just got to deal with, because it's a cognate debate, recurrent capital, we've just got to deal with a couple of things. So um, uh, again, uh, just reading the notes that the, uh, obviously the staff, the parliamentary staff, as I referred to last night, the only people who know the arcane rules in this place, um, I think I just need to conclude and then you thank okay. So Madam Speaker, thank you very much and I thank all my colleagues for their very important contributions to this bill. Inspirational, thank you. The question, members, is that the appropriation recurrent 1718 supplementary bill 2018 be read a second time. All those in favour, aye. aye. All those against, no. I think the ayes have it, members, the ayes have it. A bill for an act to appropriate out of the consolidated account a sum for recurrent payments made during the year end of 30 June 2018 under the authority of the Financial Management Act 2006. Members, is leave granted to proceed forthwith to the third reading? Yes. Leave is granted. Treasurer. Speaker, I move that the appropriation current 2017-18 supplementary bill 2018 be now read a third time. Thank you, uh, Treasurer. The question is the bill be read a third time. All those in favour, aye. aye. All those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to appropriate out of the consolidated account Thanks, a sum for recurrent payments made during the year ended 30 June 2018 under the authority of the Financial Management Act 2006. The Leader of the House. Oh, hang on. No, no, no. I've got the cap. Sorry. Orders of no. the day. Orders of the day number one, appropriation capital 2017-18, supplementary bill 2018, mm. second reading, adjourned debate. <laughs> Leader of the House. Oh, the question is, will be read a second time? All those in favour, aye. Aye. All those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Yes. A bill for an act to appropriate out of the consolidated account a sum for capital payments made during the year end of 30 June 2018 under the authority of the Financial Management Act 2006. What do you reckon? Is leaf granted to... Proceed forthwith to third reading. All those in favour, aye. aye leave is granted. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Speaker, Treasurer. 2017-18 supplementary bill 2018 be now read a third time. Question is, will be read a third time. All those in favour, aye. aye. All those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you, the ayes. A bill for an act to appropriate out of the consolidated account a sum for capital payments made during the year ended 30 June 2018 under the authority of the Financial Management Act 2006. Orders of the day. Yeah, I move that order of the day number two be now taken. Thank you. The question is the motion be agreed. All those in favour, aye. Aye. All those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Come business order of the day number two, Premier statement adjourned debate. Oh, the question is Premier's statement be noted. All those in favour, aye. All those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the ayes have it. Leader of the House. Uh, acting uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I move that this House, uh, at its rising, adjourn until a date and time to be fixed by the Speaker. Mr Speaker. Leader of the Mr. House. Mr Speaker, what an interesting year. Uh, 
a year that started uh, quite uh, normally, uh, with uh, a full sitting, sitting weeks uh, outlined and detailed. And of course, uh, Western Australia, Australia, and indeed the world, was struck down by uh, a, uh, a virus that has caused devastation throughout the world. Uh, but uh, thankfully for Australia, and particularly for Western Australia, uh, we have uh, been uh, fortunate that uh, although we have had deaths, and we acknowledge and mourn those people that uh, uh, were victims of the coronavirus uh, and their families and loved ones, we acknowledge them. Um, but we also uh, uh, congratulate, I think, the Western Australian and the Australian people for the way in which they have responded uh, to this uh, uh, very, very severe challenge. Um, I want to ra raise and go through, of course, the, uh, the year in review. Um, and in doing so, I want to highlight some important uh, 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 successes and indeed achievements, uh, and also thank and acknowledge uh, some people who have played uh, a very important role in the uh, functioning of the Parliament of Western Australia, uh, this chamber, uh, government, and indeed uh, our, our communities. I do want to acknowledge our retiring members. And I think all of us were uh, very, very impressed and indeed uh, 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 warmed by the uh, uh, valedictory speeches by our retiring members. To the member for Coburn, uh, and to the member for Riverton, and for the member for Collie Preston, who gave our, uh, their valedictory speeches on Tuesday uh, evening. Uh, colourful speeches, uh, <laughs> colourful speeches indeed, and language perhaps maybe of, maybe of uh, note and memorable, but uh, I'm sure that uh, it was all taken in the appropriate time. Uh, last evening, uh, the member for South Perth uh, gave his valedictory. And again, I think member for South Perth, although a member of the other side, uh, I think uh, a very warmly respected and, and warmly uh, acknowledged uh, member. And we wish uh, him uh, and the member for Coburn, Riverton and Collie Preston the very best. To the member for Kimberley, who gave a magnificent speech last night, a very special touch with the didgeridoo playing and her speaking in Gidja, her, uh, 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 her own language, her language. And again, a unique touch and a contribution that was made by the member for Kimberley was uh, deeply uh, 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 heartwarming and we wish her well in her retirement. Uh, we then followed with the member for Victoria Park um, with one of the finest speeches I've heard in this place in the time that I've been here for 20 years. And again, uh, a big loss to uh, the government, to the Labor government, uh, but we pass on to you uh, again uh, our very sincere thanks and particularly acknowledge the contribution that you've made as Treasurer of this state over the last four years at a time when we needed strong uh, and, and steady uh, stewardship of the Treasury bench. You did a tremendous job and I think we all agree with that. And Mr Speaker, then it was you. And uh, I think Don't you had a beautiful it. touch this morning when you, uh, you arrived here and you spoke um, in the gown and the, the wig, and uh, you were able to uh, also give a speech last night, uh, which again was uh, remarkable. Mr Speaker, I'm going to read just something that uh, was given to me by uh, the uh, education staff of this parliament, um, written for you. Um, and. Uh, it is a poem, so it is from one of the, the uh, staff from the Education um, uh, Unit of Parliament. And it goes a little bit like this. Um, He's known as Mr Speaker, or Watto, or just Pete, and all will miss him greatly when he vacates the seat. He held his seat of Albany for nigh on 20 years, and when he takes his shingle down, there'll be so many tears. Running's been a constant theme, defining all he's done. It began with running telegrams, and they say he was a gun. Athletics was to beckon him, captaining the state. He then ran for Australia in 1968. <laughs> Returning to the mighty West, the state he loved the most, he built upon his first career at Australia Post. But perhaps his finest moment was in 2001, when he ran for Parliament, surprising many when he won. <laughs> a passionate local member in the House on either side, in opposition or in government, he took it in his stride. As the finish line draws nearer and his marathons complete, we thank the Honourable Speaker, Watto or just Pete. 
And it's not a case of win or lose, it's how you run the race. And our MLA from Albany has done this with such grace. I should end this with a compliment. It's befitting that I should. But how can such a decent man barrack for Collingwood? <laughs> <laughs> he is humble and is honest and a heart just like a whale. But to barrack for the magpies is beyond the bloody pale. <laughs> We will miss your calls for order and your warnings from the chair, your self-deprecating uh, humour and commitment, to be fair. But one thing still confounds us about this honourable member, how this one-eyed magpie fan can still smile in September. <laughs> and so that's from the uh, education staff to you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker. Thank you. Can I get a copy of that? Yeah, of course, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to table that. I'm, I'm happy to table that. Paper table. Table that. So. I don't want anyone else to see it. So. <laughs> table that, Mr. Speaker. I'm, uh, in moving the adjournment today, uh, I can uh, 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 formally bring an end to the 40th Parliament, and there are important moments to reflect on. Uh, opening day for this year was Tuesday, the 11th of February. And today marks the 61st sitting day of the year, excluding the very three days of budget estimates hearings. This equates to about 20 sitting weeks, plus one week of budget estimates, approximately 505 hours of sitting. The House sat for a total of 232 days during the 40th Parliament. A big elephant stamp goes to the only two members with a 100% attendance record for this Parliament. Those two members are the member for Belcatta and the member for Forestfield. 2020 has been a groundbreaking year. In late January, the first reports of a new virus began circulating, as we know, and none of us would have expected how quickly and immensely this virus would affect the rest of the world and our nation. Here in Parliament, we swiftly implemented changes to protect members, staff and visitors. We saw the introduction of hot seats in the chamber and other physical distancing measures, new procedures for the conduct of divisions, and there was bipartisan agreement for a temporary order to be put in place that would enable the House to deal expeditiously with business considered urgent to the state's response to COVID-19. The House had additional days to deal with this business, including during April school holidays and on a Monday. And I'm not sure if this has happened before in the history of the Parliament. The temporary orders was used to pass 17 bills in this place this year. A number of other bills not debated under the temporary order were also passed, which contained COVID-19 response or recovery provisions. Uh, before I move on to legislation that has come before this place during the parliament, I'd like to touch on other business in, uh, transacted this year. Around 40 petitions were tabled, bringing the total to, for the 40th parliament to 207. About 822 papers have been tabled for this year, making for a total of 4,024 papers, bless you, uh, tables since the start of 2017. There have been around 16 matters of public interest debated this year, including today's, bringing the total number for this parliament to 69. There have also been around 23 non-procedural suspensions of standing orders this year, making for a total of some 69 during the 40th parliament. There were around 80 divisions this year and some 262 brief ministerial statements, some of them not so brief, which were delivered. And it's no surprise that the Minister for Health leads in the BMS count for this year, <laughs> and he wins. There have been around 573 questions on notice asked this year, bringing the total for the 40th Parliament to around 6,517 questions on notice. Excluding today's question time, there have been around 965 questions without notice asked and answered this year, making for a total during this parliament of around 3,911 questions without notice. Lastly, there have been around 26 committee reports tabled this year, taking the total number of committee reports tabled during the 40th parliament to around 102. Now we turn to legislation. We all know it is not about the number of bills introduced and passed, but about the positive impacts these reforms have on the Western Australian community. But having said that, in its first term, the McGowan government had an ambitious agenda and has delivered some outstanding outcomes, despite the impact of coronavirus, which interrupted normal transmission, particularly during the months of March, April and May of this year. Around 51 government bills have been introduced this year, 
bringing the total for this parliament to 183. Around 55, excluding 2017-18 supplementary appropriation bills, government bills have passed this House this year alone. And of course we do not need to question who has been the most prolific in this regard. It is, of course, the Attorney General, the member for Butler. He is responsible for introducing around 58 bills into this House during the 40th Parliament. Congratulations, Attorney. I'd like, to, I'd like to provide a handful of highlights of these and other bills. Bills that uh, are of importance included the Fines Enforcement Reform under the Fines, Penalties and Infringement Notice Enfor Enforcement Amendment. Uh, imprisonment for non-payment of fines has been restricted so it can only be ordered by a magistrate and even then only as a sanction of last resort. There was a recommendation of the coronial inquiry into the death of Ms Jew, who died in 2014 while in custody on a warrant of com commitment for unpaid fines. The bill also ends the practice of suspending the driver's licences of people with unpaid fines in remote and regional areas where public transport is non-existent and a driver's licence is often essential to access work and basic services. The Family Violence Reform Bill 2019, uh, introduced by the Minister, implemented a cross-government commitment to tackling the scourge of family and domestic violence by amending nine separate pieces of legislation across six ministerial portfolios. The new laws which put Western Australia at the forefront of the fight against family and domestic violence have been described by the Women's Council for Family and Domestic Violence Services as encompassing reforms the Council had been seeking for 40 years. The removal of the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse civil claims was another well overdue reform after the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse found it took an average of 22 years for victims to disclose such abuse. The Civil Liability Legislation Amendment Child Sexual Abuse Actions Bill 2017 has paved the way for scores of successful claims for damages arising from historical child sexual abuse, most notably the $1 million awarded in August 2018 to terminally ill victim of the Christian Brothers, Mr Paul Bradshaw, who had waited 70 years for justice. The passage of the High Risk Ser Serious Offenders Bill means that now in Western Australia, for the first time, serious violent offenders can be detained in prison or strictly supervised in the community after their sentence has been served. The legislation builds on Labor's Dangerous Sexual Offenders Act 2006 so that now both serious violent offenders and dangerous sexual offenders can be subject to post-sentence restriction for the safety and the benefit of the community. On the environmental front, the most significant improvements in Western Australia's Environmental Protection Act in over three decades completed their passage last week and are awaiting assent. These amendments ensure the protection of our precious environment through legislation that also works to support a sustainable economy that is particularly important as part of the state's COVID-19 recovery. Mr Speaker, we've all heard the horror stories of wheel clamping. It's a disgraceful scam. It's un-Australian and it has to stop. <laughs> Thanks to another great reformer, my good friend, who I've sat through 14 years next to her over the last 20 years of my time here, and we still have the most productive seats that sit over there, while we were over there, we produced seven children between us. <laughs> not, not together. <laughs> let, let me clarify for those watching. Let me clarify for what those watching they're separately. <laughs> but they're beautiful children, and it's been a pleasure. <laughs> moving right along, moving right along, moving right along. Um, now I've gone right off the desk. Yes, okay. um, let's not forget the McGowan government's historic planning reforms, which bring, a, uh, bring about a once in a lifetime change to the current planning system, and the reforms contained in the Planning and Development Act 2020. Support the development of cutting red tape, creating and protecting jobs, and supporting business. And last but not least, even though it seems like a long time ago now, this time last year, the other place was passing the Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill. Work is continuing apace in anticipation of its commencement in mid-2021, and it represents a compassionate and safe legal framework 
that the community has sought for many years. And to quote the Minister for Health, it is voluntary at all stages. It is a choice at the end of life, a choice only for those who decide they no longer wish to endure their unbearable suffering. Many thanks to the Parliamentary Council's office, not only for drafting these bills but, and more, but for achieving the impossible when it was most needed earlier this year in producing crucial legislation to respond to the impacts of COVID-19 within express uh, frame, time frames, while somehow managing to carry on business as usual. And can I highlight that as a member of the State Disaster Council? During those very tense moments, particularly du during COVID-19, uh, the Parliamentary uh, um, Drafting Office, the Council's Office, uh, the Attorney General's Office and the uh, State Solicitor's Office were working into the weekends and into the uh, early hours to ensure that bills were drafted in time for this parliament to uh, deal with them. So we do wish those people, those drafters, a very well-earned rest over the festive season. Finally, Mr Speaker, a few thank yous. Can I thank you, Mr Speaker, and again congratulate you on your stewardship of this chamber over the last four years. Can I also acknowledge your deputy, the member for Maylands, for her uh, continued uh, excellence in the seat or the chair. Uh, can we also acknowledge the acting speakers in Alph alphabetical order of electorate? Uh, we thank the member for Forest Field. We thank the member for Geraldton, uh, Girawin, Mirabuka, Southern River, Vass and Wanneroo. We thank the speaker's executive assistant, Ms Jackie Berry and Anna Murphy, his attendant. And we go through, of course, our staff in this, the Legislative Assembly Chamber. Uh, to our clerk, Kirsten Robinson. Thank you, Kirsten. Her leadership team, including Liz Kerr, Matt Bates, Scott Nelda, Sergeant of Arms, Isla McPhail, and the magnificent staff in the Assembly Office, including uh, Dennis Hippolyte, Lachlan Gregory, Rachel Wells, Alison O'Shaughnessy, uh, Nicholas Caboni, Marie Martin, and Darren Seat. The incredible committee staff, Pam Clark, Trish Woodcock, Renee Gould, um, Michelle Chiazon, Sarah Palmer, Javita Hogan, Alan Charlton, Sam, Sam Hutchinson, Suzanne Valletta, Francesca Walker, Vanessa Beckingham, Sylvia Wolfe, Lucy Roberts, Alice Jones, Katie Parsons, Alison Sharp. The parliamentary services team headed by Rob Punter, uh, working behind the scenes to provide us with all the services we take granted for. Just a little drink there while I'm here. <laughs> I've got a little bit of time on that. Um, <laughs> Laurie. Oh, Laurie Mansell. Yes, Laurie. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Laurie. And all of the Hansard team. A magnificent performance by them this year once again. Now it's good to see you in front of us because before, during most of the year, you've been up there and we can't see you very well. To the building services and cleaning team led by Hugh McCaffrey, to the security and reception services led by Tony Patterson, to a wonderful gardeners led by David Boag, to Judy Ballantyne and the library team, and many members in their valedictory speeches highlighted the wonderful team in the library. To Dave Embury and the audiovisual team. To the catering services headed up by Eno Ashif, the dining room manager Mark Gabrelli, the executive chef Brett Barrett, and all in the lounges and the dining rooms, we thank you very much. And for many of us who've let ourselves go during the COVID-19 experience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> to the Parliamentary Education Office, which all of us are very, very appreciative of, as are the schools and the edu educational groups uh, that come through. To uh, Cherie Tuvi and the Parliamentary Education Office team, thank you again. A magnificent uh, effort. You do a tremendous job for the Parliament of Western Australia. For John Buchanan and all in IT, to Elmer Ozich and the finance team, and to Human Resources and Payroll, led by Tina Hunter. There is a remarkable uh, uh, young man that I'm very pleased to have been working with as my time as Leader of the House, and that's the member for Belcanter. Yeah. Yeah.
He's a, um, he's, a he's a terrific bloke, he really is, and he's been ably assisted by his assistant whip, the member for um, uh, Joondalup. Um, but I want to thank the whips. Can I also acknowledge the whips from uh, the whips or those that have served as whips from the opposition and their support uh, for uh, uh, the functioning of this um, of this chamber? Can I thank the, our whips, uh, Assistant Ben Coates? Um, now I used to be a whip. I was whip like the member for Kirrawin. I was member of whip in the dark. Very age. average one. I, well, I'm just about to say that. <laughs> I used to use faxes, and that's all I used because I, <laughs> I didn't know how to do emails and things. And our whip modernised it, modernised it, and took it out of the carrier pigeon years to uh, the modern, agile way you should do things. Can I acknowledge, uh, as leader of the house, particularly Rebecca Nielsen, who is here? Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Wonderful woman is Rebecca Nielsen, and uh, um, I hope that. Uh, the Parliament and indeed uh, the uh, department in which you uh, serve uh, understands how important you are and how skilled you are. I thank you sincerely. Can I acknowledge the member for Dawesville uh, and also the member for Churchlands before him who served as uh, opposi uh, managers of opposition business. And I want to thank you for the, your support and we, we didn't have too many fights over the last four years. Uh, a lot of cooperation, and that is appreciated, and also with the opposition whips. Can we also acknowledge and thank the staff in the Premier's office and to the magnificent staff in uh, all of our electorate offices? Now, I'm going to mention mine. I'm sorry, but I am. I've got a right to. Uh, I want to mention my electorate office staff, Larissa Wigmore, who had a little bub about eight months ago, and it's wonderful to see a young mum enjoying um, motherhood. To Larissa Wigmore, Crystal Phillips, Jock Baines, and Michael Peck, and my illustrious Fran Harmon. Fran, thank you. She's been with me since I got here. To the departmental staff of my ministerial um, positions, Sir Duncan Ord, o o OAM, uh, and uh, Gail McGow McGowan, uh, also for the heritage per portfolio, I thank you. And to all the ministerial uh, uh, and public servants. To the drivers in the garage, we don't mention them quite often, but those of us who have been driven by the drivers in the garage, they're very skilled, <laughs> very skilled. They're wonderful characters. Um, and of course, for me, uh, I think I am the one that goes the furthest uh, to my regional city of Mandra. <laughs> and of course, on the no. way there, I usually, I usually quite often fall asleep and I snort as I fall asleep. <laughs> But my drivers put up with me as Smooth FM plays softly, <laughs> softly in the background. <laughs> can I? Can I? Can I some, sometimes in one of them I play Rodney Roode, but that's not appropriate anymore. You can't play that sort of stuff anymore. It's not PC. Can I acknowledge? I didn't want to acknowledge my ministerial staff. Can I acknowledge my chief of staff, uh, Gary Hamley, who again. Uh, 50 years' service to the public service of Western Australia, and I think that is a remarkable service. He's served both sides of politics, uh, and he has done that with distinction. To uh, my principal policy officer, Kelly McManus, again, a magnificent asset to uh, the Labor Party and to uh, the, uh, the Parliament through her role and my ministerial role. To my wonderful media advisor, Kim Coolhouse, to Tanya Whittacombe, uh, to Lisa Markinson, Caroline O'Neill, and Marty Cunningham, uh, to Danielle McKenzie, Megan McLean, Kelly Howitt, Georgia McGovern, Jade Baker, and Demi May Renfrey. I thank them sincerely for their wonderful support of me as Minister, and I have appreciated that so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to finish. I think I've got most of the bits out. I'm going to finish with this. Um, look, um, the arts community has done it very, very, uh, uh, have been affected very strongly uh, by COVID-19. When things closed down in that uh, second week of uh, March, um, it affected lots of businesses. But for the creative industries people, it affected them particularly. Uh, and for many of them, they still are recovering. Um, so what I want you to do is when you go out to, and you're thinking about what you're gonna buy for a Christmas present this year, can you think about choosing uh, something from our creative people. Think about buying a, sh a ticket to a show for your local community theatre. Think about buying tickets for family and friends for um, some of our other uh, events that might take place. 
Can you think about buying uh, possibly a piece of artwork, a piece of, a piece of um, uh, um, visual art um, from a local artist uh, and support them? Can you think about uh, supporting our musicians, um, be it going to a, a, a venue and supporting live music or indeed our orchestra or some of our concert bands and those people who play instruments or play in bands and things for us? Uh, because essentially for me, uh, it's, it's our artistic people, our creatives who are our storytellers. And we're going to see that when we open the museum on Saturday. Uh, we've got a great story to tell in Western Australia. It's a magnificent story. We want to share it with the world. And the people that help us share that are those who are our creative industries people. They're the ones that help tell those stories of Western Australia. So I'd ask you to support our writers, our storytellers, in any way you can because they deserve our support. Now, Mr Speaker, I remember when it got rowdy a few years ago and I wasn't going to sing a song. No, because no. it got rowdy and I thought, oh, do I? But look, I am going to today. I'm going to finish today. Goodness. I'm going to finish today. I hope, I hope you take this song in the right... The <laughs> OK. <laughs> I hope you take this song... I hope you take this song in the right uh, gist. Well, um... Leader of the House, last time you did this, you got over a million likes on, on, on uh, Facebook and that, job. but my face wasn't in at all, so I want you to come up and sit next to me up here I so loved, I can get I in. I loved it, but I don't think the standing orders allow me to, to do that. Um, anyway, I'll start off. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is an ode to 2020. The year started out like most before. We did highway for hell with crowds galore. But you don't care for ACDC, do ya? <laughs> it went off well without a hitch. But within two weeks, the world would switch. We faced a foe that we couldn't even see ya. You wandered out to the supermarket and grabbed a lonely shopping cart, but the hoarders had cleaned the shelves before you. <laughs> Down aisle three and aisle four, there was no dunny roll at all. <laughs> the world had gone mad, you were sure, hallelujah. <laughs> we were in isolation, isolation. <laughs> Isolation, isolation. <laughs> the sewerage bollards out front are gone. <laughs> we can wander out yonder, but not beyond. <laughs> and get 10 cents for all our bottles and cans, yeah. <laughs> Our border's been hard, but it's kept us safe. Under labour, it's cheaper to go to TAFE. The people cry out, oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. But you can still run and eat a kebab. <laughs> I can still visit my mum and my dad, but things might not be what they once were. The months went by, the fourth, the fifth. With Clive, we had a massive rift. <laughs> and when his high court challenge failed, we all sang hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We say goodbye to John McGrath, to Josie Farah and Mike Nahan, to Mick and Fran and Ben and Watto. We say see ya. And although the world is in a frazzle, we've got a new Lord Mayor named Basil. <laughs> and the ratepayers, they all sing hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Merry Christmas, everyone. The election campaign has begun. From Parliament, we wish everyone the best, yeah. 
But no matter what others may say, thank God we live in W.A. For we can all sing holly, hallelujah. So Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. <laughs> My biggest wonder at any of the house is you do happen to be speaker. Who's going to be the singer the next year? <laughs> Leader that um, member for doors for. No, there's, no, there's, no, there's very little point in trying to come close. I think it's, <laughs> my, my contribution would be very uh, clinical in comparison. Let me tell you, um, Mr. Speaker, I rise in speaking to the adjournment. I'd just like to congratulate you on your uh, valedictory speech last night, um, and to the members who are leaving this place uh, voluntarily. Uh, the members for South Perth and Riverton and Kimberley and Victoria Park and, of course, uh, Coburn and, and yourself and Collie Preston as well. Uh, it's a hum I have to say, from my perspective as the, uh, the youngest member of this place, it is a very humbling experience to listen to those who have served for such a long length of time in this place. <laughs> That's right. Uh, for such an extensive uh, period of time in this place. Um, and to lose, I have to say, a very significant collective knowledge that's particularly shared between the member for Collie Press and the member for Albany. Uh, I, it was a genuine value that I had in listening to the stories that you've given to this place and certainly in your ongoing contributions while I've served alongside you here. Uh, the nature of the Assembly Chamber is, of course, that we attract a very diverse uh, set of characters. Um, some of them are very strong, some of them are um, uh, a bit more humble in how they contribute to this chamber, but all of us, uh, I think, make for a much richer contribution to our state's democracy. Um, no one has a linear background to how they arrive at this place. And the member for Collie Preston, uh, the story you told about growing up in a shack, effectively, and then finding your way here, together with the member for Coburn, two members who lived in indentured poverty, um, to serve alongside you. Uh, we have lawyers and we have people from very diverse backgrounds here. It shows the strength and resilience of this place, I think, and that's something that we've thought about a lot during this time in COVID-19. I personally feel very lucky that no matter the experience, no matter the wealth, no matter the gender, no matter the race or background, all of us here are elected by districts as equals. Uh, the idea to me um, that now is the time to recognise how lucky we are and to honour that, I think, is, is an important one. With that in mind, obviously, Speaker, uh, it's inevitable that in 114 days' time, or less than that now, uh, we'll be finding ourselves at the next election and electing members to the 41st Parliament. And as the member for Bassendean would remind me many times, uh, some of us may not return to this place voluntarily. Uh, the idea, of course, that this might... Well, that's right. Uh, the idea that this might send the, signal the end of someone's first term or perhaps multiple terms uh, is obviously um, something that is an important part of our, the nature of our democracy here in Western Australia. Uh, look back on my time here, obviously it's punctuated by the contribution of COVID-19 and what's happened since. Um, it's almost like there was two histories, something that was pre-COVID or before COVID and something that was su subsequent to it. And the Parliament has been, I think, very, very comprehensive in our response to it. Um, it's the virus has disrupted every, nearly every facet of our world. I think what it's done, uh, in addition to the realisation across all of us that we need to reconnect with our friends and family. It's seen a reversal, I believe, in the, the mistrust that was growing in our governments and in our parliaments. And instead, people have looked to these institutions for guidance, for comfort and for direction in a time of crisis and of need. Uh, many of us look across the globe to see what's happening in, in various democracies. You, we know more recently, many of us watched the US politics. I know the unfolding saga there with a the president who's lost his mandate. But oh, more than that, the hundreds, uh, or the thousands certainly, who have lost their lives over there uh, is a sorry, sorry tale about a nation that should be far greater than that. And in that, we are lucky from the leadership that we've been given at a national cabinet and by all state and territory governments and their parliaments to make sure that we can respond adequately to that. As a very brief aside, um, there's, I think it's worth looking particularly at the American example. I think the Premier has spoken about it a number of times. We have seen, obviously, the layers of government completely unable to work together collectively in the common good to protect their citizens. Um, there's a, 
if members are interested, there's a very um, there's a piece I found more recently, a profile on um, the New York governor, New York State governor Cuomo, and, and the New Yorker that goes in very extensively the amount of, amount of bureau, bureaucratic inefficiencies that exist, and has actually contributed to people dying on mass in a state. Uh, like New York is completely unfathomable. And I think it's a credit to all members in our democracy here in Australia and the structure that we have inherited over time, that we have not let that happen and that we've put the priority of our citizens first to protect them at a time when they've needed us most. Uh, I, believe, I believe here in the Western Australian Parliament it has been a collective effort and it's one for which I'm proud of the contributions of the members of the Liberal Party who have worked, I think, hand in glove in a legislative capacity uh, together with the government to make sure we've introduced some 17 pieces of legislation that have been urgent under the COVID standing orders and many, many more that have uh, passed through here with some impact from COVID-19. I think the fact that our parliament did not alter our sitting days and uh, continue with their highest duty to serve and protect our citizens is a credit to every member here and their staff who helped support in getting us to this place. To me, that demonstrates the strength of our parliamentary democracy and all of the players within it. From my perspective, obviously, I'm very grateful for the, the parliamentary Liberal team because I think at the time, none of us were certain of our roles, uh, of what we'd do as members of parliament locally, and certainly that when to be called upon in opposition, not necessarily guided by the machinery of government, we are in the hands of this at times, in the hands of the government, in the hands of the parliament, in the hands of our our districts to make sure we represent them to the best possible time, uh, best of the, our abilities at a time when citizens needed us the most. From the moment it became obvious that there were threats to the way that government could operate, from the moment that we realised that there might be an issue with passing supply, uh, there was the Leader of the House together, the Leader of the Opposition, the Speaker, the Clerks, the Leader of the National Party, and we got together to make sure that no matter what, the state could continue to function. That was an extraordinary time to realise that we may run out of money in the state. But that is the reality that we faced at a time. And I know members of the government, and particularly the Cabinet, know that more than ever, uh, but that is the reality. We were faced as a parliament with unsure that we'd even be able to grant supply. Uh, but again, we worked as collaboratively as possible to make sure we brought that bill in an expeditious format to provide for an amount to the House and get that legislation passed. From that time onwards, I have to say it has been an immense honour of mine to work with the same sense of shared responsibility and collegiality together with our friends in the National Party and with the uh, Labor government to work to protect West Australians. To me, it reinforced uh, the ensuring relationship between the Leader of the House and the Manager of Opposition Business as well. I'm grateful to the member for Mandra for his guidance and his wisdom at times, uh, and uh, not so much necessarily his, his singing ability, but he's always, he, he's he. always been very supportive of me personally and in the professional capacity, given I'm your opposite number in this place, I'm grateful for the ongoing uh, collegiate nature of our relationship. I think that has genuinely been able to steward this house uh, through difficult times and, and moments knowing that we could get through something and sort uh, arrangements out very quickly that meant members could still meet still debate and still stand up for their citizens at a time when otherwise parliaments globally had shut down. I'm incredibly grateful for the opposition, the, to the opposition leader for the position to serve as manager of opposition business. I'm not uh, you know, unmindful of the fact that in 114 days' time I may not return to this place. The election is always going to be difficult and it has been an immense honour to serve you, uh, leader, as the manager of opposition business and indeed the party more broadly. This to me, this role is something I will cherish and an experience that I'm very, very grateful for. So thank you, uh, Lisa and the team, uh, for all that you've invested in me to help serve the lead you as leader and the party here in the parliament. Uh, I'd like to also, as part of that role, Speaker, reflect on uh, your contribution to this House and indeed supported by uh, your clerk, your deputy clerk, uh, the leadership team in Liz, uh, Mr Bates and Isla, I'm very grateful for your ongoing support, uh, particularly the prospect that at any one point in time the whole playbook can get thrown out of the window and we find ourselves trying to come up with uh, new arrangements or trying to come up with new ways that we can continue, again as I say, to serve our democracy. You've all served valiantly at a time when again there was an impending crisis and none of, you knew, none of us knew what would, what would be around the corner. I'm thankful to you as well, Speaker. One of the hallmarks that I find in your leadership to this place is that you care greatly about the staff who serve in this building. One of the things that I will, will be forever imparted on me is that you never, ever stop representing their, their concerns here and you always stood up for them first and foremost. And I'm grateful for that because making sure we have a strong staff here means that we have a strong democracy as well. 
Uh, from me, as Speaker, the Leader of the House has um, thanked everybody that I would seek to thank, and I don't want to go down that line, certainly in not, not wishing to draw out my contribution longer than 10 minutes, and also because inevitably I'll probably miss somebody. But undoubtedly this has been a remarkable session, the 40th Parliament in Western Australia, not just because of COVID-19, not just because we've had things, uh, historic pieces of legislation that would otherwise have been quite trying for our Parliament in the voluntary assisted dying legislation, uh, but we've had with, you know, the, the issues with respect to the former member for Darling Range. We've had a new by-election to see new members come to this place, and the member for Cottesloe and in the member for Darling Range, who have been newly arrived uh, subsequent to the start of the uh, 40th parliament. And of course, uh, it meant we have not, all this has happened at a time when a global pandemic again has otherwise shut down other nations, and we should be grateful for our place here. Ultimately, uh, Speaker, uh, whilst not wanting to thank uh, everybody, I would like to say a, a couple of personal thanks. Um, my first to the uh, Minister for Health. Uh, I didn't think when the, leader of the, when the Leader of the Opposition gave me the portfolio of health that I'd have to deal with the voluntary assisted dying legislation as my first bill and certainly not subsequently uh, a pandemic uh, to boot. But I have to say, outside of the um, perhaps uh, robust nature of our relationship on the floor here, uh, being able to communicate with you in a very freely, frankly, and trusted way during COVID-19, I think, has been to the benefit of, of our parties, generally speaking. And I think, from my perspective, has been able to inform our communities that we represent because we had the direct line through to you and through to your office. I'm very grateful for our, for our friendship here at, outside this place. Uh, I also had the chance to serve, uh, sorry, serve the parliament, um, but certainly my other opposite number was previously the member for Coburn, who's not here. I, I recognise his retirement. When I first got to the position of, uh, manager of um, Shadow Minister for Corrective Services, I sent on, through Amazon an uh, hourglass to the member for Coburn because I was confident when I first came to this place that I was going to see him removed from office. Uh, he sent, when, he, when I lost the portfolio and was returned and given the health, he sent it back saying, not this time. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss uh, his, con his forthright con contribution to this place. I'm also going to miss the member for Collie Preston, who when I loaded him up with he and his office for questions, simply said during the division, we're well, going to stop this bullshit sometimes. Uh, I've never been spoken to subsequent in this place like that, uh, but I think it's going to miss the colour and life that we saw I think perhaps uh, the result of which culminated in your speech to this place uh, only yesterday. Uh, I'm going to also uh, miss the member for South Perth, uh, a wise head in this place, which all of us see as the voice for reason. Uh, the member for Riverton as well for his ongoing stewardship of our party at a difficult time. Uh, the member for Kimberley and the member for Victoria Park. Uh, your respective contributions to this place and your loss to this place I think will leave the parliament worse off without you here. Uh, we are very grateful for your ongoing contributions in your own individual capacities, certainly in your service as Treasurer uh, member, but also because, of course, of your backgrounds and your heritage and representing the voice of Aboriginal people here in this parliament. Your contributions, I think, have been very important and we're very lucky to have had you here. I am grateful to have shared this floor with you during this time and I thank you for your service on behalf of the Liberal Party to the state of Western Australia. I think, uh, as well, Speaker, I've, cut, I've touched on your contribution, but uh, I've gone through some difficult times in this place, and I've got to say that there have been times when I've been able to speak with you very frankly and freely, and I thank you for your support. Uh, again, very, uh, I will wrap up, but I would just like to reflect on the fact that we are all obviously here supported by our electorate staff. I've uh, managed to thankfully keep on the same staff team who served with the Honourable Dr Kim Haynes in uh, Mandy Burton and, and Gaynor Sanders. And we've been helped now with a, a massive flock of volunteers who I'd also like to thank them for their help. Um, with respect to the, uh, the media who are still here, and uh, just Peter Law, so you should get a shout out. Uh, but to the media who are here, I, I think it's unfortunate that we don't have your Christmas party here because more often than not when we make these speeches, not only does the member for Mandra get a bit of a bigger audience, but it's always good to see more people here celebrating what we know is a collective journey that we've all been on as we finalise the end of the parliamentary session. I'd like to thank the ministers in the government and the members of the backbench for their continued um, stewardship of our state for the last four years. I've already, again, just reiterate my thanks to the members of the Parliamentary Liberal Party and our friends in the National Party, who I think have, uh, I'm very, very pleased to call my friends, and in particular the member for Central Wheatbelt. Uh, I think you are a remarkable leader. Uh, and there are times, certainly in the last couple of weeks, where you have continued to stand on your feet and represent not only your constituency, but your party. Uh, with fervour and at a time when otherwise people may have, other, may have broken and you've done so with strength and with dignity. And I thank you for your, your continued support together with the Liberal Party to represent those who are not a, on the Treasury benches.
This, is, this session of Parliament has at times, Speaker, been very difficult personally, and I thank the support and the care of those who have given me their um, counsel or their friendship during this time. It is an extraordinary uh, that we go through, I think, these times sometimes suffering in silence through our own uh, personal hardships, because ultimately what I think we do is we know that we don't serve, we're not here about ourselves, we're here to serve our districts, and that's all that comes through. That is the most important thing. And in that spirit of service to our districts, Speaker, uh, I think that we have seen COVID-19 make the good people of this place, the good people, every single one of you, these members, all 49, made the good people better. We've served at a time uh, that will be unlike any other, and for which I'm grateful to share the floor with you. I'm mindful of the fact that many of you will go to elect, all of us will go to elections. Uh, and uh, in that spirit, not only do I wish you a good Christmas, but in 114 days, for the Liberal Party in particular, I wish them very well. Uh, and to all, mem all other members of the uh, National Party and Labor Party, obviously, best wishes. And uh, Happy New Year. So, sorry, safe Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, firstly, uh, four years goes by very quickly. Um, it feels like only yesterday, I'm sure, for all of us that we were here at the start of this parliament and uh, uh, for 23 of us it was the first time uh, they'd ever walked into this uh, parliament. So it's been a, uh, a, an interesting ride the last four years. Uh, I think uh, the uh, parliament has served the state well over that period uh, and uh, I think it's uh, very instructive and very informative, as I think the Leader of the House indicated, uh, that we were the only parliament in Australia that didn't uh, stop sitting or didn't, didn't uh, truncate our schedule. In fact, uh, we managed to add extra sitting days. I was just saying to the Minister for Health, I cannot actually remember those sittings uh, on Mondays and whatever, but apparently we did uh, earlier uh, this year. Uh, I think uh, the parliament itself uh, rose to the occasion over the course of this year. Uh, with the intention of uh, passing legislation uh, to support uh, our agencies and to keep the state as safe as possible. And so, therefore, I think the members of this parliament in due coming decades, and uh, certainly your children and grandchildren, uh, will be able to look forward back with pride uh, on what was done over the term of this parliament. Uh, in terms of uh, legislation, uh, I just want to list, because it's the final speech of this parliament, and Ordinarily, uh, you wouldn't do so, but it's been uh, a, uh, an extraordinary four years. Uh, managed to uh, pass laws to support the victims of child sexual abuse, to seek uh, comp compensation and redress, uh, and naturally we're also following on with the Royal Commission recommendations and further laws uh, out of that. Uh, we apologise to the LGBTI community uh, and passed laws in relation to uh, past prosecutions that sh shouldn't have occurred. Uh, we put in place safety measures, uh, nobody, no parole reforms, new terrorism laws, unexplained wealth laws, revenge porn laws, uh, FDV, family and domestic violence laws, the way we treat high-risk offenders, multiple murderers and dangerous sex offenders were all passed by the parliament. Uh, we've reformed the courts and child support systems, uh, our electricity markets, environmental laws and gender laws. We've reformed our liquor laws and our on-demand transport uh, reforms, uh, very, very comprehensive. Uh, our heritage laws and three rounds of local government uh, reforms passed by uh, the minister here. Reformed our um, gambling laws uh, and uh, uh, the way we treat overseas uh, bookmakers and the way we deal with the uh, TAB, Mr Speaker. We've int introduced infrastructure uh, WA, uh, the first container deposit scheme uh, in Western Australia. Uh, quite a reform, Mr Speaker, and working extremely well. Uh, reformed uh, and uh, reduced uh, the payroll tax burden, Mr Speaker. Put in place fines enforcement laws, certainly to, uh, to uh, dramatically reduce the number of people imprisoned uh, for failure to pay fines. Uh, supported higher rates of immunisation, the WA Jobs Act, uh, a pathway for honourable medical retirement for police officers. Made our roads safer, uh, passed once in a generation for reforms to planning and strata laws uh, to make uh, the face of Western Australia better and also to uh, reduce uh, red tape, Mr Speaker. Created the legal framework, which we have to do, to build Metronet uh, across, uh, across Perth. Uh, we even uh, showed uh, how uh, quickly we can work and quickly we can move uh, by passing extraordinary legislation uh, to protect the state from the nefarious, uh, nefarious and dastardly acts and schemes of Clive Palmer, Mr Speaker, <laughs> uh, which was uh, quite a day, uh, quite a week. Um, We've overhauled our workplace uh, safety laws, um, 
We brought in emergency legislation to deal with the pandemic, uh, passed seven new state agreement acts, Mr. Speaker, uh, and we gave, uh, and it was, a, it was a conscious vote, but we gave West Australians choice and dignity in the face of death uh, was our voluntary assisted dying laws, which at the end of last year I would have thought would have been the most controversial and biggest issue we deal with over this term. But I was proven to be wrong, uh, as we know, in March. It's a very long list. Uh, and uh, depending upon what happens in the Legislative Council uh, in uh, coming days, uh, the list may well, get, uh, may well get longer. And I think uh, in light of that list, and far more, you know, the Attorney General's um, commandeering of the drafting process uh, means that um, <laughs> there has been uh, so many laws that he has passed he can't uh, uh, 60 or so uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, it's a very long list that, that I cannot list now in the interest of, of time, but uh, reform is what we should be about, reform and improvement, and that's what uh, Parliament should be about, that's what we should all aim for. And uh, so that list I just outlined is just a part of the things we've done over the term of this parliament, something that uh, I think we should all be uh, very proud of because it's all about making the lives of West Australians uh, better. Uh, Christmas speeches, Mr Speaker, are all, uh, always a chance to thank uh, people. Uh, and I just want to list off a few. Firstly, can I thank uh, the Cabinet uh, that I meet with on a uh, weekly basis, so over the course of four years, whatever that is, 200 or so <laughs> meetings we've had. Uh, thank the Cabinet uh, for all of our um, deliberations. Uh, it's been an interesting process. We started in Hale House and now we're in uh, Juma House as a consequence of, uh, of COVID, Mr Speaker. But can I thank the, ca the Cabinet for all of their hard work? It's a hard job and lots of work and lots of uh, stress being a Cabinet Minister, so I'd like to thank uh, all of them for that. Uh, can I especially thank the Leader of the House? Uh, he's an um, extraordinary, um, extraordinary person, as you just saw. Uh, and everyone files in. It's the only time I ever see people actually running towards the chamber when the Leader, <laughs> of, the House, leader of the House is making his final speech for the year. Uh, the humour with which he does it is unbelievable. And I think unprecedented around the country. I don't think there's anyone else of that who can do that, uh, like the uh, Leader of the House, and at least make it work. I've seen some very embarrassing efforts in singing. <laughs> I've seen some very embarrassing efforts in singing in parliaments before. Uh, in the Leader of the House's case, uh, it's always uh, genuinely funny so, and meaningful. So thank you to the Leader of the House. Can I thank the members, and the, I think this will be the first time this has ever been done in a Christmas, Christmas speech. Uh, can I thank the members of the National Cabinet uh, and congratulate the Prime Minister uh, on coming up with the concept of the National Cabinet. Uh, and uh, it's been a very effective process. Um, perhaps um, we've had 30 or 35 meetings now. Um, perhaps it's uh, not as close as it was in the uh, first half of the uh, meetings, but certainly the process itself and uh, the resolution of issues, uh, and even if they're not resolved, the near resolution of issues, uh, has been unprecedented in the history of the country, and it's so much better than COAG. I cannot begin to describe how much better than COAG this process is. <laughs> Uh, and so can I thank the members of the National Cabinet uh, across the country. Uh, 35 meetings, uh, they normally go two or three or four hours. Uh, you get to know each other pretty well, even though you don't actually meet face to face. And so uh, I know them all uh, pretty well these days and can I thank them for their work. Can I thank the opposition, uh, both elements of the opposition, uh, for their work over the course of this year. Uh, as uh, opposition leader for five and a bit years, nearly five and a half years, I understand. I understand what it's like. And uh, so I can, uh, I can understand uh, the pressures and the stresses that go on uh, in opposition. And thank you for your work as part of our democracy. Can I thank the Parliamentary Council's office, uh, their tireless work, especially this year, producing laws, directions, regulations, whatever it might be, in record time this year. Um, it was amazing and uh, worked very hard over the course of this year. And often under recognised, you know, sometimes um, the public, you know, looks for some reason looks down at people who do this work. If they don't do this work, uh, we don't implement policies. And so can I thank parliamentary councils and our lawyers across government for all their work. Can I thank all of my parliamentary colleagues, in particular members of the government, members of the caucus, thank you. Uh, they've, um, for many of you, it's been a learning experience, uh, probably about 20 of you. It's been an extraordinary learning experience uh, over the course of the last four years. Um, before you arrive in parliament, as you know, you have no idea what it's actually like. And then you get here and you're sitting in this room and you know, all these processes are going on around you and you feel like you're sort of a cork in a, cork in a river. And it's an um, uh, interesting experience uh, for which there is very little 
training or practice or anything even remotely similar to it uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the real world, so to speak. Um, and so can I thank you all uh, for all your work and indeed the same to uh, members of uh, the opposition. Can I acknowledge those MPs retiring? Um, you know, um, the members for Collie, Albany, Coburn, South Perth, Kimberley, uh, Riverton uh, and Victoria Park. Can I thank all of uh, those members for their contribution here over, I think if I was to add up the time that you've all been here jointly, it would be the best part of 100 years. Uh, so can I uh, thank you all for uh, your contributions. Uh, the speeches over the course of this week um, have been memorable. <laughs> uh, memorable. Uh, yes, uh, the member for Collie. Um, as I said, I told Caucus the other day, I'll breach Caucus confidentiality, your, your valedictory is what people read uh, when they do your condolence. <laughs> So when they do your condolence, they read your valedictory to, to see what you did as a parliamentarian. <laughs> and in the case of the member for Collie, they'll, they'll be very... <laughs> How will they... Maybe they will say the parliament has changed since those days. <laughs> that we don't do that anymore. <laughs> so... Um, so, Member for Colley, um, I understand the police are coming to see you shortly. <laughs> um, <laughs> can I thank the other members, uh, in particular Member for Coburn, uh, Meg, you know, we've all been friends for so long. Um, and uh, Member for Kimberley, uh, thank you Josie for everything. Uh, and uh, Speaker, uh, thank you so much. Been friends for so long. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's a, uh, you know, it actually makes me sad to see people go like this. It makes me sad because, um, you know, we're all here together and go through these experiences and these stresses and strains and arguments and fights. And, uh, you see the most amazing things and you watch the most amazing um, events. You, uh, you have the most extraordinary laughing and humour uh, as part of it all. Uh, some of the meetings and uh, the caucus meetings and the uh, meetings you go through are uh, just so incredibly... Um, funny and memorable. Um, and so when you go, uh, a little bit, bit of that memory is gone. And so uh, I always find it sad, uh, these occasions, but in particular because uh, some of you I've served with for so long uh, and uh, been through so many experiences together. So thank you all. Uh, member for Victoria Park, I left you off. Uh, you know, you and I have been through a lot uh, over the last uh, 15 or so years since you've been here. I always expected I would be going before you. Uh, so I'm uh, so, so sad uh, to see you go. Uh, and uh, so thank you all. Thank you so much, Member for Victoria Park. Um, to my staff, uh, can I thank them? Guy, Joe, Daniel, uh, in, my minister, in my Premier's office in particular. Uh, they're just, um, and everyone else, there's a lot of them, so I won't thank them all. But Guy, Joe, Daniel, thank you so much. You're just outstanding people. Karina in my uh, electorate office and the staff in my electorate office, thank you so much uh, for all the work you do. Uh, I'm not as uh, perhaps uh, present as I once was uh, in my electorate office, so I thank you for dealing with uh, my wonderful electorate of Rockingham uh, in the way that you do and helping people in the way you do. To all the parliamentary staff across the entire building who make the whole place run, thank you so much. Especially, I want to acknowledge, I don't know if David did, uh, the Leader of the House did, uh, the gardening staff and the dining staff, I want to especially thank them, the, you know, the people uh, out there. Uh, and you, know, you always walk through those magnificent gardens and there's the people there with their hats on and the, the, the blue outfits just doing a marvellous job. So thank you to all of them. Uh, and the dining and bar staff, thank you so much. Um, always enjoy my interactions. Uh, can I thank uh, all my agencies? Um, and I won't list off again, but thank all the public servants and senior public servants especially for all their work, work incredibly hard. I don't think it's appreciated how hard they work. So thank you and the stresses and strains on them. Can I, Dave, uh, the Leader of the House did this as well. Can I thank the, uh, in particular the drivers uh, that we deal with, uh, as uh, former ministers and opposition leader will know. Can I thank them and my police officers who, um, who uh, take care of me. Uh, I spend a lot of time with drivers and police officers. I mean a lot of time. And um, uh, I just, every day, hours and hours and hours. And uh, I think uh, they both know 
uh, that I like them a great deal. And I like to thank them uh, for their camaraderie and for their work. Can I thank my family, my wife Sarah, my kids Samuel, Alexander and Amelia um, for all of their um, forbearance and understanding uh, in uh, my role in this place. Uh, they've been uh, outstanding. Uh, I couldn't ask for better uh, and I love them very much. Uh, can I thank the media? Of whom there's no one there. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. They missed their moment. Um, no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, there is the media. Yeah. <laughs> there, there he is, uh, the media. Um, can I thank uh, the uh, yes? Th can I thank uh, the media uh, for their important role in covering our democracy and our proceedings? Difficult job being the media today. You have to be multi-skilled. I first got here 24 years ago. Uh, you know, you you had to do one role. These days, is you know, it's online, there's photographs and they film and they report and they tweet and they Facebook all at once. Um, and uh, uh, can I end, uh, you know, and there's so fewer of uh, our media friends to undertake that role. So very important role in a democracy, as we see in the United States. As we see in the United States. Where would we be without the media in the United States? Uh, and, um, and finally, uh, can I thank all West Australians? Uh, for all of their sacrifice and work over the course of the last uh, four years, but in particular over the course of this year, I appreciate. I appreciate all your sac sacrifice and cooperation. To everyone, have a great break. Uh, to all of us uh, going into the election campaign, best of wishes. Best wishes. Uh, it's a trying process, uh, but it's an important part of uh, uh, the, uh, the democracy that we have in Western Australia. Thank you. Move the opposition. Thank you. Um, I too rise to put my remarks on the record for this uh, adjournment motion for the 40th Parliament. Um, Mr Speaker, I, I think I can only characterise the year of 2020 as being a year of incredible uh, ups and downs. Now, we started the year, if members will recall, with catastrophic bushfires on the east coast. Uh, we had catastrophic fires. Uh, in the gold fields that had blocked off the air highway. We had people stranded at the border uh, because of a, a bushfire event at the start of the year. And then March came along and we started hearing those rumours of an um, emerging rumours of a new threat, uh, a much smaller threat uh, than any fire could ever be, and a threat that uh, became known as COVID-19. And we started to have problems then of our borders of a different nature. Um, Mr Speaker, this year, I think, uh, as Western Australians, we've been able to see uh, the very best in our community. And it makes me incredibly proud to have seen the way the people of Western Australia have stepped up. Uh, they've stepped up in showing that they have very big hearts, that they have a lot of compassion, they've had a lot, uh, they have an ability to put aside their own personal, uh, personal niceties, their own personal um, uh, plans. They were willing to shelve their plans, to shelve their travel plans, to, to put aside whatever it was uh, they thought was important to them, because suddenly other people became more important. Uh, seniors in our community, the vulnerable people. Now, when we have a look at the sacrifices our community have made to protect those people that are most vulnerable, it makes me a very, very proud person to be a fifth generation Western Australian and to be part of that community. During that time, we've seen the, all of our staff uh, around us really step up to the mark. And Mr Speaker, I would like to congratulate you and all of the Parliament House staff on the approach that you've taken to the Parliament during this incredibly difficult time for us. You know, and I temper my comments saying a difficult time for us is far removed from the difficult time our, the first responders and our health workers and medical staff are having in many, many parts of the globe as we speak and stand here in the best place in the world. But Mr Speaker, what I felt, found was um, very inspiring uh, here in the parliament was that you and your staff immediately went to work looking after the vulnerable people in this chamber, uh, the vulnerable people on your staff, ensuring that people who were at significant risk of dying of COVID-19 
were given the opportunity uh, to self-isolate, to work from home, uh, to, you know, we put the social, social distancing measures in place, we put the cleaning protection and the cleaning measures in place, and, and everybody learnt very quickly how to work in a very, very different regime with respect to the way this parliament operates. And I think we should all be proud of the way our team here at parliament, the administrative staff who support us, uh, have risen to the challenge and kept us all safe and looked after all of our needs during this period of time. Mr Speaker, um, during this last year, you know, we've, we've had We've lost a number of former members. You know, we've, had, we've lost members in the most difficult of circumstances and we've had condolence motions um, that have really backed up on each other and we've had to deal with those condolence motions across a very short period of time. You know, very, very sad to have your friends and colleagues pass away during a period of COVID-19 when only five people can attend a funeral. 10 people, everybody else has to zoom in. No members who ordinarily would attract five, 500, maybe 1,000 people to their funerals to pay tribute and to pay their respects to family members as a result of the lives that they have led as leaders in our community uh, were unable to have that, that respect uh, shown to them in person. But I think we did ourselves very proud in this chamber in that we put on the record uh, with those condolence motions um, our memories, uh, our appreciation of the efforts of all of those former members who've lost their lives um, unexpectedly in the case of Andrea Mitchell, uh, and certainly with two former speakers, uh, the Honourable George Strickland, the Honourable Jim Clarko. Um, you know, the very, very sad time for people in this chamber to be farewelling um, members uh, that they'd previously served with and friends, friends and mentors, which is what we've done this year. Mr Speaker, I think one of the highlights of the last week uh, has been listening to the valedictory speeches of members who are retiring. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, my members, the Honourable Dr Mike Nahan. Um, Mike Nahan, as the member for Riverton, uh, took on the worst, what we thought was the worst job in the world at the time, which was Leader of the Opposition after receiving an absolute electoral drubbing. And he did a tremendous job and we're all extremely proud of the effort, the work ethic that he displayed and the way that he pulled our team together, uh, won two by-elections uh, in the seat of Darling Range and the seat of Cottesloe, uh, and really uh, did a tremendous job and left this place with incredible dignity with his valedictory speech. To the Honourable John McGrath, my dear friend, I shall miss seeing you here every day. And while I wasn't here in person to listen to your valedictory speech, I have watched it uh, as I watched uh, all of the members uh, for, uh, for the period of time where I wasn't present. And I thank you very much, John, for your years of service to this place, uh, years of service that have been recognised by your community. I don't think there's too many pavilions left to name in South Perth uh, for uh, the member who might uh, succeed you, but, but well done. And I know your community have appreciated every effort that you've put in. Thank you. To the retiring Labor members, uh, uh, the member for Coburn, uh, the member for Collie Preston, um, I don't care what anyone says, member for Collie Preston, I think people will look back on your valedictory speech and know that you are a man of great heart and a man of great emotion and a true uh, leader in every sense of the word with respect to the way that you have conducted yourself in this place and the way that you have led your community um, over the past few years through very, very difficult times with the many changes that they're facing. So I know that you'll be long regarded and well respected for a long time as a result of the effort that you've put in to your community. And I will miss seeing you around this place as well as I will miss all of the members that are retiring. To um, the member for Kimberley, uh, Josie Farah. Josie, I think uh, I will... I feel so privileged to have been in this place, to have heard your, your um, inaugural speech and your valedictory speech, uh, to have that delivered in your native Gidja language is, was truly a, a beautiful thing that I will carry with me forever, and I thank you for that. And I think that you can really, hand on heart, know that you've made a massive contribution to the people of Western Australia in bringing forward 
your private members bill to recognise Aboriginal people as the first people of this uh, country that we call our, our own now. You, know, you should feel well proud of that as an achievement. I think many, many members in this place would like to be able to point to an achievement like that on behalf of the people in the community that we represent. To our, the first Aboriginal Treasurer, um, the Honourable Ben Wyatt, the member for Victoria Park, um, you know, my congratulations to you and you're in the very unique position to have been serving as the first uh, Aboriginal person uh, to be a Treasurer in any parliament uh, in Australia at the same time as your uncle is serving in the parliament for the, on behalf of the people of Hasluck in the Commonwealth Parliament as the first uh, Indigenous man to be a Minister for Indigenous Affairs. You know, a unique uh, collection of firsts that I'm sure that you, you and your family will feel proud of for a long time to come. Mr Speaker, to the wonderful job that you've done as Speaker, uh, uh, trying to keep control of the behaviour in this chamber, uh, I thank you. Um, in the early days, um, I, shall, I will apologise for our behaviour in the very early days in this, uh, in this place, in the first part of our parliamentary session. Adjusting to opposition is a very difficult thing. And uh, our members have risen to the task and we have done our best to hold the government to account in the most difficult circumstances that an opposition can serve in. But Mr Speaker, once again, I thank you for your service to your community. Um, I've visited the seat of Albany many times and we have tried to win it back for the Liberal Party many times. And the impediment to winning that seat, Mr Speaker, is that you are the quintessential local member and everyone in your community uh, has loved the effort that you've put in. And I cannot tell you the number of times I've been to Albany and had people say, we'll vote Liberal when Watto goes. So I hope in March they do. <laughs> However, Mr Speaker, they won't be voting Liberal out of anything that you've done uh, uh, with respect, anything that your community would be upset with, with res respect to your representation. So thank you, and I know that you can rest easy knowing if you have uh, achieved uh, a tremendous job in representing your community and also in keeping carriage of the standing orders in this place. Thank you. To all of the parliamentary staff uh, who support us, uh, thank you. I'm not going to go through and name everyone, but you're, you're all very important to all of us. And we do see the very small things that you do that make a tremendous difference to the way that we uh, can get about doing our jobs. Um, thank you, all of you. Uh, we we uh, very much, all of us appreciate uh, the effort that goes into looking after us. Um, I would like to particularly single out uh, the education staff and the education presenters. Um, every time I have one of my classes come to this place, and I know everyone will have the same experience, they always, they will often write me letters and tell me about the experience that they've had here at the parliament. And for the educators out there, um, I think you'll find that the learning experience the children have is a very worthwhile one because they do remember so many bits of information with respect to their visit to Parliament House and it is always a highlight of their, their primary school years and for some their high school years. So to the education staff, thank you. Um, I would like to thank um, the, the staff in, the, in my office, uh, my Chief of Staff, Colin Edwards, um, Blair, Dale, Tony, Anton, Steve, Stephen, Craig and uh, Simon who's left. Um, the support that you have provided to all of us is tremendous. You know, members on this side uh, who were ministers once will remember what it was like uh, to have a staff of 14 to 16 people to look after your needs and to move uh, into opposition and to share five staff between 23 people uh, is a very dramatic shift with respect to uh, the, the ability that we have to do our job. So to the staff in the Loop office, uh, you are amazing and you do a lot under tremendous pressure and we do all really appreciate you, particularly to, to Cheryl and Kimberly who run my, my diary. Uh, they, uh, Kimberly and Cheryl do a fantastic job 
And obviously, as leader of the opposition, uh, leader of a very small team, there are a lot of events to try and get to. And I do appreciate very much the, the, the effort that goes in, the after hours effort that all of my Loop staff put in, but in particularly um, the support that they provide to me uh, as the leader of the Liberal Party is, is very gratefully received. Um, Premier, I would like to also thank you. We did have a very uh, sick staff member who has been through a very difficult year. Uh, and your office uh, were fantastic in helping us ensure that we could support that individual through a very difficult time uh, that is still continuing. So thank you for assisting us in looking after uh, a person who very much needed some assistance at the time. To my electorate office staff, and I'll say this, I think, for members who, who don't have an opportunity to speak. Uh, this year has been a particularly challenging year, I think, for all of our electorate office staff. You know, with what they've been through, you know, at the end of last year it was the voluntary assisted dying legislation, which was really very traumatising for electorate office staff to be receiving all of the emails from people about that particular circumstance. Very traumatising. To now come into this period of COVID where families are separated, there are significant mental health issues out there. There are people um, stranded in foreign countries, you know, family members who are stuck on the East Coast. There's been all sorts of circumstances that have caused um, tremendous grief to families. And it's our electorate officers who take that on, and they are the first responders on our behalf to all of those calls for assistance that come into our offices. So to my staff, uh, Jonathan and Catherine, I just want to place on the record that I, I, I've really noticed what you've done and I appreciate all of the additional effort that you put in and I also see the toll it's taken and I thank you very much for supporting me and for supporting all of those people in my community and our community uh, through these very difficult times. So in, in closing, uh, Mr Speaker, I don't want to keep people here for too long. I know that there's... Um, I think there's, there's usually some drinks and some crayfish to follow at some point. Oh, it's tough times, <laughs> tough times. Um, in closing, Mr Speaker, there, there are two other people that I would like to thank. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the, our whip, uh, Tony Krzyzewicz, the member for Corrine. Uh, thank you for keeping us all corralled and making sure everybody's lining up at the right time to speak and, and that we understand the order of things. Uh, and to the Leader of Opposition Business, um, as a first time member in this place, uh, member for Dawesville, um, you've done a tremendous job as Leader of Opposition Business and um, it's, it's a thankless job, Leader of Opposition Business. You don't get any extra money for it, but you get a bucket load of headaches, a tremendous amount of additional workload uh, and you get to do all of the negotiating on behalf of the government with a, with, with a usually usually affable uh, leader of government business, but sometimes those trips to Mandra, I think, uh, may get, have gotten the better of some of those intemperate conversations that I know have occurred. So I thank you, uh, leader of government business, for accommodating our requests, but also to the leader of opposition business for the effort that you've put in. Uh, to the leader of the Nationals and our partners in opposition, the National Party, thank you for working uh, so well with us in sharing resources that were very scarce and also in sharing uh, time in this place, which is also somewhat scarce uh, when we're trying to cover the great state of Western Australia in, with only uh, three hours worth of um, time allocated to us uh, each week. So thank you very much uh, for everything that you've put in and also to my deputy, the member for Netherlands, thank you for, for everything that you have done to support our team uh, through this particularly difficult year. So, in, uh, in closing, Mr Speaker, there's, you know, I just want to say once again to the entire Western Australian community, you know, we can hold our heads high and we can be proud of the effort that we've put in. And that has been a collaborative effort and f from our side of politics in, in getting through those 17 pieces of legislation expeditiously, ensuring that the government wouldn't run out of money so that we could keep our services going, keep our nurses paid, keep our police officers. Um, paid. You know, I think that we've done a very good job on behalf of our community. And to all of our first responders out there, to the nurses, to our medical staff, to the police officers who, who are dealing with uh, difficult circumstances and heaven forbid 
if we get an outbreak of COVID-19, those circumstances will become even more difficult. You know, I thank all of those people working on the front line. I come from a nursing family. I understand the sacrifices nurses make and I understand the workload that they have. So um, I just didn't want to sit down, Mr Speaker, without the opportunity of thanking all of those people working on the front line, doing such a tremendous job keeping our people safe and healthy. And uh, with that, Mr Speaker, I wish everyone a Merry Christmas. I wish everyone a Happy New Year. Um, I wish uh, uh, for a, an election campaign uh, that is fought on the issues and the policies that matter to people. Um, and hopefully we will see uh, all of our members return, uh, hopefully with a few more members on this side of the House uh, after March 13, 2021. Leader of the National Party. I am very conscious that we've been here for a while and uh, that uh, there's obviously a few things that people want to get on and do, but uh, I would like also to take the opportunity to thank a few people on behalf of the Nationals, and I'd like to start by thanking you, Mr Speaker, and the Deputy Speakers, the acting Deputy Speaker and Acting Speakers, uh, for your guidance and contribution towards keeping the order in this place, to the Legislative Assembly staff, Kirsten Robinson and her team, always the consummate professionals providing accurate and timely advice and gently guiding us in the acquittal of our duties in this place. To Hansard, absolute magicians who make us sound competent and capable and eloquent even after 10 o'clock at night. Um, to the dining room, the hospitality, security, maintenance, the welcoming faces at the entry of parliament, the gardening team uh, who make the grounds look spectacular, the library and information services team that share the corridor with the nationals and put up with us trekking through their office every day. Uh, parliamentary services and the education office, to the media who also stalk uh, the same corridor as the Nationals WA and with which we all in this game uh, share a symbiotic relationship, uh, especially to those that work on the parliamentary beat um, and to the hardworking regional journalists that our team deal with on a very regular basis. We thank uh, those that take an interest in what happens in our vast and beautiful state beyond these four walls? Uh, there are fewer and fewer of those people to shine a light on uh, the stories of our state, both the good and the bad, and I think we are growing the poorer for it. And so I do like to uh, acknowledge the hard work of uh, the journalists that we deal with, uh, all of us. To the government and, uh, and their members of parliament, I wish you all uh, the best as we head to the next election. Uh, it's been a truly remarkable experience over the last four years. Uh, I've never in the nearly 20 years that I've been involved behind the scenes and in this place, um, seen quite the majority <laughs> that we've experienced over the last four years. So um, it's been quite a unique, a unique experience. Um, and I do wish you genuinely well as you hit the campaign trail and, and head back to your communities and your families. To the opposition, um, it is a tough job. Uh, to the leader of the opposition, uh, to the leader of opposition business, um, it is, as you say, a difficult task with limited resources. Uh, but we are part of the, the cogs that keep this parliament going and we play an important role. And I think uh, that we have done an exceptional job in trying, trying circumstances. And uh, I also wish you the very best as you head back to your electorates uh, to support not only your own colleagues that are already here, but your candidates and, and the team that you're bringing to the next election. To the retiring members, um, I wish you all the very best as you move on to your civilian life. Um, <laughs> I get asked regularly, and I'm sure everyone does, what politicians or members of parliament are like in real life, and the, the parentheses are for um, the benefit of Hansard. And genuinely, I can say hand on heart that I know not one person in this place over the course of my time that don't come uh, to acquit their duties with a, a desire to do better for their community. And no matter what side of the house you're on or how you approach it, how we think we get there to serve those communities, uh, we all do it with the same purpose, which is to leave a legacy and to contribute and make people's lives better. Um, those of you that are choosing to make the decision to move on uh, as your own volition, I think that's a, an amazing thing to be able to do. Um, and I will just single out a couple of people um, to the Treasurer. Uh, I think you have the admiration of everyone in this place in the community. Um, I wish you the very best as you spend more time with your family. Um, it's uh, a legacy that uh, you, as every, everyone has uh, reflected on, should be incredibly proud. Uh, and it's been a privilege to serve in this place with you. Uh, to the two rowdy country MPs that are, are retiring, um, 
that there is a little piece of uh, parliamentary culture and history leaving with you two. You are the old school um, uh, that uh, know how to stand up, bang the, bang the table and, and get what you need for your communities, but you are, high, you are held in such high regard, and I know you don't need us to tell you this because I'm sure that you see it uh, every day and, and get this reflected back to you, but it's nice to be able to acknowledge that in this place. Um, for 20 years, both of you have uh, served your communities uh, vigorously, fiercely, and um, as the Leader of the Opposition pointed out, um, we've been trying to knock you both off in those seats for a long time, <laughs> and, uh, and we haven't succeeded. And it is absolutely the, uh, the Mick Murray seat of Golly and the uh, Peter Watson seat of Albany. And it has also been a great privilege to uh, watch how you equip yourselves in your electorate. I've been in both of your electorates uh, over the course of my time in politics, and you are held with just such great esteem and your constituents will genuinely be sad not to have that door to go to uh, to, um, to, to knock on and, and they know that you will be able to resolve their issues. So I wish whoever takes over that role, I'm really hoping that it's someone from the National Party, <laughs> um, uh, that they can, uh, to, to fill those shoes is a big task. Uh, and I think um, to the member for Albany, uh, to, the, to, the, to you in your speaker's role, May I personally thank you for the hand of friendship that you've offered me over the past four years. I've got no hesitation in saying that you've been a rock for your electorate. Um, urgent parliamentary business has prevented me from uh, watching your uh, valedictory and, and being present for the valedictory of the members over the last day. Uh, but I will and am looking forward to watching those reflections of your 20 years as a parliament. I've had the great pleasure of spending a little bit of time with you um, in non-parliamentary terms and I know the, the leader of the government business was talking during uh, Andrea Mitchell's uh, condolence the other day about the importance of travel uh, and, and travel with your colleagues across the borders of uh, parliamentary parties and in my 12 years as a member of parliament I've not actually travelled um, once uh, uh, internationally or um, interstate uh, as a, parliament, a member of parliament until the speaker actually invited me to attend a delegation with him, uh, with the member for Forestfield, uh, with the member for Hillary's and the clerk. And we went to the United Arab Emirates and Oman last year. And that was an incredible opportunity uh, that I would not have ordinarily had. Um, so I feel very privileged on that front, but I was also very privileged to spend some time with you and I, I appreciate uh, that you, you offered us that, uh, that opportunity. Um, I look forward uh, to, I, I need to find time to cook you that dinner that I owe you. <laughs> it will come, maybe yes. after we've won the seat of Albany with our excellent candidate, uh, Delma Beju. But I do wish you the very best. You need to get that in, didn't you? I do. <laughs> I do wish you the very best. I know that you're looking forward to spending more time with your family and uh, particularly your, your gorgeous grandkids. So uh, from me to you, thank you very much for your guidance in this place as the speaker. It's a tough job. Uh, thank you to my deputy leader uh, of the National WA, the member for Moore. Uh, who stepped into the role mid-term and provided great support to me in this chamber and in our parliamentary team. We are a small team. We lean very heavily on each other to pull our weight. And, um, Member for more, you've acquitted your role admirably, and I really appreciate your contribution and guidance at all times. To the rest of my parliamentary team, um, we've got Member for Rowe here, who's our whip. Um, and I know there's not very many of us, but it's still an important job. We are like herding cats sometimes. So thank you very much, uh, Member Farrow, for your contribution. You've all worked incredibly hard uh, over the course of the last four years. Um, we've travelled to all corners of the state as a team and uh, tried to remain engaged with all, all of those communities. And uh, I'm very proud of the little team that I lead. I do want to make a special mention to the Honourable Colin Holt and the Honourable Jackie Boydell, who are retiring members at this election. They have uh, made the decision to move on. Um, both have left a significant legacy um, in our organisation and for the communities that they represent, and I think in the Legislative Council. The Honourable Jackie Boydell has been leader in the Legislative Council for us, uh, for the National Party, over the last four years, and that has been a formidable task because of the constitution of that House and the numbers in there. It requires uh, constant collaboration with all parties to make sure that that House can continue to operate. Prior to that, Jackie was my deputy leader. She's also held the role of state director in our organisation, um, which is perhaps the most thankless task in any of our political parties. And, uh, and she's worked very closely with the Young Nationals. And I wish her and her family, who have had a long and enduring uh, commitment to our 
organisation the very best as she steps away from politics to pursue new opportunities. To the Honourable Colin Holt, there is not a corner of the state that I travel where someone doesn't know uh, this member and, and his name and the good reputation of, uh, of Colin. He served the people of the, mem uh, the, of the South West region since 2008. He and I came in to the Legislative Council in the same class. Um, he brings a very different perspective to our party. I think there are members in this place that have worked with him on really contentious legislation, and you know how he approaches that. He does that in all elements of his life. And um, I think his legacy, uh, and there will be many um, when we go back to reflect on it when he, he and Jack both leave, but the legacy that we um, have all been a part of in terms of voluntary assisted dying uh, that we can all rightly be proud of. He was involved from the very beginning and uh, it was wonderful to reflect on how he could use the skills that he brought to this parliament to, to work with government and uh, opposition members to shepherd that through. Uh, he has my ongoing gratitude for the contribution that he's made and I know he is very highly regarded in his community wherever he goes. Um, I, uh, to our electorate office, there's been uh, comments on this. Uh, we are spread across the state from uh, Esperance to Caratha, uh, and uh, there's a sincere and genuine thank you from uh, all of our mem MPs for the work we do as country MPs. Our members are more often than not in their they're not in their offices; they're out in their electorates, um, and our electorate uh, staff are highly valued and uh, by us and also by the communities that they serve. And we are indebted to them for the work that they do behind the scenes. Um, I would, as the Leader of, the, of Government Business said, take the opportunity, because I can, um, to thank my electorate office. As the Leader of the Party, I am very rarely in my electorate office. Um, uh, and so to Rhonda Lawrence, Seth McConnell, Kath Brown and Michelle Alvaro in my offices in Northam and Meriden, um, they are an amazing little team that keep everything on track for me and I would be lost without them and they look after the people of Central Wheatbelt incredibly well. To my Leader's Office staff, led by Josh Nyman, uh, who's uh, my Chief of Staff, to Ross Lewis, Anthea Wesley, Kale Hill, Tay Allers, Theresa Middis and more recently Connor Meerwald, you won't find a more loyal or hard-working group of people. Josh has created a really positive working environment for our team. He's earned the admiration of our parliamentary team and the stakeholders that we work with, and I thank him for his commitment and dedication to the role that he brings every day. And to the remainder of the team, thank you. To Ross and his family, we are thinking of you all. A very special mention to Ms Theresa Middis, our parliamentary executive officer, because she has worked with me for over 10 years and has made the decision to step down at this next election. Um, and move on. And she started in my electorate office, she came into my ministerial office, she served as our parliamentary executive officer um, uh, for the last four years. She's a consummate professional, she came from working in very senior roles in uh, Centrelink. She brings an empathetic, compassionate, yes, always efficient and firm, uh, which many people will have appreciated over the time, approach to the myriad of change challenges that come with this role. And, uh, she has been a mentor and a role model for many of my staff and people in our organisation and, and has become a very dear friend of mine. And uh, I will miss her good humour and presence in my office. She's made the decision to move on. Uh, thank you very much. It was wonderful to have someone of your calibre in our office. Uh, to Lockie Hunter and Jack Malik, Steve Blythe and the team that's going to lead our team to the next election from the State Secretariat. Uh, we wish you all the best uh, along with the, the candidates. And uh, I want to finish by saying that it's been an enormous privilege to hold the position of leader of the National Party um, in an organisation that's existed for more than 110 years in this state. Um, I truly believe in what we do, and it is important to have a party that's dedicated to regional Western Australia. I'll echo the comments that uh, everyone has made about the congratulations and commendations to the people that responded during COVID-19. Uh, to our health workers, to the teachers, police, aged care workers, emergency services and volunteers, transport workers, supermarket supply chains, those on the borders. It's been an incredibly difficult year and we will always acknowledge your contribution and remain deeply appreciative, particularly to the police commissioner, to the chief health officer and to everyone that's been working in that team. They've done a marvellous job. And uh, again, I would extend my congratulations to the government who's been uh, very much a part of leading that process. Uh, we, again, appreciate that. I wish everyone a health, healthy and safe Christmas and New Year, surrounded by family and friends. And for those of you that can't, uh, because of the circumstances we, we find ourselves in, I hope that you find some joy in these very difficult times. Uh, and I wish you all the very best as we head to the next state election. Thank you. Now
I know you've all been sitting around waiting for my speech, so, but what, what I was originally going to do, I've got the uh, phone director here for everyone working, 180 people in the, in, in the parliament, but uh, I think they, uh, the, the, leader of the, op, the leader of the House mentioned most of them, but there's some people I've really got to thank, and my clerk, Kirsten Robinson, there she is there, the pocket rocket, she's the one that stopped me having this ever since I've been in, because she said every time you hit it here, their ears go numb there. My deputy clerk, uh, Scott Nolder, his uh, knowledge on uh, law has been tremendous. He's my in-house lawyer. Uh, Liz Kerr, Liz, oh, she's here, yep. Yeah. Another Collingwood tragic, but still, yeah, that we'll get there, Liz, don't worry, but I don't know if it's gonna be my last time. Uh, Matthew Bates. The bionic man there, uh, he's had a big operation there and, uh, you know, he's um, under a bit of pressure there during the years to come back looking better than ever. Um, Olin McPhail. Olin McPhail is my sergeant at arms and we went, and she's supposed to protect me coming in with the mace, but we went to Hobart and she couldn't protect me when this pothole jumped out and put my foot in it and I finished up in a moon boot and she made me she said it wasn't too bad so we walked two kilometers back to the hotel and that's <laughs> so that's the job of the um, sergeant of arms um, also my uh, executive uh, assistant to the clerk and day Jacqueline Berry the bubbly Jacqueline Berry who tells me what I've got to do and where I've got to go and my attendant Anna Murphy um, We've had some really difficult decisions to make with Parliament over the, especially the last 12 months, and it's been a great team effort. And, um, you know, also like to mention Rob Hunter again. Uh, Rob likes, loves to be liked, so all those people that don't like him, I want you, I'm gonna put something on Facebook so you can say, I like Rob Hunter, but he cops a lot of flack, but he does, if you knew the work he does to keep this place going on a limited budget, Ben White, you know, you would think it's, uh, he was a tremendous man. Sorry, Ben. Um, also in my assembly office, Dennis, uh, and I've got to say this right, Hippo Light, um, Rachel Wells, Lachlan Gregory, Alison O'Shaughnessy, Nicola, Nicholas Carboni. Poor old Nick, we went to a conference in uh, Tasmania and he was late uh, one morning for a meeting and he snuck in, snuck in, and he didn't realise in the back corner I was sitting as an observer and I nailed him. I haven't let him finish, but I promised I wouldn't say it, Nick. Um, <laughs> Darren Seat and Marie Martin, who's a little runner, but she's got to watch what she's doing because she gets crook knees. But, uh, also, what else have we got? Um, you know, the building services, everyone in this place, there's so much goes on behind that no one knows about. Security, you know, we had 79, 80 instances in the last 12 months. You know, people just go, come in here, everything's fine. There's just some tremendous people here, Hugh McCaffrey and his team, uh, Tony and his security team, uh, Elma Ozic, who's our Chief Finance Officer and is helping us retiring members to see what we do with their money, and, and the Education Department. I'm going to find out who did the, uh, that poem, because I thought it was great. Um, I just let everyone know I've been in here 20 years and I've never been thrown out. So a lot of people think with my behaviour in 20 years, I've never been thrown out, but the closest, the closest I went was when uh, poor old, uh, the member for Bunbury, um, John Castrilli. I was trying to get an inquiry into the city of Albany. So I did a grievance, I kept saying and he wouldn't do it. So I, I did the grievance, absolutely hammered me in the first half, and then he got up, and I didn't even let him speak, I said, you're disgraced. So, Grant Woodhams called me the first time, and then I kept going, he called me the second time, and then I got to the third, and he, he'd say, three and a quarter, three and a half, three and three quarters, and I shut up, so. But, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a tremendous um, place being to speak. You look down, you see lots of things. You get sung to by someone, and, uh, yeah, I just, I'm going to have nightmares once again. Um, the drivers have been tremendous. They love me because I'm the closest one to anyone else, so they all line up to take me home. And I, I hear a lot about the ministers from the drivers. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've, got a bit of, I've got a bit of dirt that I can uh, put on later on. To the retired members, you know, uh, 
It's just great. 20 years, Mick, we've been together. Oh, sorry, I called you the wrong electorate. People don't realise how tough this bloke is. You know, he, he comes around as a tough bloke, but he's got a heart of gold. You saw his emotion uh, during the week. But if you knew what he did for people in his electorate over a long period of time, you know, it's a different side you don't see. And to my mate Ben, you know, the, the, the world's second best treasure behind Eric Ripper, <laughs> which is an in-joke. But Ben, you've been a tremendous leader. Uh, you know, not only for your community, you know, but you've been a great member and a good friend over a long period of time. Uh, the member for Coburn and also the member of South Perth, the one who wears the red shirt under his shirt. And one day he's going to rip it open and say, I was Labor anyway. Um, it's funny, we talked about electorate officers and my electorate officer, Guy Roth, for 20 years has been saying, I didn't check the first Hansard, so it had Roth, R-O-T-H. So I thought, well, I wrote everything out and handed the Hansard. Well, he rings me this morning, because what I said was, it's Guy Roth, W-R-O-T-H. I get Hansard this morning, it's got W-R-A-T-H. And his nickname's Bomber, and they put Boomer. So <laughs> luckily this time, I, uh, I fixed it up, so I, I won't get hassled for another 20 years. But look, I'd like to thank everyone. Being the speakers, you know, a little bit difficult job, but the staff I've had have been tremendous. So I say a lot of things have happened behind the scenes, and they've been brilliant. To all the members who've been... Uh, oops, I've forgotten someone. I missed Josie. Oh, Josie! Oh! <laughs> yes. Josie calls me son. I call her mother because one of her grandsons is a Watson. And uh, he's a very good young footballer. And uh, Josie said that, um, you know, the speaker was a Watson. So he's, uh, he, he's a really lovely kid. And he's, he could even play AFL football, but only if he plays for Collingwood, Josie. But uh, you look, I apologise. Um, you've been a wonderful member of parliament, wonderful for your community, and a wonderful friend over the last eight years. And I'm very proud to serve with you. Um, I think that's it. Uh, everyone is... No, well, actually, no. No, I thought it go a bit longer, Rog. <laughs> um, to everyone, you know, I remember Jeff Gallup saying to me uh, when we were coming up the first election, uh, some people will think they're going to get in in the next election and won't. Some won't think they're going to get in will. And it's the amount of work you put in. And I'm sure everyone here has put a lot in. But it's going to be a very trying time for those who are doing it the first time. Um, you've got to have support around you and don't be frightened to talk to people. You know, no one's too big, and I know some of the members here are probably sitting for the third or fourth time would know the same thing. Uh, you never know in politics what can happen, but I just wish you all the best of luck on this side of the chamber and that side of the chamber. Do your best. Uh, and just remember what you're there for. You're, you're there for your community. If you look after your community, as Mick and I have found over 20 years, they'll look after you. But thank you for the nice words uh, from the people in the chamber today. I wish they'd have told me that years ago, you know. <laughs> but it was great. And the Leader of the House, thank you once again for your great, great contribution. And look after your families. Have a great Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yeah. Leader of the House. Now the question is, the motion be agreed to. Thank you, Leader of the House. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Leader of the House. I move that the House are now adjourned. Do we have to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Members, the question is, the House be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? Aye. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. <laughs> I just wanted to do that.